Welcome back to another Sonic Speed Reading Compilation. This is a collection of all of my video coverage of the IDW Sonic series, kicking off with the Bad Guys miniseries and leading up all the way to issue 50. Now, if you've come here from any of those other videos, this is just here to give you a more streamlined experience you can put on in the background while you're doing something else. But if you're coming here from the Metal Virus compilation or you're new to the channel, please keep in mind that Speed Reading is mostly just a name. I do give a breakdown of what happens in the story, but I do give my own opinion after every story arc. And for the Metal Virus, I waited until the very end before I really gave a thorough breakdown, outside of a quick break for Shadow. But here, you have a collection of much smaller stories, so it plays out a little differently. If you're expecting another grand narrative like the Metal Virus, you're not gonna find that in this video. That said, there is still a lot of fun here, so be sure you stick around, and if you've seen all these videos before, I've added a couple minutes on the back end here, just some my overall thoughts of these last few stories. Otherwise, enjoy the show! Welcome back to Sonic Speed Reading. Today we're going to be covering the IDW miniseries, Bad Guys. Yeah, title is pretty straightforward. This is all about the naughty Nelly so far established in the IDW Sonic series. Just a bunch of rotten sons of guns. If you've not read it for yourself, I'm going to include a link in the description where you can go buy it on Comixology. I'm not sponsored, I'm just a fan. And if you are as well, be sure you support the creators. IDW Sonic, at least at the time of this video's publication is ongoing with writers and artists whose livelihood is directly attached to said comic. So if you haven't yet, go check out the talent on display. Always going to recommend you read the story for yourself, as opposed to just having some schmuck regurgitate to you on YouTube. But all that said, Mama Bird is going to take this comic and puke it right back up into your greedy mouths, my baby birds. <laughs> so Dr. Starline has been a very engaging secondary villain, as we've discussed a couple times up to this point in the series. So like the other popular new characters, Tangle and Whisper, we also got a miniseries focused on the plotting platypus and they also decided to throw in a couple of the other interesting new villains introduced in IDW like Rough and Tumble, Mimic, and... Zavik. It's very telling when the only game character has nowhere near the love compared to all these comic-born baddies. But no worries, this is IDW Zavik. He's much better here than his own source material, but we'll get into that later. I am getting a bit ahead of myself. Before any of that, we actually have to learn how these bad boys all group up. The story starts with Perry the Platypus here infiltrating Egg Base Sigma. And while he slinks around security, he's confident that Eggy was lazy enough not to do anything about Starline's personal login after the platypus was unceremoniously fired by the good doctor back on Angel Island. Starline, ironically enough, underestimates Eggman's thorough termination process, as his login does not work. And not only that, this incorrect password sets off an alarm. Eggy, I sincerely hope you never have a typo when you log in because that is a very severe reaction to an incorrect password. Can you imagine if that happened every time you try to log into XVD? I mean Twitter? The irony is not not lost on Starline, but the security is only three moto bucks. But this does help establish Starline's new status quo, as he goes to use the warp topaz out of habit, but as we already know, that's no longer a part of his arsenal. But he does have an arsenal, and he shows off the first of his new toys by activating his Electro Spurs. I've said it before, but I'll keep saying it. I appreciate these newer characters coming in with abilities that look like they'd be fun to play with in a video game, and I always appreciate when they incorporate some abilities inspired by the real world animal. Platypus have venomous spurs, so Starline gets to use some spurs in a breakdance battle and goes all step up to colon the streets on these motobugs. But as every Sonic fan knows, the egg ponds are far too good at DDR, so Starline has to make a break for it. Later on, we find him in his base, spinning a page talking to himself, explaining to us why he has his own egg ponds and motobugs, even though he was just running away from them. And that's because he's amassed his own collection of Eggman tech over the years. He no longer has the Eggman Empire at his disposal, and worse still, the Warp Topaz, which he has spent a good chunk of his life studying and mastering, is now gone. So he needs new tools if he's ever going to accomplish anything. But what exactly is he trying to accomplish? You'd assume he'd want nothing to do with Eggman after he was served his pink slip, but he remains as loyal as ever, in his own twisted way. He believes Eggman has 
plateaued and won't ever reach his full potential while he obsesses over his battles with Sonic. Starline believes that he needs to end the cycle, ironically enough by involving himself in the cycle. But again, he can't do much of anything with his current resources. He needs help. He just needs partners that hate both Sonic and Eggman. And the duckbill doctor knows exactly where to find people who fit the, well, the bill. We shift scenes to Everhold Prison, blatantly shaped like a guitar. That's a lovely reference to the Sonic X version of Prison Island. And honestly, this whole book gives me SA2 Dark Story vibe which, yeah, that's a lot of fun. Starline busts into the Warden's office, where he shows off yet another new ability, Hypnosis, which is what I thought Starline's shtick would have been the first time I saw his design, considering all the spirals. That initial impression I had of him is probably why I'm fine with him having this tech. And again, this goes to show how diverse his tool set is going to become now that warping is out of the picture. This particular one will become more important down the road, but for right now, he uses this to convince the Warden that that he's here for a job interview, then coerces the puppy dog man to take him to the maximum security wing. It does feel like this ability comes out of nowhere, but so does a lot of other stuff in this world, so I'm not going to question it too hard. But that said, this is more in line with what I know his character to be. He's not a fighter. He isn't going to punch his way through a situation, but manipulating people and just walking right in like he owns a place? That's Starline. Still, the hypnosis has its limits. It works just well enough. His wit still needs to do the heavy lift as we see the warden come back to his senses, but still convinced that Starline is here for a job. And this is where we meet the rest of the crew. Mimic, uh, mimics the warden, trying to convince Starline that he, Mimic, is the real warden, displaying his abilities and in turn, his use to Starline. The Warden then walks the Doctor by rough and tumble, conveniently with their backs to the platypus. Otherwise, they'd certainly recognize Starline as he was the reason the two ever met Eggman to begin with. And this isn't the first time he's busted them out of prison. But he's not the only one that knows Starline, as they finally arrive at Zavik. And I love that the two just kind of glare at each other, this arrogant sneer on Starline's face. And the Warden warns the platypus to stay back, but Starline can't help but flex his knowledge on the Zeti, explaining that he controls robots with his electromagnetic pulse abilities. And that's why Starline is here to collect Big Red. And Zavik calls Starline out. But he's not too worried about it as he quickly puts the Warden to sleep. The Zeti asks why Starline even bothered to control the Deadly Six with the conch if he had that handy. And Starline answers by saying that he has a wide variety of tools that he uses when necessary. And besides, it probably wouldn't work on an iron will like Zavix. This not only answers the question of the Zeti, and uh, well, me as well, but also serves as a way to butter up Zavik with compliments. Starline then addresses the whole room, saying that he was used by Eggman just as they all were, and attempts to unite the rogues in their shared abandonment. And without surprise, they all staunchly refuse. But Starline's come prepared. I don't know why they refuse before they're let out of prison, but, you know, whatever. For Mimic, he offers to delete the octopus out of the egg net, which in turn should get Mimic off Eggman's shit list. If you recall from the Whisper and Tangle miniseries, Eggie is still after him for not fulfilling his contract and taking care of Whisper. But removing any digital trace of the cephalopod will go a long way to help him disappear. The skunks just want new weapons. No big surprise there. Zavik just flat out refuses, saying there's nothing Starline could offer that could make up for what the platypus put him through back during the metal virus. But Starline was prepared for this too. Platypus does not offer him a gift, but instead plays to the Zeti's ego, saying that Zavik should lead, not Starline. We then see that they both are, once again, plotting against each other. Starline believes Zavik to be a brute, someone who is easily manipulated, while the platypus would truly be in charge from the shadows. Zavik, of course, sees right through the charade, but goes along with it anyway. He's got to reunite with the rest of the six, and he can't very well do that from prison. So while he's not sure what Starline's up to, he's going to go along for the ride for now. But as they agree to work together, an alarm rings, set off by the now conscious warden. Starline incapacitates the guy with a neurotoxin spur, more in line with the real animal and, again, cool variety for the tool set here. So now it's breakout time. We get to see the bad guys flex 
takes their stuff. Mimic once again turns into the warden to trick the approaching guards. Then Starline once again uses his hypno glove, helping establish another limitation. Apparently, it only works on one person at a time. But that's no problem as Zavik knocks out the other two guards that entered the room. But more continue to approach. And while they have their options, Zavik decides to hold back and let Rough and Tumble show their worth. And this is why I compare them more to Rocksteady and Bebop as opposed to Scratch and Grounder. While all of these duos are idiots, they only look pathetic next to the heroes they fight. Against normal people, they still wreck house. And the skunks make quick work of this wave of enemies. And while it looks like they might be outnumbered, once Zavik joins in, it's pretty much game over. They wreck Wispins, start rolling through the place, making a mess all the way to the control room. Starling goes to shut off the alarms, but Zavik tells him to hold back and instead unlock all the cells and scramble communications. This dude does not slink around. He is all about displays of power. And that's exactly what these dudes do. Prisoners escape, the place is on fire, and Starline's posse casually strolls out. Their backs to the chaos. These bad guys are badasses. <laughs> and this is where part one ends. Our crew is assembled, and when working together, a force to be reckoned with. But now that the crew's established, it's time to get things done. Starling has them reconvene at his base of operations, explaining that they need to attack an Eggman base that produces power cores. Now we've seen a lot of Sonic Heroes love so far in this series, but we're about to take it one step further. These cores are indeed the same you collected from that game. Starling explains them as concentrated energy used by Eggie's machines. And look, say what you want about the guy, but between these and the little critters he uses as batteries, Eggman's got some clean burning fuel sources. Now even if you haven't played Heroes, you can probably guess what each core's color represents. Blue, of course, is speed energy. Red is power, and yellow is flight. They artificially amplify these users' physical abilities, and we get something of a measure for what it can do, as Starline says that the red one can double Zavik's strength. But what he doesn't explain to the group is that you can use these things willy-nilly. Just pick them up and you're good to go. What he instead tells them is that they need special adapters that harness only one core at a time, which he he will be providing for the team. And he's doing this because he's hiding the fact that he's working on something specifically for himself. Mimic wants to know why they're even bothering with these things, as he doesn't see how it will bring them closer to his own goal. Condescendingly, Starline explains that they will need the boost of the power cores to tackle their real target, an Eggnet hub. And that's pretty much what it sounds like. Eggman uses his own network to transfer data around his many bases and bots, which makes sense. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and clean burning little animals. Modern Eggman indeed. I do also want to point out because I am just glossing over it for story summary, the scene does a great job of establishing the dynamic between everybody. They are selfish, evil jerks, but they are fun to watch. Nobody, not even the idiot skunks, is one note. There's a chemistry here that will continue to build despite the fact that Starline is still scheming to double cross all of these guys. Not only is he risking himself by taking on Eggman, his allies are incredibly dangerous. If he slips up, he's a goner. But he weighs the risk of allowing any of these guys to live once he's done using them, pointing out that Mimic has done some horrific stuff just to save his own skin. Rough and Tumble, while idiots, are driven and can hold a grudge. They're easy to underestimate, and that can become a problem at the most inconvenient time, not worth the risk. And Zavik, not only does he crave power, he knows how to use it. His action during the Metal Virus alone shows how capable he is, with or without his crew. And it must be said, they do work well as a unit. Starline set up the plan, Zavik working as a field leader, the rest of the team can rally around, Mimic confusing bots with his abilities, Rough and Tumble being absolute delights as always, and being capable bruisers in their own right. I love that they have their own tag team strategies, and a smoke screen, which yeah, that works, they're skunks. Man, even these guys look fun to play. I also like the slight hint of camaraderie between Zavik and Tumble, the two heaviest hitters of the crew. It's not much here, but they share a few scenes together and it's fun. Just a quick back and forth while they wait for Rough and Mimic to wreck shop on the other side of the wall. But Zavik knows notices the door is held with a magnetic lock, which he undoes with his powers, and mentions that this crew, while not being the Deadly Six, are still warriors, adept ones at that. And this leads to what might be the most important conversation of this entire miniseries. With the entrance to the base now open, Starline begins to drive a semi through the front door, with Zavik hanging off the side, and the two have a quick back and forth. Zavik says he'll never understand the reliance Starline and Eggman have on machines, to which Starline says that they're efficient, tireless, 
fearless and loyal, traits he thought Zavik would hold in high regard. Which he does, sure, but it's at the cost of flexibility, passion, and ingenuity. Zavik thinks of robots as nothing more than tools. He has much more respect for strong warriors. Which retroactively kinda justifies why the Zeti only had a mech here or there on Lost Hex before Eggman showed up. They have control over electromagnetic waves. They should be able to build a mechanical warship in a quarter of the time Eggy could, and have a much more nuanced command over these machines, but they largely choose not to. Yeah, they'll turn Eggman's weapons back on him, obviously, but they're not afraid to get their own hands dirty, Zavik especially, and we'll see more of that in a bit, but back to the conversation at hand. Starling retorts that he can build an army of thousands of robots in the same time it would take Zavik to find a dozen capable warriors, saying his robots won't disrespect you or ignore all your hard work or throw you away, kind of letting slip just how hurt he was by Eggman's betrayal. There's a brief moment of quiet that follows, where Starline realizes he may have potentially let slip a bit too much, and Zavik responds by saying, he will never take you back. Starline says it's fine, after all they're here for revenge, but Zavik continues by saying, more importantly, you don't need him. Hate on Zavik all you want, Sonic fans, but if you're dealing with a bad breakup, this is the homie you call. Remember, Starling fully intends to betray these guys, and while Zavik doesn't know exactly what his angle is, the Zeti knows this platypus is up to something. And while Starling keeps calling Zavs a brute and a beast behind his back, he is caught off guard by this comment. Zavik goes on to say that Starline's plans for the metal virus were solid. He only screwed up by trying to fix Eggman's mistakes. Starline tries to dismiss it, saying that he was only adding notes to Eggman's grand scheme, but Zavik tells him he's got great potential and shouldn't limit himself trying to become Eggman. He should surpass Eggman. Again, Zavik is suspicious. He doesn't actually know Starline's true intentions, which were to ultimately get Eggman back on track to conquer the world. While Zavik may not trust this guy, he is still a natural leader for a reason. Starline may be a genius, but Zavik can still read him like a book and offers him truly healthy advice. Maybe not healthy for the rest of the world, but on a personal level, this is the first time Starline begins to question his own motivations, and this is the beginning of sending him down a different path, which we will continue to explore as we carry on through the story. While they've made it through the gate, they still haven't actually entered the facility, and as they reach that door, Starline instructs Mimic to transform into Sonic and mock the nearest security camera. They intend to frame the hedgehog for all the damage, but as the octopus does this, he's greeted by a T-Rex robot. Look at this beautiful beautiful baby. I love this design. This looks like a proper Eggman boss fight. So much so that I swore I had seen this in a game before. Maybe not this one specifically, but did some digging and remembered that yeah there was the Ghost Rex from Sonic Rush Adventure. And as it turns out, this Rex's designer, Aaron Hammerstrom, said that this bot was based off Reds, that little dino badnik from the mobile port of Sonic 2. It looks like that little badnik except digivolved into this design. Also it's probably just remind me of the T-Rex robot from Mega Man 7. But this particular one, it looks like it was pulled straight out of Sonic Heroes, even though it never had a T-Rex boss fight. I say it all the time, but I love how many of these new designs from the comic fit in so well that they sometimes make me think they might have come from the games themselves, because that was a rarity from the early days of Sonic comics. Anyway, yeah, back to the battle. Zavik moves in to take control, but discovers that this bot is EM shielded. I know they're doing this so they don't make things too easy for these characters, but Eggie being able to build bots that negate Zeddy powers is interesting. I'm not sure if they're going to play around with that anymore going down the road, but as Zavik has just got done saying, he does not put all his eggs in the robot basket. He's not useless without that power. Regardless, this Rex is actually going to be used to show off the worth of Rough and Tumble. As cool as the T-Rex robot is, it only lasts for two pages, as Tumble boots Rough into the Robo Rex's mouth, who then in turn lets off a gas bomb of his own natural making, taking the Rex down and impressing the rest of the team. They don't get many moments like this in the series itself, so it's cool to see how capable these two actually can be. And with the Rex now extinct, all that's left is cleanup. Starline begins to edit security footage, removing any trace of them being there and leaving the fake Sonic moments intact, all while the rest of the team begins loading up power cores into the truck. But Zavik takes a moment to pick one of them up, and clearly there's a reaction. After everything's loaded up, they're good to go. But before they take their leave, Tumble and Zavik take a moment to make an impact in the front gate to replicate Sonic's spin dash. I also like this moment because it subtly tells you how strong Sonic actually is. It takes the two burly heavy hitters to get
together to make this kind of an impact. And it even leaves Tumble with a smarting hand. <laughs> Sometime later, we come across Eggman and Cubot surveying the aftermath. Cubot says things aren't looking great on the report, but clearly Sonic is to blame. But Eggman's not entirely convinced. Databases and chunks of security footage are missing. Cubot asks if that was done to cover Sonic's tracks, which Eggman then asks, why then would he mock the security camera? Cubot responds to say that maybe it's Tails trying to cover Sonic's tracks. And Eggy, despite his hatred of furries, says that Prower wouldn't be this sloppy. And I love that there's this unspoken respect for Sonic's sidekick in that. The point is, is that Eggman is not an idiot. He knows something is off and he fully intends to get to the bottom of this. We go back to Starline's base, where the platypus is putting the final touches on a new device. Thinking over everything he spoke about with Zavik, admitting to himself that the Zeddy made a few good points. And normally, in a narrative like this, with a lead who has something of a conscious, this might be the point where they realize they truly care about their team. But this is Starline. He dismisses all of that for now, saying that maybe this is something to think about down the road. But for now, things are going as planned. They raided the facility, stole a bunch of power cores, and now Starline has the power of speed, flight, and strength at his fingertips, as his warp topaz has now been replaced by the Tricor. We have not yet seen a single ring in the IDW series, but now we have power cores, which have only ever existed in Sonic Heroes. And now these things are part of the comic canon and are fully explained in a really cool way. And now a part of Starline's extending arsenal. But despite things seemingly going Starline's way as part two ends, as part three begins, we see just how many flaws he's overlooked. Issue 3 picks up with Starline logging into his computer and telling it to play back his last development journal. And yes, a recorded journal explaining all of your plan to betray this crew you put together is obviously a stupid move, but this genius has a big enough ego not to realize this fatal mistake. And just as the digital recording admits to all the betrayal stuff, Zavik steps out from the shadows as the real Starline is watching the screen. But plot twist, that's not the real Starline. It's Mimic, who tells Zavik he's been sneaking around looking for for some intel. And who can blame him? It's not like Starline's given him any reason to see him as a comrade. He's been treating him like crap this whole time. But again, it's Mimic. I mean, he's killed actual friends. <laughs> Zavik, as we saw in the last issue, never trusted the platypus from the start, but he did confirm that Starline was lying simply by touching a power core. And that is another massive oversight. I know he was trying to limit what they could do with the power cores, but Starline had to know that they were all going to be in close contact with the things. Any one of them could have picked them up at any time. And speaking of the devices, that's why Zavik is here. He wants to make sure Starline didn't booby trap them. So Mimic checks his notes and confirms they're not. It looked like Starline wanted to make sure his plan went without a hitch and would dispose of the team after everything was done. And the lack of a booby trap actually surprises Zavik. Says that Starline is just as short-sighted as Eggman. And that's all Mimic needs. He plans to kill Starline who is exposed and asleep in the same room. But Zavik stops him. They go outside and instead discuss a secondary plan as they still need Starline to access the Eggnet so they can get what they want. That only leaves Ruff and Tumble without any intention of backstabbing anybody else. And we then cut to this cute little scene where they're all in the truck heading to the Eggnet base, where we see the skunks trying to incorporate the rest of the team in their Team Rocket styled intro. I love that we get confirmation they actually prepare those rhymes. That is adorable. <laughs> I love Zavik. <laughs> Look at his face. He's just seething. But he points out that this is a sign of a growing kinship and compliments Starline for getting them all together and having his plan go on without a hitch. All while thinking that Zavik is an idiot and can't wait to betray the guy. All this scheming upon scheming. <laughs> I love this stupid little scene. But they soon arrive at the Eggnet facility and Starline hands out the singular power core adapters. Zavik and Tumble get red strength cores. Mimic gets a yellow flight and Ruff gets a blue speed one. Starline doesn't take one for himself saying that he has no powers to enhance and they get to work. Zavik instructs Mimic to join him in taking down the guard towers first, while Ruff and Tumble take care of the front door. And once it topples, Starline, once again, walks right in like he owns the place. They make short work of the defenses, and Tumble asks Zavik why he doesn't bother to control the bots. And Zavik says it's much more satisfying to just obliterate them, once again showing us that he's not fully reliant on robots, and also showing us that weird-ass mouth. I, ugh. I don't like that they're disconnected from his red spikes. That should be his jaw. Why else are they there? Oh, it's just it's very upsetting. But yeah, just like that, they have reached
reach the central computer. Starline bypasses the security while Mimic tells him to work fast. He'll like to scramble before Eggman is aware of their attack. To which Starline says, oh, he's mobilizing now, which gives Mimic a heart attack. But Starline is quick to remind the murderous Squidward that they now have control of his information feed. And they're currently telling that feed that the attack is at a different facility. And again, that Sonic is to blame. The comic cuts over to Eggman's perspective where he is indeed mobilizing, but is once again thrown for a loop as Orbot comes in with a report with updated information. Eggy, again, doesn't have all the info on hand, but it's too big of a change to be a glitch. Be it from the original Eggnet base or this new updated base, there's potentially a dummy transmission going through. So Eggman decides he's just gonna bomb both locations. <laughs> of course. Oblivious to the danger he's in on more than one front, Starline proceeds to take control of the defenses of the Eggnet base and confirms Egg Base Sigma. But at this point, Mimic holds a knife to his neck. Starline asks for help from their fearless leader who just stands there and the skunks, confused at the situation, want to know what's going on. And Zavik explains what's really happening. So now Starline's entire crew are fully aware of his deception. And once they force him to delete any information on Mimic and pass control of all badniks in range to Zavik, he has now outlived his usefulness. And where issue three began with everything going Starline's way, it ends with everything unraveling. But all is not lost for Starline, as he equips his Tricor and puts it to use against his former crew. Leaping out of harm's way, matching blows with Tumble, and speeding out of Zavik's violent grasp, he zooms off into the base. Even if under false pretenses, the Zeti is still in command, as he instructs Mimic to stay behind in the computer room in case the platypus makes his way back, and then tells the skunks to join him on a hunt. Unfortunately for Zavik, his leadership isn't enough to sway Mimic from his selfish way. Remember, this guy did betray his last team. <laughs> no reason he wouldn't do that here. He decides that Starline had a good point. Deleting Mimic's info won't mean squat if there are people alive that can snitch on him. So he uploads new information onto the Eggnet, sending a live feed of Zavik directly to Eggman, who responds to this exactly as you would imagine, redirecting his entire squadron onto the Eggnet base. And yes, that is the Egghawk from Sonic Heroes, and it was great to see it again. And technically, that's the first time we've actually seen him fly that thing because that, that wasn't him in Heroes, so that's kind of cool. Back at the Eggnet base, Starline clotheslines a speeding skunk and immobilizes him with his toxin, but Ruff isn't as stupid as he seems, as he calls out to Tumble and Zavik, letting them know of Starline's location. The platypus takes to the hanging wires as Zavik walks in, and while he doesn't know exactly where Starline's at, he begins to talk trash, saying that Starline is not fit to be Eggman's successor, and discarding comrades was needlessly cruel that was all compounded by his unearned sense of pride and after saying all that out loud Zavik pauses for a moment and realizes never mind all of that makes Starline exactly like Eggman he may not have landed a hit physically but Zavik's words once again cut deep and Starline ponders them as he speeds his way back to the computer room while taking Tumble out as he looks over a downed rough he makes his way back to the computer while being concerned that Mimic might attack not aware that the octopus has long since abandoned his post, but while he may no longer be there, Starling notices what Mimic has done, and is now aware that Eggman is on his way to their location, and will be there any moment. But while in front of the computer, Starling quickly finalizes his plans for Egg Base Sigma, converting its defenses to serve him, and deleting it completely from Eggy's registry. Afterwards, he too takes his leave. Zavik comes across the fallen skunks, yelling at them for laying a out, at which point they decide they don't really need to be bossed around by the Zeti, and they as well bail. Zavik, meanwhile, heads back to the computer room to see that Mimic is no longer there, leaving him the last man standing. But even though it's finally his turn to use the computer to track down the rest of the Deadly Six, he's rudely interrupted by Eggman. I love the interaction between these two, they just talk trash. Eggy has no intention of controlling any more Zeti. He wants to be rid of them as badly as the Sonic fanbase. Zavik is surprised that Eggman is so willing to sacrifice such a crucial base, but to nobody's surprise, Eggman's not too worried about it. He'll rebuild, and he thinks it's well worth the price of killing off Zavik while out of range of his powers. But Zavik tells him that he's a fool for thinking that he's out of reach, as he commands all the badniks now under his control to attack Eggy's fleet, and the two battle it 
split out with badniks as the now disbanded bad guys look on from a distance, going their own separate ways. In the end, while Eggman is successful in tearing the base down around Zavik, the Zeddy is sturdy, partially thanks to his power core, which falls apart as he pulls himself out of the rubble. He's worn out, but he's alive, off to track down the rest of the Deadly Six. Later on, Eggman reflects on everything, feeling that something is still missing about the odd raids as of late, not believing Zavik is savvy enough to pull off a stunt like this. He isn't sure who or what is making moves against him, but he's sure they are. All right, so I did call this guy a smarty pants earlier, and I know he probably has a lot of enemies, like more than the reader may be aware of, but I don't know how Starline isn't the first person he thinks of. Like, obviously, he has a vendetta and knowledge of how things are run in the Eggman Empire. I suppose you could say that Eggman was just that dismissive of the guy, but again, he's supposed to be a super genius. But hey, the dude is spinning a lot of plates, so much to the point that he doesn't notice an entire facility is no longer under his control. This series has established Eggman to be quick to dismiss old projects and move on to something new without a second thought. So that tracks. As chaotic as things got, as many mistakes as he's made, Starline ultimately got what he wanted. And while the crew is now out there doing their own thing and now enemies of the platypus, Zavik's words did inspire him. He went into this with the intention of helping Eggman in his own twisted way, but now Starline does not want to bolster Eggman, he wants to surpass him. And we end the series with Starline on his very own throne. And that wraps things up, guys. Like the Tangle Whisper miniseries, the first time I read this, I felt like not much happened. Like all this probably could have been done in a single issue or two. And also, I was a little confused as to what exactly was happening. Like for a moment, I thought they were invading Egg Base Sigma, and then it was destroyed, and then it was suddenly back. So it turns out Egg Base Smegma was only there to bookend the series. We only saw it at the beginning and the end. Like I said, I think I just read through this a bit too quick that first time around, and I was left somewhat unsatisfied, feeling like nothing really major happened here but that's not exactly true in some weird ways there was a bit of a character arc and at times kind of anti-character arcs rough and tumble are free again and i know they were at the end of the metal virus so it's no major deal there like without the story it really would not have changed anything for them we only knew they were in jail because of the beginning of this book but that said they were at their most competent and most enjoyable in this mini series and that's probably because we don't follow them as antagonists it's fun to see them interact with people they can consider allies. The Mimic was nice to see again, but I'll be honest, I felt he was the least engaging of the crew. He does serve a purpose here, but he's nowhere near as creepy when we view him from this angle. But to be fair, he lost that particular trait before we even wrapped up the story he was introduced in. Other than that, he's not given too much to do, but he was still fun to watch all the same, and I'm glad he's active again. And Zavik once again surprises me. He proves to me that there's no such thing as a bad Sonic character. You just give him to a good writer and you're going to get a good story. He's so much better to find than he has any right to be. This is why I'm happy to know that Ian Flynn is writing the next Sonic game. As long as he's given some freedom to flesh out some of these characters, he can even make the infamous Zeddy a compelling villain. Always intimidating, but always plotting. The juxtaposition between his beast-like violence and elegant composure was something that Flynn wanted to capture and I think he did a great job interpreting this guy in such a way. He could rip off Starline's head the moment he knew the platypus was betraying him, but instead he schemes. He waits for the right moment to unleash that terrifying fury. I think I need to finally admit it. Ian Flynn has made this a good character. Zavik is redeemed. I like reading about him in the IDW series. Never thought I would be saying that, but here we are. What a time to be alive. I'm really excited to check out his Archie run. He turned me around on a lot of American characters, but that's for another time. As for Starline himself, he's really what I'm talking about when there's something of a character arc, or again, anti-character arc. See, none of these guys actually change throughout the story. They're selfish, violent jerks at the beginning of the story. They're selfish, violent jerks at the end of the story. And any camaraderie that was being built is completely demolished. We get glimpses of humanity here and there, but ultimately Starline always doubles down on his selfish choices. 
choices. And his great takeaway from all of this is that he deserves more. He is better than his idol. He just doubles down on his arrogance. There are a few occasions in this story where you would traditionally see a cast come together or see a more selfish lead, learn a bit of empathy and compassion. But every time you think that's going to happen, there's always an undertone of deception or you'll see Starline zig where a hero would zag. He doesn't have a traditional character arc. And honestly, why should he? Sure, things got screwy, but again, he got what he wanted, and why would he do anything differently? Same goes for the rest of them. Savik's a little beaten up, but he is out of prison. They all are. And Mimic is now out of the Eggnet database. The series justifies them being jerks. Like I said up front, this miniseries wasn't lying with that name. These are bad guys, and by the end of it, the main character is now a badder guy. He's graduated from being a sidekick and now is a full-on villain in his own right. And we're going to see more from him, and actually Zavik, very soon. And I'll be honest, I can't wait. I'm glad I read through this a second time for this video. There's a lot more here to pick apart than I initially gave it credit for. I always got to remember that this is an ongoing story, one that keeps building off each issue. And sometimes it's just fun to watch bad guys be bad guys. And it reminded me a lot of that Sonic Universe series, which was a lot of fun when it was still running. A lovely reminder that there's more than just Sonic in these stories. And even if they are newer characters, morally reprehensible ones at that, there are still engaging tales that deserve to be told. After the year and a half long Metal Virus arc, Sonic and his pals were in a major need of a break. And in turn, the series kept the stakes relatively low for a while, which is fine by me. I really didn't need to jump into another massive event this quickly after everything that happened with Metal Virus, especially since we get a shift in head writers as well. This would be the first issue marking Evan Stanley's run on the series. She, like Ian Flynn, created fan works prior to coming on board in an official capacity. And I just found out she is still updating said work, and that is awesome and important for later. She started off on the newer wave of Archie talent, where she's mostly been known for her incredible art, but she did write the Silver Age arc of the Sonic Universe line, and that was awesome. Honestly, she's had a major hand in shaping Silver's character outside of the games, and personally, I love his depiction, but unfortunately, we can't really talk about him today because there's no Silver in this story. We actually don't get a great deal of Sonic himself for a lot of this plot. Plot. You'll hear a lot of fans complain about the slower pace of these next couple stories, but you go in with the right expectations, and you may find yourself having a good time. This story kicks off with Sonic chilling outside Tails' workshop. Inside of said workshop is, surprise, Tails, along with Amy, Rouge, and the ever-sassy head of Omega, who you may recall got ripped apart by Shadow while he was all shiny and gooey. And while everything else with the Metal Virus has pretty much wrapped up, unfortunately we still have something of a Humpty Dumpty situation with Omega. Even with all the parts here, the body is too badly damaged to be repaired as is. And on top of that, Tails will still need the codex to get everything up and running. But since that was written by Eggman, that makes it a little more complicated. Basically, what needs to happen is they need to scrap from other E100 model parts. And unfortunately, those are very rare to come by. And little side tangent here, something that's always caught my attention, but I keep forgetting to bring up. So the other famous E100 series would be Gamma from Sonic Adventure, but he had a bird in his guts. But this comic's confirmed for quite a while now that Omega does not have an Energizer bunny in his belly. He's purely mechanical, and I doubt I'm the first to ask, but is there any actual consistency with Eggman robots? What if Metal Sonic had a cucky in his head all this time? That explain a few things. I actually don't know what the point of that joke was. I just wanted to say cucky again. <laughs> But this is the point where Sonic pops in through the window and plans begin to formulate. Long and short of it, Sonic and Tails are going to scope out an abandoned Eggman base, and the girls are going to pop over to White Park to check out a collector of sorts. Yes, that White Park from Sonic 4 Episode 2, but they're going to need some assistance from Cream the Rabbit, or more specifically her Chow, Cheese, as they will need him to enter into the Chow races at the ski resort, and that'll be their excuse to find said collector, grab the park, 
cards. It's a plan, and it is an excuse to bring in the Chow races. So even if the games won't bring them back, the comics will at least make a fun story out of it. This leads to an awkward conversation of Amy calling up Mama Rabbit Vanilla and asking to borrow her kid for a dangerous adventure. Not weird at all. I did say previously that they maybe shouldn't draw attention to how weird it is that a kid is hanging out with Sonic and his crew, but reading this scene again and one later, I think I actually prefer them addressing it and trying to make sense of things because it is a little weird if it's left unsaid and it leads to some funny moments. And besides, Cream will have her protective guardian robot, Gemroll, along for the ride as he needs a tune-up as well. But yeah, this is the driving force of the story, fixing up the robots. Things will get a little more complicated from here on out, but that's the overall goal. And this is where the story splits between perspectives, starting with Sonic and Tails at the abandoned base. I'm already a fan of abandoned buildings and then throwing a bunch of Sonic Adventure references in here just makes it all kinds of fun for me. But there also seemed to be a figure stalking the boys from the shadows, and we'll get back to them later. We're actually going to be spending most of our time with the girls. And I'm just realizing we are seeing a lot of stuff not normally shown off in Sonic's universe. There's a normal road here for driving. I mean, yes, I've played the 3D games. I know there are a bunch of city levels, but rarely do we see these guys actually driving. And Amy has an open top Volkswagen Beetle with eyelashes and a vanity plate. Does everybody here live and drive in stuff that looks like them? I, whatever. Props for staying consistent with the branding, guys. I get it. And I do like their winter wardrobe. I don't know if these are references to other costumes available in the mobile or Olympic games. If so, please let me know in the comments, but it is rare to see them outside of their normal attire. And I do remember Ian Flynn mentioning in his podcast that it was a challenge to get approval for any of these characters to appear in any alternate getups. And I'm glad Evan got these to go through because she shows that she knows how to draw the crap out of them, as well as all these peaky faces. It's the second one I've seen so far in this issue. And it's adorable. It's great. Anyway, Amy swerves out of the way to avoid running into a hedgehog. What is this? The UK? I, uh, <laughs> uh, I just wanted to make a roadkill critter joke, but I actually looked it up and yeah, hedgehogs make up over 50% of all mammal roadkill in Europe. I'm talking six digit numbers when it comes to annual death tolls. I just, that kind of bums me out, man. Anyway, yeah, it's a uh, shadow. Shadow's here. Just, uh, just on the road. And since this is IDW, of course, you'll have his ever vocal fan base all kinds of pissed off with his characterization. What did they go and do this time? Well, Amy asks him to join along as they're looking to fix Omega, to which Shadow responds, after a pause, that he's not interested. Yes, I know, Rouge, Shadow, and Omega are besties most of the time, but I've just kind of accepted this canon doing its own thing. I'm not super happy about it either, and I don't think the writers are as well, and I'll give you an example of that later in the video, but we've talked about this to death, so you can leave your comments, you can express your feelings, go crazy, but again, it is what it is. I'm sorry, but this stuff just doesn't derail my enjoyment of these comics. Speaking of derailing, look at Shadow carefully stepping over this railing. I love that he's just crossing the street like both an actual hedgehog as well as an aimless drunk. Seriously, this is the strangest place to introduce him into this story. And he's just kind of here for the rest of the narrative, but we'll talk about him when we need to. The ladies and bots and Chow all arrive at White Park's Chateau, where Rouge tells Omega to keep the sass down for a bit. I love that he's in her briefcase. And tells everyone else to follow her lead. We then turn our attention to Oma Chow. Yeah, this annoying little robot is now part of the IDW series. So yeah, you hardcore Chow Garden enthusiasts, just eat up all this art because it is chock full of references. Oma Chow here serves as an announcer, letting the guests know to get their Chow registered for the preliminaries as they are about to start. I have to say, I really like this little scene here showing off how well Evan handles Rouge and just all the girls in general. The bat asks the Q if it's okay for her and Cream to cut up front because this little girl is just so excited to enter her chow into the race. But when Oma Chow says children can't register, Rouge says that, oh no, she herself is the little girl, then proceeds to enter under a fake name. Afterwards, Cream is stressing out and not understanding why Rouge would lie while the bat waves it off. 
I love these interactions here. They're so dynamically different and we don't get to see these guys interact a whole lot in the games, despite the fact that a lot of them have been here for decades at this point. Anyway, after they wrap that up, the rabbit and the bat meet back up with Amy as they look out over the race as it's about to start. And Rouge points out the person they're actually here to see. Clutch the possum. Opossum? How do you pronounce that? I do like this design. Obviously, he's supposed to be a creepy, vile dude. Just this giant pile of fur. With black scleras, you don't see that a whole lot with song designs if they're not robots. But yeah, here, ladies and gentlemen, is our very first Sonic Universe pimp. We spend the next couple pages watching the Chow race, and Chi starts off strong until he's meteor smashed into the water by a dark Chow, one that looks awfully similar to a dark hedgehog. But the vigilant little Cheese keeps going, and while not making first place, still manages to make it into the qualifying bracket for the Grand Prix, so he'll be moving on to the next race. The Dark Chow seems to belong to Clutch, who very creepily steps out from the shadows to greet the girls, saying that he makes a point to greet all of the new trainers in the chateau, especially those with exceptional Chow. He hands a business card to Rouge, who introduces herself as Facet, and Clutch tells her to stop by the penthouse suite later to talk shop. As he leaves, Amy thinks this all went down a little too easy, and Rouge agrees, thinking he has something up his sleeve. Up his sleeve? I bet he's got something up his pants. This is Rouge we're talking about here. There are real life human beings. I would not trust alone in a room with a Rouge doll, let alone this creepy possum man with the actual Rouge. I'm saying that like she's a real person. <laughs> Wow, I'm super gross. Let's keep going. Rouge ends up at his suite, which is filled to the brim with junk. Very valuable junk. And Clutch, well, uh, huh, not quite as imposing without that coat. I do like that it's a separate piece, though. This is a fun design for a villain. He already knows who Rouge is, so he tells her to drop the act. You don't become this infamous black market collector without knowing a world famous thief like Rouge. He knows she is here for something, so he offers her a deal. He proclaims himself to be one hell of a Chow trainer, and Cheese impressed him despite the fact that the Chow just scraped by today. But if Cheese manages to win tomorrow's race, Clutch will be willing to trade anything from his collection for the dapper Chow. Rouge says she'll think on it and takes her leave, but before she exits the Hoarder Haven, she pulls out Omega's head and tells him she's got a job for him. What exactly that job is, we don't find out, at least not yet, because the comic jumps over to moments later as she exits the room, where we look down the hallway where we see what's basically an ice climber recreating a scene from The Shining, and the mystery character reveals itself to Rouge, who has quite the reaction. But just like Omega's mystery job, we don't find out exactly what transpired, as we switch our focus over to Shadow, who is overlooking the park from a roof. From his internal dialogue, we find out that he is looking for a notorious bot trader. Probably the same one we've been spending so much time with, and he's having quite a hard time figuring out where he's hiding. And that's probably because Shadow is trying to find the dude while he's on rooftops. He does reflect on the girls, though, wondering why they're here, especially Cream. Yes, they give us the slightest of hints of his own soft, creamy feeling. He almost has emotions here, but they're interrupted by that mysterious ice climber. Shadow gives chase, but the figure turns blue and speeds off, then turns red, then rips out a portion of the lodge and decks Shadow with it, sending him off the roof. Will Shadow survive this? What happened to Rouge? Who is this mysterious stranger? If you were reading this at the time of its original release, this was a fun little cliffhanger, but yeah, all those mysteries are pretty immediately solved as the next issue kicks up here. Things pick up in the ski lodge with Cream and Amy having I, breakfast, I think? Is that a parfait that looks like a sundae? <laughs> well, anyway, the girls are discussing Rouge. Cream is worried about her because she just disappeared last night and hasn't shown back up. Amy tells her not to worry about it. You know, it's Rouge. She's a big girl. And Rouge herself pops on by to tell her, hey, don't worry about it. I'm here. This is all followed shortly by the announcement of the next Chow race starting soon. So the team take their leave. Watch closely by Shadow. I mean, I doubt anybody's surprised that he survived the fall from the previous issue, but <laughs> it's all a bit anticlimactic. Uh, he looks a little pissed off or worn for wear. I don't know, but he reflects on the night before where we see him drag himself out of the water, holding a business card for Clutch the Apostle. <laughs> Shadow spent all this time looking for a notorious bot trader, and the dude has a legitimate business card. He's not even hiding it. 
I mean, I'm sure he's doing legitimate antique trading stuff of that nature as a front for his more illegal Eggman tech trading, but still, man, he should have probably made that connection. As the Chow race carries on, we see Shadow make his way over to Clutch's stash. The room is currently empty as the Chow race is going on, so we can safely assume that Clutch is over at the races, and Shadow makes his way over to a cloth that's hiding something. We don't see what it is quite yet, but Shadow has a look of disgust on him as he peers under the cloth. At the same time, we see a robotic voice call out to Shadow, saying that he's not part of Rouge's plan. Has the code word changed? Well, you could probably obviously guess who was talking to Shadow, but the comic again does not reveal who just yet, as we switch back over to the final Chow race of the day. The winners of this race will be entered into the semifinals. We spend the next page watching Cheese and the Shadow Chow take on each other in this final race. And this time, it's the Shadow Chow who gets dunked in the water as Cheese takes the win. Afterwards, we see the Shadow Chow groveling in front of Clutch, who gives a side eye over to Rouge. If you recall, they had something of a deal if Cheese won the race. Rouge then attempts to take Cheese for herself, saying that she's got to take him over to first aid to get him checked out. Cream almost agrees until Gemral jumps in. I do think Amy considers Rouge to be a friend, but she's also not an idiot. They don't quite trust her, and who can blame them? But thankfully, the comic doesn't make any kind of drama out of this. Rouge immediately tells them what she's actually up to. She tells them that Clutch really wants cheese, and she's got a plan to turn the tables on him while getting the parts needed to build Omega. She just didn't think Amy and Cream were up for something so devious, and to Amy's credit, she is down for this plan. She tells them that she's going to tag along with Rouge to make sure everything goes according to plan. The bat might need backup after all. So we once again find ourselves in Clutch's penthouse, where Clutch is sitting and quick to make sure the reader knows he is a bit of a jerk. He calls the girls sniveling Girl Scouts, makes fun of their ragged ass robot, and is impressed with Rouge when he discovers that Cream is Cheese's owner. He's impressed because he sees that Rouge is willing to break the bond between these two. <laughs> What a jerk. To all that, Rouge responds that she always gets what's hers. She puts emphasis on it, and Clutch takes notice and asks her what that's all about, which she nervously says once again, I always get what's mine. <laughs> Clutch is obviously used to these games. He can tell this is a code word and also can tell this isn't working, which is fine because at this point he gets a soap shoe to the face. Shadow has been hiding out here with Omega's head. Apparently Omega didn't respond to the code word because Shadow changed up the plan, which was, I guess, to just kick this dude in the face. <laughs> He knocks him out with one go, and is that a Mario coin on the bottom part of his shoe? And a hand? Is that a hand? I've never noticed that before. That's fun. I don't know why Shadow was hanging out there for so long, but he did what he came to do, and he tells the girls to take a look under the cloth, where they find caged chows. They're all crammed in here, and they look miserable. Turns out that they race so hard, because otherwise they would end up back in this cage if they lost. This all sounds fairly tame but it's obviously alluding to actual animal abuse in the real world, especially when it comes to racing animals. And to nobody's surprise, Cream is not happy about this. She wants to get these guys out of here immediately. General agrees, but he says it's not going to be easy, which I don't know why that would be a challenge. I've seen these dudes wreck full on robots, but a barred cage apparently is too much for them. <laughs> Amy notices that Rouge seems to be walking off with a phone in her hand, asking if the bat is leaving as well. Rouge says that she's going to call Tails, saying that they could use their help picking out the bright parts for Omega, which is a solid plan. So while Rouge goes off to call Tails, Amy decides she's going to keep an eye on the possum. It's at this point we finally shift our focus back to Sonic and Tails. I do love seeing those dolls from the Sonic Adventure levels, but yeah, apparently a whole lot's not been going on here as Sonic is trying to entertain himself by punching said dolls. Tails has been spending this entire time trying to hack into the egg net. Out of sheer boredom, Sonic kicks a screw, which ping-pongs around the room, and smacks into the head of a very interesting-looking robot. The bored Sonic is excited because he finally has something to fight, and also because this is a robot type he's not seen before. He goes in for the attack while making a bunch of awesome jokes. <laughs> but the wooden robot dodges every single move. That is until Sonic stomps down on her tail. <laughs> 
and apparently that gives a reaction as her legs kick back into Sonic, which just makes him even more excited as things are now finally getting interesting. But the wooden bot just apologizes, saying that it's a reflex, she can't control it, and says that she's not a bad name. She doesn't even know how to fight, and asks Sonic not to use his buzzsaw hair on her. <laughs> Tails jumps in and Sonic says, yeah, yeah, I know, I won't hurt her. Tails then turns over to this robot and introduces himself and apologizes, saying that usually when they run into robots, it's usually a bad thing. And the robot introduces herself as Belle. Tails, being the polite, level-headed boy that he is, treats her like a person, but he can't help that mechanic brain of his as he admires her construction. He's never seen a wooden robot before. He asks who did the construction, which she says that's private and uh well i mean you could probably suss it out for yourself but we'll get to it when we get to it sonic assumes it's eggman but bell says it's not and her creator's actually missing but they're interrupted as tails hacking got distracted which sets off an alarm this sets off more bad nicks and yeah they're all from sonic adventure and it's <laughs> awesome to see and the room quickly fills with these little exploding robots leaving our heroes in quite a pickle and that is where part two of this story ends but this is sonic tales after all and this is just a bunch of badniks some that they have experienced before so it shouldn't be any surprise to you to learn that they quickly figure out a solution tails guides a bunch of the exploding bots over to the door and sets them off which takes down the door sonic picks up bell and they all take off even the shy bell gets to show her worth as she rescues tails from one of the badniks which impresses sonic but it's time to get going he grabs the other two and they rush on out of the base it's at this point where tails gets the message from Rouge, so I guess they were in there for an entire day? I don't know, but the boys don't waste time as they get ready to take off, and Sonic says bye bye to the puppet girl. He's been very dismissive of her this whole time, and we'll talk about that in a little while. She doesn't have anywhere else to go, and Tails points out that she did rescue them twice. So Sonic agrees to let her tag along on their trip to White Park. We then cut over to the ski lodge, where Sonic and Belle are greeted by Amy. She says she came down here to see if she could find Rouge. As Amy is aware that Rouge did call Tails, she says they really could use his help figuring out what parts to take for Omega. And then she follows up asking, where is Tails? And Sonic responds that, well, when we heard from Rouge, it said that she needed Tails for an emergency. So Tails went off to find her. Amy says that there had been some snags, but nothing she would call an emergency. So that's a little weird. Yeah, as you could tell, something fishy is going on here. Amy leads Sonic and Belle up to the penthouse where the possum is still lying unconscious, I guess. How long has he been like this? Well, whatever, they catch them up to speed with the chow situation, and Belle says that, hey, she could probably help out. She's got a Swiss army knife kind of a hand situation going on here. Basically, she can pick locks, saying that she's really good at tinkering. Golly, I wonder if that is alluding to anything. Cream leads Belle over to the cage where they're gonna begin work, and Amy and Sonic have a quick chat with each other, talking about how weird it is that Rouge and Tails are off on their own. Calm it down, shippers. That's not what I meant. Point is, if something changed in the plan, Rouge should have told her. Something is going on here. Sonic agrees, so he's going to do a quick sweep around the park to see if he can find them. But of course, as soon as the hero leaves the scene, there's trouble. Of course, Clutch was playing possum, and he dips on out of harm's way and asks Amy if she ever wondered why he kept his door unlocked. And it's because the folks who know why aren't foolish enough to cross him and the folks who don't don't make it out alive so i worked at a lot of hotels and i don't know a single penthouse that doesn't have automated locks so maybe it's just old school but i don't know that bothered my old hospitality brain i just <laughs> even still it's just a bad idea you got your ass knocked out you're lucky they did not kill you <laughs> so whatever it's fine point is amy and the rest of the crew are now in trouble as clutch activates a giant polar bear badnik yeah one of the same you saw in sonic 4 episode 2 i'm happy to see that they're utilizing a lot of the fun designs and concepts from winter park which i felt was the standout design of that game and that's not the only badnik as we see some other designs come to life amy begins to run but snaps herself out of it and remembers that yeah i did play through adventure one didn't i yeah i wasn't actually that bad to play that hammer gameplay was not that bad people are just babies and she turns around and begins to fight we then shift 
shift our attention over to Tails, who is knocked out and tied up. And as he wakes up, he finds himself next to Rouge on a roller coaster. Turns over to her a bit offended, asking, why did you attack me? To which Rouge says that she didn't, not willingly anyway. It turns out that she had been hypnotized by our mysterious ice climber. Golly, I wonder who it could be. At the same time, we see Sonic doing his fun little... <laughs> <laughs> He's doing his pose from Sonic CD. Oh, I love that. And he spots Rouge and Tails on the coaster, and he begins to give chase. But unfortunately, he's caught off guard by a rogue roller coaster cart, which crashes right in front of him, sending him flying. But don't worry, he's quickly caught by Shadow. Again, calm down, shippers. So yeah, now we have Sonic and Shadow giving chase, and the mysterious Ice Climber reveals himself to be... S Starline. I mean, yeah, if you've been following along with us while we read through the Bad Guys miniseries, this isn't a big surprise but keep in mind that this was coming out alongside bad guys so we didn't get all the information all at the same time and this won't be the only reveal that's not going to be a big surprise but all the same it is fun to see starline here after all of his adventures in the bad guys series now taking on sonic and his friends with all of his new upgrades he is now finally ready to take on these heroes as a proper villain in his own right and of course he comes along with a diabolical plan as he had some explosive set and waiting for this very moment. Now that he's in front of Sonic, he sets them off, which creates an avalanche, leaving Sonic and Shadow with a choice. Do they rescue their friends here or the innocents in the chateau? I love seeing the interaction between the characters here. Sonic is annoyed as hell. He had to set off an entire avalanche just for a distraction. Starling recognizes that it's a bit cliche, but he is a fan of these classic scenarios. This version of Shadow is not super interested in saving the chateau. Toe. He wants to take down Starline as he embarrassed him earlier in this story. Tails, of course, tells Sonic not to worry about him and Rouge. They will handle it. He's got to go save all those people. Sonic agrees, so he turns around and heads towards the avalanche. Shadow completely ignores Rouge and Tails to go take on Starline, leaving Rouge to rescue herself as she frees herself from the ropes. She points out to Tails how she did it and tells him to get to work on himself. She then sets off Omega's coat code word, which has him set off an alarm, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I love Omega here. Efficiency of auditory attacks confirmed. This unit is never unarmed. I love him. <laughs> yeah, this startles the crap out of Starline, who topples off the roller coaster cart. This ticks off Shadow, as this gives Starline's a means of escape and keeps Shadow from a challenge. Rouge grabs him by the shoulders, saying that, hey, I get it. I want to punch this guy too, but there's work to be done. To which Shadow responds <laughs> like a grown ass adult don't tell me what to do <laughs> And I just realized, like, all of Team Dark is in this one panel as <laughs> she's holding Omega's head. <laughs> Rouge tells him that she's not telling him what to do. It's his choice, and he'll be the one that has to live with it. Rouge then leaves him to it as she returns to Tails as they have a mission to finish. We cut back over to Amy, who is still dealing with the giant polar bear robot. Belle is still trying to unlock the Chow cage, and General is doing his best to protect Cream from all the badness. Cream can't do a whole lot here but she does go over to the chow and let's be real she does have a way with them and she asks them for their help as soon as they get free to which they agree and soon after bell gets the final lock off the cage and they are let loose on the badniks this turns the tide of the battle and they end up victorious but unfortunately they have another problem to deal with as rouge omega and tails arrive on the scene and tell them that they got to get people out of the chateau seeing as there's you know a big giant ass avalanche on its way over here and speaking of, we go over to Sonic, who is trying to figure out how to handle this. And thankfully, he's quickly joined by Shadow. They decide that they're going to try and cut this off by building a dam out of a bunch of pine trees. So they get to work. And it is cool to see these two finally working together in this series. But unfortunately, it's all useless. As the avalanche makes quick work of their quick work and busts right through the dam. Back in the chateau, the heroes meet up with Oma Chow, letting him know that they there is an avalanche and they need to get people out of there. Omachow says that in an event of emergency, they have official warning systems in place. To which Amy responds with a twitch in her eye to get these people to an exit or she'll make some new exits with her hammer. <laughs> 
Have you ever seen a robot sweat before? Oh dear. And with that, Oma Chow turns and tells people to get going. And holy cow, I thought that was Bunny Rabbit for a second there. I mean, upon closer inspection, obviously it's not, but from a distance, it kind of looks like her. I wonder if that was intentional. But before our heroes can take their leave themselves, they are stopped by the returning Starline. He's been having quite the day, so he tells them all he wants is Tails. So hand him over and everybody else can go without issue. The girls respond as you'd expect, as Rouge and Amy both start beating the crap out of the platypus. But he puts his new tricor to work, glows blue, and speeds on over to Tails, grabbing him by the Tails. And Tails responds by pulling on Belle's tail, which lets off that automatic kick right into the platypus's bill. Tails and Belle zoom out of the way as we see the avalanche has finally made its way over to the chateau. And Starline is standing right in front of a window. It bursts on through, blasting our platypus with snow. Thankfully, though, the damage is minimal. This is a sturdy chateau. It was built with avalanches in mind, so everybody at the chateau is safe, but Rouge flies up and notices that she can't see any sign of Sonic and Shadow, which Amy says, hey, if you're going to be looking for a hedgehog, you gotta go for the ground. <laughs> she puts her ear to the snow where she can hear rumbling, and I love that she is just, like, so experienced in hunting down and tracking Sonic. <laughs> But yeah, everybody is reunited, everybody is safe, they got what they came for, and they even have a new friend as well. Sonic apologizes for being a little bit tough on Belle before, and Tails, recognizing that Belle has nowhere else to go, asks if she'd be happy to help him out at his workshop, to which she agrees, and of course we then find ourselves at said workshop where we see Cream hanging out with all of her new Chow friends. I wonder if that's where they're gonna live now, I love that. Oh, we got a little Knight's Chow. There's just so many fun references to Sonic Adventure in this story. And I guess Sonic 4. But yeah, all's well that ends well. Omega finally has his body back. Gemeral is finally looking a little less raggedy. And Vanilla pops on in to pick up Cream and asks how their trip was. To which Cream excitedly explains everything that went down. And we see Amy and Rouge looking so nervous. Realizing that they put her kid in so much danger. <laughs> Oh my god, this art is so good. I like that the cool and confident Rouge can't even keep eye contact with Vanilla. <laughs> Oh my god, that was fantastic. So yeah, as Rouge pieces out of the situation, we turn our attention over to Sonic, who says that things got a little touch and go there at the end. And the little shadow chow looks at him like, are, are you talking to me? Like, what are you, who are you talking to, man? Well, it turns out he's not exactly talking to the shadow chow, but Shadow himself, as he walks through an apple orchard saying things didn't go right, but that's not what really mattered. He's just glad that somebody came to help. And Shadow, from behind a tree, says don't overthink it hedgehog as we see an apple drop and fall over to the shadow chow we will come back around to that in just a second the last two scenes are just quick wrap up as we see tails and bell talk with each other and tails is left somewhat perplexed omega is a robot he's not just a simple machine you can build back together there are also computer files and a whole bunch of other complicated stuff that you need to figure out if you're going to rebuild him that's why tails needed eggman's old tech he couldn't just do it himself. Tails says to Belle that she's been reading these blueprints like it was nothing. The whole reason he and Sonic were at that base was so they could find a cipher to decode these files. The only person in the world who is supposed to be able to read something like this is Dr. Eggman, or maybe something that he created. Tails bluntly says, I wouldn't be mad if you were built by Eggman, I would just like you to be honest with me. Belle once again says that Eggman did not build her. But when Tails once again presses and asks who did, she goes silent. Tails does not press any further from there. And yes, dear viewer, if you've not read this story for yourself, you can probably deduce who did. But we will talk about that in the next story arc as it deals with it directly. The last page of this story teases what's next for Starline. Things didn't go according to plan, but he still got what he needed. And it looks like all he needed was a tuft of fur from Tails. I wonder what he's going to be using that for. So yeah. Yes, obviously all this time later, we do know what that's all about, but again, we will talk about that when necessary.
So yeah, guys, that's the end of the first story arc from Evan Stanley in IDW Sonic. And I'll be honest, it's gotten a little bit of a backlash, and I kind of see where that's coming from, but at the same time, there's a lot I really like about her writing. Let me get the negatives out of the way. The most glaring issue I had with these issues was that there is no reason this had to be four issues long. We did get a couple new characters with Bell and Clutch, but the ultimate point of their mission was to rebuild Omega. That should should have been a couple of backup stories or one or two issues it did not need to be stretched out to this length because the pacing was a little weird here i couldn't quite tell how much time passed between some of these scenes sometimes it felt like no time passed at all other times it felt like entire days went by like the first chow race to the meeting with clutch to the next morning wondering where rouge was an entire night had to happen there as we see a transition from a night sky to the daytime they're eating breakfast all that fun stuff so that tells me that Sonic and Tails spent the entire night at the very least in this Eggman base. But when they finally get a message from Rouge, they're at the Chateau and it's like no time has passed. But there had to be some time transition, right? It's not like they were right next to the Chateau. I mean, there is snow in the general area with the Eggman base, so I can't imagine it's too far away. But it was still weird to see Amy down in the lobby to greet Sonic and Belle when they had a dangerous criminal who was knocked out. How long was he knocked out for? I don't know. I hope I'm making some kind of sense here. It just felt like there wasn't consistent transitions in time here, and it was just real wonky occasionally. The other glaring issue, and again, I don't think this is Evan's fault at all, and I'll explain why in just a second here, is obviously Shadow. His depiction here is, once again, a big problem for a lot of fans. I've said it before, I like a Shadow that's a bit more aggressive. I like him when he's fighting Sonic, but I do agree with a lot of fans of Shadow that this might not be the best way to go about it. But like I talked about, way back when with the metal virus. I'm not going to blame the writers for this. Whether or not they're handling Sega's directions well, I don't know, but that is still ultimately Sega's direction because we've seen Ian write Shadow very well before in Archie, and I have certainly seen Evan write Shadow much better than this in her own fan work. If she didn't make it abundantly clear with her story and her artwork, because she did both for this arc, there is a deep appreciation for the adventure games in this story arc. And if you go and read her comments, that she works on to this day, there is a lot of love for the more nuanced personality of Shadow. And it really feels like she's trying to subtly address that every time he shows up here. It feels like she is trying to get away with as much as possible while still following Sega's guidelines. We see him showing a bit of concern for Amy, Rouge, and Cream while he's standing by himself up on the roof. We see him reflecting on Rouge's words when he's angry about Starline getting away. And that's scene really felt like Evan was using Rouge to discuss some of the issues that a lot of fans and maybe she also has with this depiction of Shadow. And whether or not this falls in line with the larger game canon, this is consistent with what we know about Rouge and Shadow in the IDW universe. So that all tracks. And we see Shadow make the conscious decision to stop his chase and go help out Sonic. Again, be as mad as you want about how Shadow is depicted in this story arc, but this is still pretty consistent for what we we've seen of him in IDW and seen him transition a little bit over to making a more rational decision to go help out the innocents was very nice for this story. And of course, at the end there, Evan is using Sonic to once again address Shadow, saying that, hey, yeah, maybe the dam didn't work, but Sonic certainly appreciated Shadow being there and Shadow saying not to overthink it while obviously handing off an apple to a chow that looks exactly like him. I mean, come on, man. Like, this is Evan desperately trying to tell the reader through little hints in her art and her writing that, yeah, I get it. I'm not happy with this version of Shadow either. I'm trying, guys. I'm really trying. And look, I don't care what anybody says. In my headcanon, Shadow's true purpose for being at White Park was to rescue his Chow. Because that's gotta be his Chow, right? That's gotta be his. I don't care what they say. I don't care if Clutch was racing that thing. That is little Shadow. That is his son. And he came to rescue him. And he's feeding his boy with apples because he loves his chow. Look, I love the character of Shadow, but I don't get too worked up with this depiction of the character. I feel like there are far too many fans that treat the comic canon like its main game canon, only when it's convenient for their arguments because other times it's not canon. Whatever, guys. I understand the critique. I agree with a lot of it, and clearly Evan does too, but overall, this was fun. In terms of what I liked here, obviously Evan always kills it with the art. I love all the references to games, even 
the more notorious ones. And while this comic is slower, I do appreciate the world building that it gives us here. How canon it is, I don't know. And I'm not super worried about it. I like this version of it because it makes sense for what I know for Sonic. It brings in the Chow races and makes sense for their universe and their society. It shows the bright, colorful side of things and shows a more realistic, darker side of things that does kind of parallel, again, with real world issues with racing animals. And yeah, problems with Shadow aside, this is something I really wanted as a kid. I really wanted to see ideas from the games fleshed out and given dimension in ways that the games couldn't do. That's part of the reason why we love to discuss the lore of the Master Emerald or Chaos Emeralds or the Rings, because yes, obviously we know and still know that a lot of that stuff was brought in first with gameplay in mind. It was there to make sense for mechanics. But since we are so involved with this world, it's nice to see them actually explain in a way that would make sense outside of just game mechanics, you know? This is now more than just a fun virtual pet mini game. This now has a purpose and a place in the wider world of Sonic. I also love seeing these character interactions because we don't get to see them a whole lot when the whole world's on fire and covered in metal or things are going a mile a minute in the games. And seeing Rouge, Amy, and Cream all interact with each other makes me feel like this was a very natural interaction and I really enjoyed that. This also subtly recharacterizes Sonic just a little bit, I've noticed, because something I had an issue with early on with this series was I felt Sonic was way too nice. I know they've addressed that and they will continue to address that in some ways. I do ultimately feel that Ian's writing and Evan's writing is very good, way better than most of what we got in Archie. But ultimately, I still feel like Metal Sonic was released by Sonic just for the sake of the plot. It really did not make any kind of sense to me, no matter how they tried to explain it. This Sonic, however, immediately attacks a robot, and after everything he's dealt with with the Metal Virus, it does make sense for him to be somewhat dismissive and distrustful of Bell. Again, you could explain that away because he was cooped up and bored for a very long time in that base with nothing to do, and they did show that off and explain that in the comic, but that also just makes sense for Sonic anyway. This guy busts badniks all the time. This does give me a tinge of the more impatient, reactionary Sonic that I grew up with. He is still mostly that positive guy we know and love in the modern day. We do see him apologize for being a little bit rough on Belle, and even then he wasn't that bad to her to begin with. And it plays off well against Tails, who is more level-headed and reasonable and appreciative of these complicated and unique designs. I just feel like everybody is very well characterized here. The only actual issues I have would be letting Clutch just sit there. I did think it was clever that he was playing possum considering his species, but Starline at least had the sense to tie up Tails and Rouge while they were knocked out. I don't know why Amy and the rest of those guys didn't think to do the same. And speaking of Starline, I didn't quite understand what his goal was here. If he was meant to just kidnap Tails, why didn't he just run off with Tails then? Why did he set up an entire situation on the roller coaster? He was just waiting for Sonic to show up and then set off the avalanche. I don't know. Again, they do address that he loves this classic villainy nonsense, so he couldn't help himself. It's explained well enough, but it is something I noticed. Ultimately, I do feel like Evan is handling these characters very well and is staying very consistent with the writing that Ian provided all up to this point, which is a great deal of writing. Any of the changes in characterization is justified and explained, and we do see their writing weave back and forth within other storylines going forward. Again, there was no reason for this story to be as long as it was, and we do see a little bit more of that with a couple more arcs going forward, but looking back on it and reading it all in one go, it's a lot more fun. And you might have noticed I've not talked a great deal about our new characters. Clutch, I think, is interesting, but only for this story. I think his role as a bot trader and a black market dealer is very interesting. Shows a grimier side of this world, and I hope they come back to him and use him to display a seedier side of things. I think there's a lot of potential there. Not used to the full extent it could have been, but a good enough start. I do enjoy his design. I do enjoy his characterization. And as for Belle, I'll tell you right now, I do enjoy her character design. I love how unique it is compared to everything else we've seen, but I'm going to be holding off on talking about her until the next story arc as they really kind of dive into what she's all about there. But the craziness of the metal virus, the world needed to rebuild. They didn't talk a whole lot about it during the Chow race, and that's partially because we were dealing with a different location that wasn't too largely affected by everything that happened. But now we have Sonic and Tails guiding Belle, who still doesn't have a home since they found her, 
to Restoration HQ, and they do walk through some ruins to remind you that, yes, everything with Sonic Forces has happened, everything with the Metal Virus has happened, and there is still damage to undo. Belle does take note of this, saying she's not sure if this is the right place because everything does look like it's wrecked. But as you can see from Sonic and Tails, they're not too worried about it, and they keep on walking. And they find themselves in a janky little tool shed. You might remember this from the first annual, where Silver and Blaze planted a garden. So that's a fun little callback. Belle is looking a little concerned, and who can blame her? She does have a couple of teenage boys with knowing smirks on their faces, guiding her to an abandoned part of town in a janky tool shed. But not to worry, Tails jiggles a shovel, and the floor begins to shake, revealing itself to be an elevator. Yeah, as it turns out, the Restoration HQ now has a secret entrance. The Restoration decided to keep the town ruins as is as a memorial for everybody they lost during the war and Metal Virus or whatever else they've been through a lot, but hey, it can also double as something of camouflage as well. Anyway, the elevator stops, the doors open, and reveals to us an underground mall slash subway station? I don't know. I really like the design, though. This is Restoration's new HQ, and it looks modern and fun, and I think that's Gadget from the Rescue Rangers there. We may not have Not Whole or the Freedom Fighters anymore, but they are still relying on a lot of those ideas established early on in American Sonic canon. But yeah, as you can see, this is a big giant area, so it might not be easy to find somebody specific unless that person is completely obsessed with you. <laughs> Yeah, so Sonic is wondering where Amy is, only to have her pop up right in front of him <laughs> with sparkling eyes saying, Hi! Yeah, I know she's had to evolve and grow as a character over the years, but I still love seeing these little quirks and this relation between these characters that was established so long ago. I'll talk about Amy a separate time. I love her character, and I love her relationship to Sonic, however it's depicted. Okay, so they weren't actually here to see Amy, but rather that giant bug behind behind her, Jewel the Beetle. That just reminds me, I should have named my shower beetle Jewel. If you don't listen to Sunset City, you probably should. That was a gross story. Just to remind you, at the end of the Metal Virus, Amy was quite overwhelmed with all the duties that came with being in charge of the restoration, so she handed that position off to Jewel, seeing as she's a far more organized person. Problem is, she doesn't have a whole lot of self-confidence, but we will deal with that in the next story arc. Regardless of anything else, she is still a warm, friendly person, and she openly welcomes Belle, saying that there is always room for volunteers. But of course, everybody in the restoration pitches in while they're here. So of course, Jewel asks Belle what kind of skills she has, to which Belle says, uh, mostly woodworking. Jewel says they don't do a lot of that. I do think it's a little weird that something that literally calls itself the restoration doesn't have a great need for woodworking. Yes, I know that's old school compared to a lot of other dwellings we have these days, but that is still a very essential skill for a lot of, whatever, doesn't matter. Jewel thinks Belle might be of some use over at the machine shop. So she asks this lamb girl if she can guide Belle over to said machine shop. I gotta say, after growing up with the Archie series and the old Sad AM stuff and everything we got over here in America, I love seeing all these species actually properly Sonic-fied. Look, I love my Freedom Fighters, do not get me wrong, but they did not really fit in with a lot of the game design, so this always makes me happy. I know I've said it before, I'm bound to say it again. And something else I've mentioned before, we have seen this Lamb Girl. She does have a great design, I do love it, but we always see her with some sort of resentment in her face, so she's probably gonna be a problem down the road. Somebody on Twitter mentioned her by name. I don't remember it off the top of my head, and I think that's partially the point. Like, it's a memorable enough design, but since she doesn't get a lot of screen time prior to this point, I do think they've been planting her here for something bigger. While that is going on, Jewel and Amy show Sonic and Tails around the rest of Restoration HQ, as they've definitely spruced things up from their last location. I have told you guys before that some of these stories story arcs are a little bit slower than what you might be used to, but again, I do appreciate that they do at least mention that not everything is breaking up robots and going on grand adventures. A lot of this volunteer work and restoring the world does require a lot of office work as well, and that's why Jewel is up to the task. But yeah, while Sonic and Tails are hanging out in the computer room, we go back over to Belle and the lamb lady here. Belle, unfortunately, is still feeling a bit out of place as she does get some side eyes from some passing civilians, and we find ourselves over at the machine 
machine shop, which, yeah, is an underground subway tunnel, isn't it? I guess this whole area is a train station. That's awesome. Just give me Ninja Turtle 2 vibes. I'm all, <laughs> I'm all about it. Look, I don't know what to tell you. I know they're not the only ones that have anything to do with subways, but the Ninja Turtles have given me a deep appreciation for underground architecture in the New York City area. <laughs> anyway, we are introduced to this orangutan hippie guy who is in charge of the machine shop. And yes, you can tell from his demeanor and that tie-dye shirt that he's a very chill dude. As when he's addressed as sir, he says to chill out on the official type stuff. Gotta relax, sister. And yeah, he does react to Belle like Tails did, kind of. Says that she's got a far out look and asks her what her make is. <laughs> They actually didn't give us a name here for this guy. Wonder if we'll get it later. But yeah, he asks Belle to hand a wrench so he can get to work on a sedan as we see the lamb lady walk out of frame with half her face covered in thick black shadow. I wonder if they're implying that she's going to be a problem later. Something I was wondering when I started this issue was why Belle was here at all. Because if you remember just one issue prior, Tails had invited her over to his workshop. And I assumed that she was just going to be living there. She could read Eggman Codex. She was helping out with schematics that indicated to me that she would be a crucial part of whatever plans the heroes had to make when having to take down Eggman. She proved essential in rebuilding Omega after all. But as we see from this montage, she just might have been getting more in the way than anything else. She gets herself caught on fire. She accidentally hurts the orangutan. She doesn't know how to make coffee. <laughs> She's trying to be helpful, but she is more of a klutz than we initially realized. And if you remember, she does have that unintentional reaction whenever her tail is pulled, which does happen in one comedic event after another, leads her to almost dropping a boat. But it is saved at the last second, thanks to the arrival of Tangle. And what was two pages ago, this super chilled, laid back, hippie orangutan is now pissed as hell. <laughs> He sees Belle as a liability, and he cannot have her in his shop. But Tangle, again, is at the rescue, as she says she'll take it from here. <laughs> I love that the orangutan says for both of them to get out of there, because Tangle is not allowed in there. <laughs> We know enough about Tangle's personality up to this point in the comic. We don't need to see whatever this ball bearing incident was. It's much funnier knowing that at some point off screen, she was enough of a problem in the machine shop that she was banned. I love it. And she is also the most perfect person for Belle to run into at this point. Because we also know that Tangle is one of the most outgoing, caring people in this new cast of characters. She's as extrovert as they come and in the best way. I mean, She's super tight with Whisper, of all people. And she's just the person a self-doubting little robot with no place in the world needs right now. Because where Belle sees her tail as a liability, because anytime it's pulled, it goes off into a kicking frenzy, Tangle sees a sister in Tails as she, well, does everything with her tail. So she thinks Belle is nothing short of awesome. And literally ties them together. <laughs> I love these expressions. They're so good. I just love that about her personality. Everything that Belle sees about herself as an accident waiting to happen or an uncontrollable mistake, Tangle sees nothing but potential. She thinks it's awesome. She wonders what kind of crazy crap they can get up to with their two tails and just flat out says, let's be friends. So yes, they introduce themselves and they're immediately friends. Because again, this is Tangle. If she decides you're her friend, you're her friend. And they're just tight now. And she just walks with Belle like they've known each other for years. It's, ah, oh, she's fantastic. I don't think enough people talk about how great her character is in that aspect. But unfortunately, we also know that Tangle is something of an adrenaline junkie. Because now that the friendship stuff is settled, she needs something exciting to happen so she can see what kind of crazy crap they can get up to with their stupid ass abilities. <laughs> and they overhear a couple of women talking about a freak storm along the coast, saying that it's in no way natural, and they wonder if Eggman's up to something again. This stresses Belle out, but this leaves... <laughs> This leaves Tangle shivering with excitement. Oh my God, that expression. She literally picks up Belle and rushes on over to Jewel so she can take charge of the mission. But unfortunately, Sonic, Tails, and Amy are already surrounding the screen talking about the weather. They're looking over a picture taken by a scouting drone before it was taken out by a storm surge. And it looks like, well, a giant tower that looks like a checkpoint from the games is emitting a lot of energy, which is causing the surrounding area to react with a lot of storms, which 
which could be a problem for surrounding coastal villages. And of course, Sonic responds that, hey, if it's something Eggman related, him and Tails can handle it. And Amy, clearly starving for an adventure with Sonic, says that she's going to join in as well. Tangled cheers, saying it's mission time, but unfortunately, Belle interrupts her, saying that she's on inventory duty this week. They've got donations to catalog, which immediately pumps out. Poor Tangle. Bell reminds her that everybody in the restoration has to do their part. <laughs> that song's like, don't worry. If Eggie summons a god of destruction or digs up some ancient fighting robots, we'll let you know. All while this is happening, Bell is thinking to herself that he might be there. But if she says that she wants to go, they'll want to know why, and she can't risk that. So she instead turns to the ever eager Tangle and says that she has an idea. The story then shifts our focus over to Sonic, Tails, and Amy arriving at said tower. The trio make quick work of the egg ponds out front and slam through the front door. But in their momentum, they launch themselves straight into a portal. Rut row. We turn our attention back to Belle and Tangle as Belle begins to work on restoring a hover bike. Tangle is excited for a new adventure, but she begins to explain that she is second guessing this idea. She did join the restoration to help support Jewel since she took over but she hardly sees her friend. And maybe this is a bad idea. Maybe they shouldn't go against Jules' wishes. But before she can do anything else about it, the hover bike is back up and running. And this design, it's too polygonal not to come from a video game. I can't recall what game that might be from. Maybe it's a Bad Nick ride. Maybe it's from Sonic Shuffle. Maybe it's an arcade cab. Sega had some wild ones. I don't know. If you do, let me know. But yeah, the girls are off to the tower themselves as we once again shift our focus back to Sonic, Tails, and Amy. As they arrive on the other side of this well teleporter door whatever that was it shuts itself off therefore shutting them off from an exit as they find themselves peering down a long hallway this could be a trap this could be dangerous but sonic's never been one to shy away from a new adventure so he immediately speeds down the hallway finds himself an egg pond and immediately wrecks it saying that if there are bots close by there's got to be something worth finding and yes that's true those are basic video game rules tails is wondering what it was doing with a piece of chocolate and yeah, I just realized that too. It is just walking down the hallway, drawing a line. <laughs> What? Amy says they're not too worried about it. They'll figure it out. They always do. But next panel shows us 10 minutes later. That's impossible. They'll never find the ending to this place. And I love specifically that it's 10 minutes, which is the exact amount of time you are allotted in the classic game acts before you find yourself with a timeout and a lost life. This tells me, at least in the IDW universe, that these characters can only stand for 10 minutes worth of exploring before they just completely give up on life. Thankfully, they have a genius in tow, and Tails puts an arrow on the wall. He wants to test something out. He begins running down the hallway, drawing even more arrows, eventually coming back around to the spot where he drew that initial arrow. But this time, it's not there. Tails concludes that somehow this place is changing around them as they move through it. And he wonders what the heck they're going to do about it, and Sonic sees it as nothing but a challenge, saying that if this thing wants to shift around him, then it better keep up with him. So he grabs a hold of his friends and begins to launch off, which seems to send them <laughs> through a prism of colors, possibly multiple dimensions, maybe mirrors, who can say, but something crazy is going down. Got some mirror universe shenanigans going on here. They're finding it very disorienting, not sure which way is up, so it's Amy's turn to try something out, as she swings her Pico hammer into a wall, which <laughs> seems to completely break time and space. Who can say, something crazy trippy is going on here, and they're caught in a Technicolor nightmare. Gosh, I wish you were a hypersonic reference. So yeah, that's where the first part of this story ends, and it picks back up with them lost in a trippy void of space filled with geometric shapes, and yeah, actually looking a lot like the Sonic Advance special stage, isn't it? So yeah, again, I think IDW is helped canonizing in their own universe a lot of other game stuff we would see, which again, I've stated before, I absolutely adore when they try to explain things that were created for game mechanics. Tails hypothesizes that Eggman has created a space where he can somehow circumvent normal spatial laws, thus allowing him to construct an autonomously tessellating proportionally expansive structure without concern over typical physical limitations. The hedgehogs, and I'm sure some of the audience looks a little confused, but all that basically means is that Eggman has somehow created a pocket dimension where he can goof around with the laws of physics, and since he can fly, he can navigate this area a little bit better than the hedgehogs, so he grabs a hold of both of them and begins to guide them through the crazy crashing geometry shapes. Sonic 
Sonic wonders if it's some sort of a trap, and I mean, that very well could be. But Tails says considering how easily they broke out of it, he's not sure. Eggman knows what they can do, and if he meant to trap them, he should have compensated for that. Tails looks around, assuming that this place is nowhere near as big as it actually looks, and he finds an exit. So they head towards it. And what they find on the other side is, um, well, a quaint village. They are back on solid ground, but something is giving them very eerie vibes. While all this craziness is happening, we cut back over to Tangle and Belle as they finally arrive to the troublesome Storm Tower. They land, finding themselves among a bunch of busted egg ponds, assuming that Sonic and Pals have already been here, which is no problem for Tangle. That just means that they can catch up with their friends that much faster. And as they walk through one of the rooms, Belle catches a glimpse of a giant Eggman logo. Golly, I wonder why that would catch her eye. Tangle snaps Belle out of her distraction and leads her over to a vent, which leads them into the door room from Monsters Incorporated. It's actually a room full of badniks that looks like they're building something, and it's full of those teleporter doors that Sonic, Tails, and Amy had first flown through. The girls sneak around as we overhear a couple of robotic voices. One asks the other if the pawn squad had fixed out a hole, but unfortunately it looks like they all got lost. To which the other laments that this was such a nice, quiet job until Sonic showed up, wondering how he even found out about the base. The other voice responds saying that, well, at least they're still trapped in chamber one, but the first voice says that they got into chamber two. And we soon discover what you probably already figured out, that the two robot voices are Orbot and Cubot. Unfortunately, Sonic is making such a mess that they have to do something that they never want to do, and that is call their boss. Eggman picks up saying he's busy, so they better make it quick. How have they screwed up now? Nervously, they tell their boss that Sonic and his pals have gotten into the test chambers, and they flinch, ready to be yelled at, but Eggman instead says that while Sonic's arrival is unexpected, it's not entirely unwelcome. He says that he'll take it from here, as we shift our focus back to the girls who overheard the entire conversation, Belle looking down at Tangle, saying that that was Dr. Eggman, like she's coming to a realization of sorts. She didn't expect him to sound so, but before she can even finish the sentence, she slips and falls into the path of three marching egg pawns. But to her surprise, they walk right by her without even taking notice. Tangle yanks her back up, asking her what that was all about. Belle says she has no idea, but Tangle wraps her up in her tail, saying that she wants the truth now. Why was she so hell-bent on coming here? And Belle confesses that she just had to be sure of something. That little incident just proves it, that whatever she was built with, it's the same as them. She is a badnik, but she doesn't want to hurt anybody. She just wants answers, and she felt that the only person who would have those answers would be Dr. Eggman. But as we saw as she overheard his voice and saw that logo, she might have a feeling for something that we probably already figured out. Belle says that if Tangle wants to smash her calm down, shippers, or leave her, she will understand. Damn. But Tangle says that Sonic and Tails vouch for you, so you're alright in my books. And she's far from the first robot friend made by Eggman that they deeply trust, so no big deal. All that matters to Tangle is that she is trying to do the right thing. It does not matter where she came from. So she drops the interrogation and they get back to it. But this time, Tangle promises that she will help Belle find the answers she is looking for. We turn our attention back to Sonic, Tails, and Amy as they walk through the empty streets of this creepy villa. Sonic says he'll do a quick sweep of the area, but Tails reminds him that this place is probably using the same spatial warping as the other other maze, and uh, yeah, it is. Meanwhile, Amy is trying something I still to this day try in every open world game I come across, and that is check for an open door. And she happens to find one. It opens to an impeccable interior, which uh, yeah, also gives off a bit of a creepy dollhouse vibe, doesn't it? Sonic calls out for anybody. They don't get a response, but Amy looks into a room and sees that somebody is in there. She apologizes for barging in, but before she can finish her question, she sees that the person is in fact a test dummy, which yeah, just makes things even creepier. <laughs> They're not doing anything, so they just leave the dolls be and head upstairs where they hear a lot of scraping and clicking in the bathroom. They look into the bath to find themselves. <laughs> <laughs> the creepiest caterpillar I have ever seen. It's amazing what a surreal yet mundane setting and a set of mandibles can do for a design. That is awesome. As you'd expected, a quick fight breaks out. Amy smashes the caterpillar with her hammer and they head on downstairs to where they find themselves, well, basically in that scene in Sid's bedroom from Toy Story with a lot 
lot of mangled, messed up looking badniks. Looks like Eggman's been having too much fun with one of those online Pokemon fusion generators, as he's done that with his own creations. But while they are a little bit creepier, that doesn't make them any less smashable. Sonic wrecks the ones inside the house and tells the others to block the windows so others can't get in. And as we look out the window, it seems there are quite a few of them. It's too many for them to take on directly, so they gotta figure out a plan. Tails says that if they can track the wireless comm signal of the badniks back to their source, that might lead them to an exit. It's a start, but Amy's still not sure why any of this is happening, and Sonic agrees. He thought this would be some kind of a trap, but Eggman loves to rub his face in it if he thinks he's got Sonic trapped, but they have not seen any sign of him yet. Tails agrees. This feels impersonal. I also have to agree, and it does make it that much creepier, and I like it for that reason. And all this mystery puts Sonic's quills on edge. Be careful with those quills, Sonic. Fans get upset if you mess with them too much. But as he says all this, that iconic laughter comes out from a toaster. <laughs> Yeah, so Eggman is communicating with them through a toaster that has his own label on it. <laughs> I love that this lunatic has all these crazy deadly robots and they all still look like toys, but he'll also make theme parks and I guess go so far as to make modern homes and appliances and still slap his label on it. Fantastic. And apparently he's put speakers in all of them. He's got a stand mixer talking crap to Sonic. We got Sonic looking down at the toaster. <laughs> As it explains to him, as well as the oven and the fridge, that this isn't a trap. This place is a test. Not for Sonic, though, but instead Eggman's most cutting-edge technological concepts. He explains it as a crucible for what could become the next generation of mechanical monstrosities let loose upon your unsuspecting planet, which, again, doesn't currently have a name. Debate Earth, debate Mobius, I don't care. They're not telling you, and that's a problem for me. But yes, this is why Eggman man isn't upset that Sonic managed to find himself here because now he's got a set of real test dummies to set these crazy badniks upon. That is where part two ends. Part three picks up with Bell and Tangle still in hiding while Orbot and Cubot continue to run the machines that seem to be creating these fused badniks. And I love that they're... <laughs> <laughs> they come out of a slot machine. That's a fun callback to not only Sonic games in general as they're chock full of slot machines, but also Sonic X as they use something akin to this when they were doing their Robot of the Week setup in that first season. I love this. That's awesome. I also love how much fun the art seems to be here. Like Evan seems to be having a great time combining all these classic badniks together. This whole thing's a lot of fun. I just love how they're playing around with these iconic designs from the games. <laughs> I love this motobug and masher, well, mashup. <laughs> Got some hardcore Magikarp vibes from that. That's awesome. Magikarp? We'll call it Magikarp. Yeah. Maybe it'll hit hard if it flails extra hard. That's clearly a Magikarp joke. I just, whatever. I love this. But yeah, by this point, Bell and Tangle have figured out what's going on here. Orbot and Cubot are sending out these badniks to go mess with Sonic. So Tangle interrupts the operation by, well, tangling up the two robots. But while that's going on, we cut back to Sonic and his pals that are still trapped inside of this empty building. Well, I say empty, but they still have those test dummies. But not only that, Eggie still has a bit of control over the house itself as one of the test dummies is caught on fire and in turn the rest of the house begins to catch in flames. I just need to say it while I'm here because I tweeted about this. I noticed this when this issue first came out and I know I wasn't the only one but this would have been a great place to introduce the Tails doll if they were allowed to or if they ever were. We still don't know on an official level if he's considered part of classic game canon only or if they're allowed to use him in the modern designs. This comes close to it, and we at least have a reason why Eggman would create something like the Tails doll. But yeah, back to the story. Sonic, Tails, and Amy bust out through the wall and get back onto the street. It looks like Tails has figured out the source of all the badnik signals, so they begin to head on out, but unfortunately, also something from the games, if you're familiar with Crazy Gadget or the Death Egg Zone from Sonic and Knuckles, the gravity flips on them as the ground is now in the sky. He grabs a hold of Amy and ricochets off of the badniks to keep himself airborne while Tails, being Tails, flies alongside him. He grabs a hold of a chimney so they don't fall into the endless, seemingly endless abyss of the sky below or whatever's going on in this test chamber as they have to cook up a new plan. Unfortunately, Tails has lost track of any sort of signal he had before. And now it's Sonic's turn to test their most dangerous hypothesis yet. He recalls that while he was talking shit to a toaster, that Eggman wanted to show them something and he couldn't very well do that if they were 
were dead. So they decide to just let go and fall into the void. And sure enough, in the darkness, they come across a Tesseract. Yeah, that word existed before the Avengers, I promise. To give you the most simplified definition of what that means, it basically is used to represent fourth dimensional space. And I think it's being used here to kind of represent that this is going beyond what we comprehend in our physical reality, meaning that Aggie's got full control and rules are out the window. But mind bendy reality has never been much to stop Sonic, so they hop on in and he calls out Eggman. Walls form around them, and the ever iconic Egg Viper from Sonic Adventure shows up. And Sonic says, hey, I've dealt with this kind of bot before, no big deal. And I love that it's specifically Sonic that says he's dealt with it because, yeah, Amy and Tails were playable in Sonic Adventure, but this was never a boss fight for them. But even though they've never dealt with one before, they figure out the rules pretty quickly as they begin to knock the crap out of it. And yet, they even do the hop, skip, and the jump that you have to do as Sonic. That's awesome. But unfortunately, unlike the normal boss from Sonic Adventure, this time Sonic gets zapped. But also unlike the boss fight from the game, Sonic has his friends around. So Tails helps give Sonic some air so he can take a crack at the cockpit. But where Sonic is expecting Eggman to crawl out, he's instead met with a hologram and an exploding cockpit, which sends Sonic flying. Eggman says that that's one point for Sonic, so let's see how they do in round two. Because yeah, now we get three Egg Vipers, and it looks like they're all being controlled by Eggman with the VR unit. <laughs> And that's not just any VR unit. That is a Sega VR unit. This was never officially released, but yeah, back in the Genesis days, Sega was working on a proper VR unit. That is an awesome deep cut and something I would expect from IDW. That is amazing. They might also be referencing Sega ages with that final line with Eggman saying he hasn't had this much fun in ages. I mean, that wouldn't exactly be a stretch. He is wearing a canceled VR Sega unit on his head after all. But yeah, these Vipers are giving our heroes hell, each of them with their own corresponding powers. Red one being fire, blue one water, and the green one wind. We cut back to Belle and Tangle as she somewhat attempts to interrogate the two bots, and they all end up looking like idiots, but... <laughs> That's all well and fine as Bell is currently working on something on this little tablet here, redirecting egg pawns so they don't bother them, and discovering a live feed of Sonic and everything going on with the egg pawns. All well and dandy, but the most important thing Bell has discovered is that she can potentially track down which portal leads to Sonic and in turn rescue them, but that might take a while. But Tangle accelerates the process by tricking Orbot and Cubot into showing her which one they're actually in. Tangle wraps her tail around a pipe to hold as an anchor while while she is going to jump in. Bell reprimands her, saying that it's reckless. They have no idea if Tangle will end up in the middle of the ocean or get her molecule scambled or any number of things. And Tangle just says, well, you saw how the fight was going on the live feed. There's no time for second guessing. Whatever happens, happens. Trusting your gut and accepting the consequences is just what heroes do. Sounds a bit irresponsible, but well, really no time for that particular conversation. As part three ends with Tangle taking a leap of faith. Part 4 begins with Sonic and his pals not doing super great against these new Egg Vipers. But Sonic, seeing his friends in danger, hatches a plan on the fly. As the Fire Viper wraps itself around Tails and Amy, he tricks the Water Viper into spraying its brother down, just as the Wind Viper comes in to clear out the smoke. Sonic then has Amy use her Pico Hammer to launch him up to the Air Viper, which blasts a gust into a spin ball, which sends it flying straight into the Water Viper. That is one down, but unfortunately, the Wind Viper is back for revenge and pins all three down with a pair of Cyclones. Just as Tangle arrives through the teleporter from above, landing smack dab on top of said Viper. As all that's happening, the comic turns his attention back to Bell, as well as Orbot and Cubot, which are still wrapped up in Tangle's tail. Enemies they may be, the two lackey bots remain as polite as ever, as Orbot asks for Bell's attention. He's got a question, but before he can ask it, Bell answers for him, tired of a question she's been asked quite a few times up to this point, saying that she is not an Eggman robot. Or at least, well, she doesn't know. It's complicated. She in turn asks if they know him, and of course, they do. And she wants to know what they do for him. They say it's nothing special. Cook, clean, make coffee. He's very particular about that. Nice and strong. No milk. And Belle finishes with, and lots and lots of sugar. She leans ever closer to a truth that we have all been aware of for quite a while now. And if that 
that wasn't enough. An angry voice comes out of the tablet she has been holding, the same one that she procured from Orbot and Cubot, the voice of Eggman. He's screaming at his two lackey bots, asking how they're screwing up now, as he's aware that the Viper fight isn't going so well. But he's caught off guard by an unfamiliar voice. And as he pulls off his headset, he finally meets Belle. And with a quick eyeful, he sums her up very quickly. Unconventional material, but he'd recognize that joint design anywhere. There's only one person on this planet who builds machines like that me and suddenly he knows exactly what he's looking at the little helper that he put together while he was delusional thinking he was some sort of small town inventor he takes the time to congratulate himself saying that even in that impaired state he was still innovating he asks the puppet what did mr tinker call you to which she responds bell the tinkerer Bell is clearly shaken by this encounter. But Eggman's got work to do. He tells her not to go anywhere. He's got some questions for her. But first, he has a hedgehog he needs to crush. Bell, heartbroken, heart shattered, but still desperate for some kind of answers. Nervous and terrified as she may be, stumbles over her words, trying her very best to keep Eggman's attention while she has it. She needs some sort of comprehension, some sort of inkling that the man she knew as her father is still here here. She asks him with tears in her eyes, you wouldn't do something like this, not without reason. Please tell me this isn't what it looks like. Eggman ponders her just a moment, saying that, well, since you took care of me while I was in my alter ego, I'll give you a reason, I guess. He says, let me tell you about the tower you find yourself in. For a man of my intellectual caliber, the restraints of reality can, at times, become stifling. Merely tinkering within the limits of our banal world no longer satisfies, and that's where this place comes in. He goes on to say that he has bent the laws of physics themselves to his will. He has made a labyrinth without peer. He goes on to brag about the labyrinth, his simulation of a world he finds imperfect. He brags about his bad nicks, how quickly they can overrun a town, recruit new test subjects, how they constantly evolve and discover new ways to best dominate whatever environment they find themselves in, adapting and growing with each new generation. And that, I suppose, is his reason. This unrestrained, ever-evolving genius. And he answers her question with Another question, what makes your precious toy maker worthy of such admiration in the face of my unrestrained genius? And with that, the tablet collapses on the floor, crashing, ending the communication between the little puppet and her creator. Belle is given only a moment to grieve as the portal behind her reacts. Belle asks the two lackey bots why it's doing that, and long and short of it because Tangle's tail is still caught in that energy field, it's causing something of a feedback loop. It wasn't built to have something in there for that long. Long and short of it, this place is going to implode. So our heroes have got to get out of there. But thankfully, with the arrival of Tangle, our heroes have turned the tides. Eggman, ever being the sore loser, decides to just kamikaze bomb with all three of them. Not unfamiliar from the actual boss fight. But thanks to Tangle, all of them grab hold and make their escape. Bell quickly informs him that, yep, this place is going to blow. We got to get out of here. And Sonic has everybody grab hold of him, including the two robots and they all make their escape on the tornado as the tower consumes itself. And Eggman, who has never been present once during this entire encounter, <laughs> still can't escape a little bit of physical harm as his VR unit overloads on his face. <laughs> On the tornado, Tails confirms that there is no sign left of the tower. Tangle asks what to do about Orbot and Cubot, who looks so nervous. <laughs> Bell just tells them to let them go. They're not the ones who did this. And Sonic, like he did with Metal Sonic, just agrees. Just yeah, let them loose. So they do just that. Also, what happened with the inking on this page? Everything was so pretty up to this point. What's going on? Look at Tangle's face. Oh, getting flashbacks to early Archie interior art. Oh boy. Boy. Now that we have that settled, Tails, as caring as he's been this whole time towards Belle, notices that something's off and asks her if everything's okay. To which she says, without looking at anybody, yes, no, she's fine. Nothing happened. And then with a pause, she says that's not true. Finally deciding to come clean to her new friends about everything going on with her. Things that the reader who has been paying attention this entire series has already figured out. The instant we laid eyes on her wooden design and her pink and green uniform. She says that she was built by a man named Mr. Tinker. When he disappeared, people told me he had been a monster all along. That he was actually Dr. Eggman. And she didn't believe him. She couldn't. And she 
thought that if she could just talk to him, he'd understand and she'd explain and that's the most she can explain before she breaks down into tears. Tingle says that really sucks, but hey, you helped do something good today, and your dad would have been proud of that. And with that bittersweet sentiment, the story comes to a close with Orbot and Cubot in the ocean. <laughs> okay, so this is yet again another story that probably didn't need four issues to tell itself, and I don't blame Evan Stanley for this, but you do notice these slower stories after the metal virus, which could be argued that was expanded out much longer than it needed to be, or a lot of of IDW in general. Regardless, I am again happy to see some consistency within the writing of these characters. Evan's already proven that she's got a great handle on the other girls in Sonic's cast, so adding Jewel and Tangle into the mix worked just as nicely. Tangle still has a little bit of that manic energy, but it's not quite as over the top as we've seen previously. Jewel still has a little bit of growing to do, and we will see that happen, but she's clearly comfortable in her new position, and it is nice to see her role expanded a bit in this new Sonic universe. All that put aside, it's time to talk a little bit about Belle. So, Belle is not exactly the most exciting new character we've seen thus far. She doesn't really have much in the way of cool abilities. I mean, yeah, it's pretty neat that she can read through Eggie's schematics, but she is a bit of a klutz as we quickly found out while trying to help out a straight up hippie. <laughs> <laughs> that, I must admit, is a little confusing. She was built to be a helper. She proved to be very useful at Tails Workshop for the little time we saw of her there. Maybe she was just having an off day in the machine workshop. I don't actually know. But the point of that was to show that she doesn't quite fit in anywhere, and she has been lost for quite a while. And no, the reveal that she was built by Mr. Tinker wasn't exactly a shocker for anybody. When look at her design in that uniform, and you knew exactly who did that. That was never going to be a surprise, and the book doesn't treat it like such. We all knew who it was, and deep down, Belle understood that Eggman was Mr. Tinker. Part of her just didn't want to believe it. She didn't want to think that her father, this man that she knew to be this loving, caring person, was capable of such cruelty. I mean, how could she? That was never going to be a shocking plot twist. All it was ever going to be was an emotional gut punch. Revealing who she truly was to Sonic and her friends meant that she also had to come to terms with some hard truths. She wasn't able to confess her whole backstory until she finally confirmed for herself that her father was really and truly gone. Hers is a story of loss, and her journey is going to be one of trying to find yourself and your place in the world after having suffered such a great terrible thing like the death of a parent, long before you're ready to strike out on your own. And at the start of the story, we find that, again, that's not going to be an easy task. And that's why Tangle is such an integral part of this cast. All that matters to the lemur is if you're a good person. That's it. That is exactly what Belle needed, just as that's what Whisper needed. It doesn't matter if you're introverted. It doesn't matter if you're not good at anything specifically. It doesn't matter if you're made of wood. All that matters is what you do with your life and your choices. Like the Rise of Skywalker, just way less messy. Belle wasn't built to be a hero, and in turn, we're probably not going to see anything like a miniseries like we would with Tangle and Whisper, or even Starline. And as such, I don't think she's going to be quite as popular as those characters but all the same. With her, we get to explore some deep, complex, emotional themes. They're a little more fantastical and a little out there, but not so far off that you can't find some real-world parallels. And I know some of you get super upset whenever I point this out, but this is a kid's book at the end of the day. Sure, us adults can't enjoy it, but you should be able to hand this off to a seven-year-old and they should still be able to have a good time. I'm sorry, but the Wild West days of Archie writing is just just long gone at this point, but that doesn't mean you have to treat kids like they're babies. As wild as the concept is of Tinker being the father to a wooden puppet who is sentient and doing its own Pinocchio thing, that's all a bit out there and wild and crazy, but at the same time, a child dealing with the loss of a parent is something, unfortunately, people have to deal with sometimes. A deep, tragic, sudden loss in their lives when
someone, they're not ready for that. And I know fiction is chock full of orphans and all that fun stuff, but I appreciate the heart put into this story and the importance placed on Belle and her identity and having friends around her that don't treat Tinker as Eggman. That is incredibly important. Bad guys turning good and forgetting who they are for a little bit. That's the kind of crap you would see in Saturday morning cartoons and you would throw that away after one episode. And what I like about stories like this is that yes, sometimes they are dragged out longer than they need to be. And yeah, we didn't need four issues just to get to this emotional impact for Belle. A lot of this didn't exactly revolve around her, but stretching that out and letting that breathe makes it hit that much harder when we have that conversation between Eggman and Belle. And honestly, it takes a long time to heal from that kind of pain. So surrounding yourself with people who understand you, who care about you, who love you, is probably the most important message to take away from this. Like I said, the Archie days are long behind us, and you're probably going to get a much more standardized version of a lot of these game characters. We're not going to meet Sonic's parents. We're not going to get a crazy new bit of lore for his backstory. We're not going to get long lost family members. He's not going to murder somebody and change up the status quo. In other words, we're not going to see a great deal of growth or change in his character or any of these long running game characters. And that's what makes these comic book created characters so important because we can have more complex backstories or arcs. They can have more dynamic relationships. They can change. They can probably die if they need them to die. That's the complicated thing about writing strictly guided IP like Sonic the Hedgehog. These are mascots. These represent a company, a corporation, and said corporation is going to have strict guidelines on how you can use them. That's not made up by writers. That's not some fake BS or whatever these idiot content creators want to tell you. That is just how it works. I don't care what they did in the 90s. That is not what they do now. And yes, you can still tell great stories with these characters we've come to know and love. But as you can see with these spread out plot lines, there's really only so much you can do when you have to keep things as tame as they are. So having characters that are allowed to grow and change do help give us some sense of progression in this world. And at the same time, these characters need to make sense and work well with what's already been established for Sonic and the game cast. And I think this crew has a deep love and understanding of this franchise, and I think Bell works great with all of that. Again, not the most exciting character, but we don't need every single character to be an action hero. I really like how unique her design is, I like her personality, I like her story, and I like that she does play a role in carrying on the spirit of Tinker, which as we've discussed before, turned out to be his own person. Sonic and his friends cemented that idea the first time we met him. And yeah, it's great to see Eggman back in full force, but yeah, this is the first time I've seen like a personality shift plotline for a villain leave me missing the other personality. And I'm not alone in that. It was good to see that Belle got some sense of closure. As heartbreaking and traumatic as it was for her, she does finally confirm to herself that yes, her father is gone. But while she has to come to terms with that loss, she finally opens up to these people around her, and I think in turn they finally truly see her as an ally and a friend. And yeah, they've been treating her as such for a while, but this finally firmly cements it for all of them. And finally, Belle might have a new home and a new family. But since this is a comic book, the story is far from over. As drawn out as it may be, I am still excited to see what's next for every one of these characters, including the new puppet girl. As for the rest of the story, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's another fun Sonic adventure. I didn't actually mind this one being drawn out as much as it was. I had a lot of fun not only watching Belle and Tangle make their way through the tower, but also watching Amy, Sonic, and Tails make their way through the labyrinth. I wish we had a little bit more time in that creepy, eerie, silent town. It did make it a little bit more eerie when Eggman was hands off, but it was hilarious to watch a toaster yell at Sonic. Seeing them once again take a thing from the games and kind of make sense out of it with the special stages, or at least some kind of reference to Advance 1 special stage, was also kind of cool as well. I mean, the tower was just one giant checkpoint or star post or whatever you want to call it, and it basically acted as a portal to a different dimension. And yeah, there are a lot of fun implications from that, and I don't know if they'll play with that idea again, but I thought that was really cool 
cool. I like the design for the new Restoration HQ. It gives me a lot of Ninja Turtle 2 vibes. And yeah, all you haters of the Freedom Fighters and all that fun stuff, say what you want, but if you like Restoration HQ, you like a lot of the ideas that were planted back in the early days of Sonic Sat AM. And this comic just proves to me, even if they aren't using the same faces or names, that those ideas still work well in this franchise. And honestly, it's long overdue for Sonic and all of his crew to have some kind of a home base to be established, because the games have been very loosey-goosey about it for a long time. Welcome back to Sonic Speed Breeding, and I know we just got ourselves introduced to Evan Stanley's writing, as she's taken over as the new head writer, but that doesn't mean Ian Flynn is out completely, as he has returned to tie up some loose ends from the Metal Virus Saga, that specifically being the Deadly Six. Yes, that's right, all of your favorite Sonic villains have finally returned. Look, in all seriousness, I've genuinely been enjoying, well, Zavik specifically, in terms of IDW and and his place in this world and his interactions with these characters. And there are some fun things that happen in this arc, so let's just jump into it. We kick this story off in Winterberg, which is what you'd expect. It's a wintry town. We have this lovely polygonal Sonic ice statue, looking very Sonic the Fighters there. And we jump into a fight between Eggman and Sonic. It's surprising how long it's been since we've seen these two actually duke it out. And it really is just classic Sonic and Eggman banter. And I really love how Ian writes these two characters Obviously, I've sung the praises of his work for quite a while now. And I love this snowman mech design with this snowflake buzzsaw. It's just, ah, oh, fantastic. Long and short of it, Sonic is trying to stop Eggman from taking over this town, but Eggie's not here for the town. He's just trying to stop the Zeddy as they are still on the loose. And I love that he calls out Sonic saying like, hey, since you can't seem to handle it, I gotta take care of it myself. And Sonic's retorting like, what are you blaming me for? You're the one that brought him to this world thanks to your Plague of Palooza. To which Eggman says, I wasn't my fault that was starline's fault and sonic says well that was your lackey so it's your fault i like that they're passing the blame back and forth from each other not realizing that they're both partially involved with this ridiculous mess but i do appreciate that we are still talking about the metal virus because this was the latest crazy event that happened for this world and it's left a lasting impact so expect to hear about it occasionally going forward but while they bicker they are watched by the teal raisin known as master zick of the deadly six from there he he learns that Zavik is indeed still alive, and we know that as well if you followed along with the Bad Guys miniseries. And ironically, since both Sonic and Eggman are so focused on each other, they let the Zeddy escape without them ever realizing he was there to begin with. And of course, we throw in that infamous Baldy McNose hair joke there. Yes, I know it's meta humor. You're gonna be okay. I promise you guys, it's gonna be fine. We then spend the next few pages just following along with the rest of the six. Starting off with Zavik, who is still being carried from that egg pond as he was at the end of the Bad Guys miniseries, mostly talking to himself, catching up everybody if you haven't been reading up to that point. He's still not doing great from his fight with Eggman, but he's a determined son of a gun, so he keeps on going. And from here, we're going to be watching Zavik catch up with the rest of his crew now that he's free from jail and no longer associated with Starline. First, catching up with Ziz, who is trying his best to catch a fish, not handling it super well. Zavik's not too happy with, well, the state he's in currently. Ziz tries to make excuses, saying, like, hey, everybody went back to normal. I have no more control over them and they kind of kick me out of town. To which Zavik says, you are Zeddy. You are one of the deadly six. You do not survive you conquer. And yeah, they just summon the moon mech that usually accompanies Ziz, and the two of them just start wrecking the nearby town. <laughs> oh my god. Soon the town is nothing but rubble, and Zavik forces a doctor to patch up his wounds. Once they finish up, the doctor asks Zavik if it's okay if he goes and tends to his neighbors. Zavik says no, and then pushes his head down. Zavik, that's so rude. That's not how you asked for a favor from your partner. I'm kidding. They're actually implying that they murdered the doctor right then. Yeah, that's, um, that that's way more appropriate. Savik turns to Ziz saying that I oh God, it's so hard to say their stupid names together. Anyway, Zavik turns to Ziz and says that the town was pristine before they began. Did he do nothing with the Zombots? And Ziz says, of course I did. And I mean, yeah, obviously it's Ziz. But something called the Restoration rolled in and fixed everything. And Zavik ponders on the name. We then move on over to our next town, Vista View, where we see a caged Zombot. <laughs> 
Oh, that is just a lovely visual, isn't it? He's mostly been behaving because they've been feeding him on the hour. He's a simple creature of simple needs, so yeah, it hasn't been too hard to keep him contained. But that doesn't last long as Zavok has arrived to remind him that he does not wait for his food. He consumes all. As purple and yellow start wrecking the town, Zavok continues to gather information on the restoration. And looks like he's trying to actually understand their way of life. He doesn't seem to understand why they rebuild and protect. He sees it as them working together to undo everything that the Zeti have done. Thankfully, the rest of the book isn't just Zavok going to a town one by one to rescue the rest of the Deadly Six, because Master Zik has been at work as well. And he catches up with Zavok with Xena and Zor in tow. I just... I hate saying their names. I do love this dynamic between these characters here. They all see Zavok as their leader, and Zavok does rule them with fear, but he shows the utmost respect to Master Zik. So when Zik asks him, now that the Deadly Six are once more, what are we going to do? And Zavok responds that, well, we're going to go to these towns that resisted us and just destroy them. And Zik responds with a, that's it. I love seeing that Zavok is showing a little nervousness, like he's a child that's letting a parent down. But yeah, these two just kind to discuss what they're going to be doing going forward. Zik says that he understands that desire, but it's too obvious. He asks Zavik, I assume you left nothing but misery in your wake? And Zavik says, I assume the screams led you to us. And Zik says that you have now set a pattern. They are far from their home base. They are in the land of their enemies. They're numerous and they're organized, and it won't take them long to realize who their targets are and to properly prepare for them. To which Zavik says, well, then we're going to face them on this battlefield, or we will fall in glorious battle. <laughs> Zick says, yeah, that's an admirable end to be sure, but we can achieve so much more. And he suggests that they go and tear them out at their roots. The restoration has been the one that's been undoing everything that they managed to destroy during the metal virus. So in turn, they need to go to the source and destroy the restoration. And to do that, they're going to try and scatter the heroes. They're going to try and establish some sort of pattern as they already have been doing by wrecking towns. So they'll continue to do just that. And after it seems like they have a pattern going, and in turn have the heroes prep for their arrival in these other towns, they'll instead double back towards Restoration HQ and tackle it while it's at its weakest. And that's exactly what they do as we see them attack Orchardville, which we did see Zor attack back during the Metal Virus. And now that Zavik knows what to look for when it comes to resistance fighters, he pins a couple of them down and makes sure that they are passing the word along of their attacks. And it works exactly as planned as we switch our attention over to Restoration HQ where we have Jewel talking to the Chaotix and they immediately assume that yeah that's exactly what's happening the Deadly Six are out for revenge and they just got sloppy about it and that in turn gets passed on to Sonic who is still hanging out with Eggman with their winter retreat as he blows up his base and slides on down a hill man that never gets old I'm always happy to see that little reference I can't wait to see that on the big screen but yeah like I was saying Tails gives him a call and lets him know that the Deadly Six are back and the Chaotix have narrowed down their next targets to be Winterbird and Sunset City, which is super convenient for Sonic as he is already right next to Winterberg, which gives him a chance to chill out while he's waiting for the six to arrive, which as we already know is, uh probably not going to happen. As part two of the story kicks off, we see that, yeah, the heroes react exactly as the Deadly Six want them to. As Jewel has coordinated with the heroes that we know in different cities where we expect the Six to attack. The Chaotix are in Sunset City, Tails is in Central City, and Sonic in Winterberg. But they're not just waiting to ambush the Six. Tails, of course, was anticipating to run into them again as they were all aware that they were still on the loose on their world. So he's been hard at work at creating the Zeddy Zapper. What this basically does is turn their electromagnetic powers against them, which disables them in the process. And once these are attached to the Zeddy, they'll be placed on the Zeddy launcher, which <laughs> is just the Tails rocket from Sonic 4. That's awesome. So yeah, the hero's battle plan is basically just capture the Six, stuff them on board a rocket, and send them back to the Lost Hex, where they will no longer be their problem. But unfortunately, they do have other issues that they're not quite aware of yet. That being the ever-annoying, the ever-persistent Dr. Starline. He's currently trying to figure out how to enter Restoration HQ, specifically for Belle. He only had a brief encounter with her over at White Park, but as everybody else who's been a tech head has noticed so far, is that she has a very unique build. So of course, Starline is very interested. And 
and we'll find out specifically why later on in this story. And something I should have clarified when we first talked about the new Restoration HQ, I did compare it to the Freedom Fighters, but it's not exactly like the Freedom Fighters, at least the early Freedom Fighters. They're not actually in hiding. They are a known force in this world. They do have a main entrance. They are basically a military compound. The tool shed that we saw Sonic and Tails utilize was just a secret back door. The same secret back door that Starline has managed to stumble upon himself. And once he gets in there and does a little bit of tinkering, he manages to deduce how you get in there. And yeah, he's heading into Restoration HQ. And he's probably not going to have too many problems sneaking around in there because as that's happening, the front entrance is being greeted by a flaming truck. Now that the heroes are scattered, the Deadly Six have arrived and they're not wasting any time getting to work. We were just introduced to this place and the Zeti are immediately beginning to tear it down. There is a security force there, but they really don't stand much of a chance against these guys or against these Sonic Adventure references. How does it make you feel, guys? Seeing one of the Deadly Six do the adventure pose. But Zavik is a little confused. He was expecting a bit more of a fight here. And Ian uses his moment to kind of establish what this world is all about, saying that the people of this world cherish peace, they live in complacent harmony, and are only occasionally disturbed by Eggman. And on those occasions, they rely on their heroes. Outside of that, they see no need to prepare for violence, which, I mean, it's an explanation. Sure. I love that they're using the six of all characters to critique the world setup here. But yeah, while they're causing chaos, we move back to Starline. <laughs> And as you can imagine, he's none too pleased to learn that Zavik is still alive. But he uses this distraction to his advantage, and he carries on with his search for Bell. The restoration's not completely defenseless, though. We still have Tangle and Whisper there to defend them. And Jewel is quick to recall the heroes, which are all scattered about the place. We see the Chaotix on the move. We see Tails trying to call Sonic, who is already on the way. Holy cow. I haven't mentioned this yet for part two specifically, because all the art for IDW has been for the most part, pretty fantastic. But Tracy Yardley does make his return with the interiors for this, and it just looks so good. He did that infamous Sonic zooming across the country to attack Eggman back in Archie. And he's back yet again to show us what a pissed off Sonic can do, which is a lot of fun to see. We move back over to Restoration, where Zamon has made his way over to the workshop, where we have the yet unnamed Orangutan and Bell. But Starline is quick to dismiss him with his hypnosis abilities and sends him on his way. The Orangutan pops out to thank him, but Bell is quick to point out that Starline is indeed a bad guy. I gotta say, it is nice to see that Bell is back in the workshop. I thought she'd be kicked out for good. And not only that, the orangutan tries to defend Bell, but unfortunately, Starline makes quick work of him and tells Bell to come along willingly. Otherwise, bye bye orangutan man. So, of course, that's exactly what happens. Bell goes along with the evil platypus. We turn our attention back to Sonic as he just arrives, but unfortunately, not in time to catch Bell as he just misses Starline walking her over to the elevator. Oh man. The Zitty are trying to make their way through a pair of steel doors, which is where Jewel is residing. Zala manages to open a small hole and Zavik says he'll take it from there. I love this line. Such a curious tomb. The living are inside. Let's fix that. Well, before he can fix that, he and the rest of the six are met with a spin attack as Sonic has finally arrived with some of the best art Tracy has ever given the character. Oh my god, I love this. And that is where part two ends. Part three, I'll be honest, is a pretty brutal fight by IDW Sonic standards. It is Sonic versus all six of them at the same time. And I do love his banter here, saying you couldn't leave well enough alone, could you? Had a whole world to explore and enjoy, and you just had to pick a fight. Tangle is doing her best to join the fight, but she can't open the door. Sonic says they'll need Tangle Tails help to do that, but in the meantime, he'll keep them busy. It might take a little while before Sonic can get back up from his friends, but thankfully, Whisper does have something to work with with that little hole that Zama made. She has Tangle brace her with her tail, and she just starts shooting the six through the hole in the door. That's awesome. So yeah, we have Sonic fighting all of them. We got Whisper shooting at them. Green Lady tries to reach in and grab the gun, but gets socked in the face by Tangle's tail. Fantastic. The next few pages are just some fun action, but Zavik 
eventually gets tired of all the shots from Whisper and turns his electromagnetic abilities towards the door, which messes up her mask and Wispin. Tangle shoots out her tail to react, which is just grabbed by Savik, and she slammed up against the door. Oh my god. We turn our attention back to Sonic, who is still taking on Zaz, who just doesn't know when to quit. I'm pretty sure he's quoting Lost World here with the tear it up nonsense. Sonic tries to tell him to stop. You're done. Zaz says he's not done till he's dead, but Sonic just knocks his ass to the ground saying, nah, you're done. And unfortunately, he's socked in the face by Zavik, who says that he admires his tenacity. For what is perseverance, if not a lesser form of ruthlessness? Ian just writes Zavik so good. Oh my god. <laughs> but yeah, Sonic unfortunately is starting to get a bit worn out here. He does spin dash away from another swipe from Zavik, but unfortunately is kicked back towards the Zeddy, who grabs Sonic while he's a spin ball and slams him into a wall. Sonic, you just have no luck when you try to spin dash into burly red dudes. Zavik commends him again, saying that Sonic is a mighty warrior, the most challenging they have ever faced, but challenges are meant to be overcome. And we actually get some genuinely good sass from Sonic here. You're bitter your poetry circle didn't like your stuff. I get it. Can we jump to the part where you actually do something? Goodness gracious, I love this. The fight continues on, but unfortunately Sonic is quickly subdued by Zamom. Zavik tells him to hold him steady while he goes and attacks the heart of the HQ, but thankfully, Tails has finally arrived and puts the first of his Zeddy Zappers onto Zamom. Tails hands off the others to Sonic and he quickly manages to subdue the rest of the six, all except for Zavik, who again gets a hold of Sonic and smashes him to the ground. And this again is another bit of redemption for Tails as Zavik holds up Sonic by his head and mocks Tails, saying that you're out of tricks, boy. Now what? And Tails responds by saying, I'm going to use the skills that Sonic taught me. That's what. And he spin dashes into Zavik's gut. But unfortunately, Zavik grabs a hold of the tiny fox and slams him into the wall. Again, there's no blood, but this is really rough for these guys. This is awesome. And Zavik holding the fox, his tiny body in one hand, while Sonic in his other weakly tries to reach out to his best friend. He says to the little fox, and now your skills have failed. And Tails responds by saying, guess I'll just have to go back to my tricks then. As he's held the last of his zappers under his tail and smacks it onto Zavik. Oh, and I guess there was one more left and he goes and hits Zor with it. I completely forgot that idiot was there. Why did they leave that for last? Did they just forget to draw that early? <laughs> what is this? What? But yeah, that was a really brutal fight, featuring the deadly six of all characters. And as brutal as it was, it shows the brotherhood of Sonic and Tails so beautifully here. But unfortunately, it's not cause for celebration quite yet. We have one more problem to deal with. The orangutan has gotten back up and has made contact with Jewel. And Tangle tells Sonic that Belle has been kidnapped by Dr. Starline. Part 4 kicks off in the ruins of Emeraldville, which I assume are just the town ruins that surround Restoration HQ. Sonic has gathered the six out front where Tails has brought along his rocket, and they'll soon be returned to Lost Hex. But not before one last conversation between Sonic and Zavik. Zavik asks them what's to become of the six, and Sonic simply says, we're sending you home. And as we've been learning through this whole story, Zavik is just utterly confused at the very thought of compassion. And Tails explains to them what we already know. The rocket's gonna take them back to Lost Hex, and at that point, the Zappers will self-destruct. But Zavik just laughs at the thought of mercy. He says that he will make Sonic regret showing restraint. This moment of compassion will be repaid tenfold in violence and misery. And at this point on the page, we flash back to all these different spots in the Metal Virus where Sonic is called out for being too lenient on his enemies. First by Shadow, then by Espio. Go back even further to when Metal Sonic was fully repaired, and when Eggman and Sonic finally met up again for the first time after he had been restored from his Mr. Tinker persona. Sonic looks back at all of those moments, and he responds with a smirk on his face to Zavik, saying that he is not going to sacrifice his principles out of fear. If Zavik wants to cause more trouble, fine. Waste your time, because Sonic will kick his butt every time. And Zavik says that he can respect that, and they carry on with their merry way. Now, I have gone on and on and on about 
about this, about Sonic being way too compassionate, about how he has some sort of responsibility to everything he's done, this and that and the other. Sonic is not completely in the right with this. And I'm pretty sure that Flynn is aware of that as well. I feel like he just had to address this crazy cycle that Eggman and Sonic are in and how it affects the rest of the world. This is here to simply explain Sonic's point of view on the entire thing here. And it's also kind of addressing that this story arc, this particular line of questioning is over. We're laying it to bed. This is how Sonic perceives the world. This is his principles. And this is how he carries on as a hero. Is Sonic absolutely correct? Is he making the perfect choice every single time? It's not important. That's not the point here. Like I said way back then, they're not going to portray Sonic as a killer. That's just not going to happen. And that's fine. I did critique Sonic's thought process on this whole thing, but I feel like that was kind of the point of all of this. It could be further explored, and maybe someday they will tackle this kind of morality situation again. I don't know, but to me, these first few pages are simply wrapping up the last little bit of threads that were left with the metal virus. That being the Zeddy, and again, that being the moral conundrum that Sonic found himself in with the metal virus. And if nothing else, I do appreciate that Flynn is going in and wrapping up all the stuff that he started way back in the early days of this series. But I've rambled on about that long enough. Let's carry on with the story because this is just the first couple pages. We're done with the Zeddy. We gotta go deal with Starline. So while the heroes look for their friend, we cut back over to Starline and Bill themselves as she's waking up and finding herself strapped to a lab table with her head open and her hat's on Starline's head. Oh no! Bill is obviously freaked out and for good reason. And Starline says, finally, you have the most obtuse startup routine. But then again, that unorthodox design is precisely why he sought her out. And Belle says she's nothing special. She just repairs stuff and mess things up. Not always in that order. <laughs> and I love that cute little reference to Transformers behind Starline there. But yeah, he's not really interested in what she does on a day-to-day -day basis. He's far more interested in what makes her tick. He says he's not here to disassemble Belle as she is a unique, incredibly complex piece of art. He wouldn't dare risk damaging her. Despite their falling out, he still holds Dr. Eggman's work in high esteem, which sets off Belle as she says that she wasn't built by Eggman. And Dr. Starline uses this moment to further break little Belle's heart as he explains to her what we readers have known for a long time now. And basically that he is the one responsible for bringing Dr. Eggman back. In other words, Dr. Starline is the one who killed Belle. Bell's father. And we see a side of the puppet we have yet to see. She is furious as she screams at Starline, you took my father away from me. But Starline has not responded to any of these emotions. He doesn't see her as a person. He sees her, again, as a work of art. All he cares about is how she is built, because there's something about her design that he wants to use for himself. And when he sees Bell react, all he says is, such passion, such realistic emotional simulation. He wants this reaction out of her. And this gives us some backstory that we are already aware of. We know about Mr. Tinker's story, but at the same time, it is kind of retconning her own story as we had not seen her at any point while he was Mr. Tinker and a lot of fans had been asking, well, where was she? And again, we don't know for sure when she was created. Not entirely important, but this does address why she doesn't live in Windmill Village. And that's basically because once the metal virus did drop and Dr. Eggman had returned and eventually the villagers were changed back to normal. They came to see Belle as a potential threat, another Eggman robot. They took down everything Mr. Tinker had built. They yelled at her every time she tried to fix anything around town. So she eventually ran away and eventually ran into Sonic and Tails at the abandoned Eggman base and we know the story from there. We cut back to the present and as we quickly find out, Starling didn't actually care about any of that. He was just reading her brain as she was telling the stories, all he cared about was seeing if he could physically measure her emotions. Basically, she has an artificial intelligence that is unmatched. A sense of purpose and belonging rendered in beautiful, replicable code. Yeah, he's basically going to use everything he learned from Belle and apply it to something else he's working on. Something we're aware of if you're caught up with the comics, but we'll talk about another day. But while he's caught up in his own nonsense, Belle is let loose by an unseen 
force. We can see for ourselves that it's a cloaked Espio, but Belle doesn't see that. So when Espio says to keep quiet and they'll escape while he's distracted, she freaks out and says, on top of all of it, they're ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, she blew SBO's cover. So Vector decides to quit sneaking around and bust the door down. But Starline doesn't seem super worried about it. This isn't actually his base. He has all the data he needs and he destroys any evidence that the heroes could bring back. And with his Tricor, he easily outmaneuvers the Chaotix. And as he stands at the doorway, he says, better luck next time, detectives. And Miss Bell, thank you. You've been very helpful. And with that, he speeds off with SBO and Charm giving chase. But Vector stays behind to comfort the once again broken hearted Belle. <laughs> the Vector says like literally because maybe Tails can fix that. Oh this poor girl just cannot catch a break. And yet the book ends with the six returning to Lost Hex and swearing revenge. Good for them yada yada yada. That's great. Overall not the craziest story in the world but it is nice to get a little more closure on everything that they had built up in the metal virus. I know a lot of people were sick and tired of the deadly six but Ian writes them so well that I don't really mind it all that much. Again he gives some awesome quotes for Zavik. So yeah we finally close the chapter on the six. As good as Ian writes them I don't really need them back for quite a long time. And it is nice to see this consistency between Ian and Evan, even with their own unique characters. Ian handed off Starline and Tangle over to Evan, and in turn Evan handed over Belle and that orangutan dude over to Ian, and I could not tell who wrote what unless you pointed it out to me. It's that seamless. So it's nice to see that consistency between a couple of people who've worked with each other for quite a while, and it is nice to see some of Evan's art in this arc as well. And it does look like we shift over from the trauma of Whisper over to the trauma of Belle. It was really interesting to see Starline and Bell finally interact and man it's just done so masterfully. Like I said about the last story arc you're not going to see a great deal of character growth in the game characters so seeing this progression with Bell is great and also seeing the Chaotix again. I always forget how much I miss them until they actually show back up and I think this is the first time they've interacted with Bell if I'm not mistaken. Yeah overall I liked it and I didn't expect to like it that much because when this was first coming out I just was not excited to see the six again but looking back we had a lot of great moments we got a really intense fight. We got some fantastic character interactions, some beautiful pieces of art. And again, if you can make the Deadly Six interesting, you probably have a good writer on your hands. So yes, if the story in the next Sonic game sucks, then we know for sure it is not the writer's fault. Yeah, I gotta say, I'm really excited to see that Ian Flynn is on Sonic Frontiers after reading this again. Welcome back to Sonic Speed Reading. We just wrapped things up with the Zeddy and all the loose ends from the Metal Virus, and we hop back over to Evan Stanley and another story focused around the girls in the Sonic cast in IDW. Specifically, Amy Rose, Jewel the Beetle, Tangle the Lemur, and Belle the Tinkerer. Between the war of Sonic forces and trying to restore the world, only to have it get covered in metal and then having to restore it all over again, they've been through quite a lot. And Amy feels that some time in nature with the girls is just what they need. And we start our story off in front of Tails' house, and I love that he went out of the way to actually include his bangs and little tufts of fur on the side of his muzzle all in the house. Just fantastic. I mean, I can't judge. There's eyelashes on Amy's car. It's just... Sure, fine. We have Sonic and Tails helping her pack up, and it's mostly just a bunch of stuff that Tails has invented himself, and he'd really appreciate it if the girls took extensive notes so he knows how to better improve all these prototypes. And this is really all you're going to see of Sonic and Tails in this story. They're going to bookend things, they got video games to play, and that's about it. They are really not important for this particular story, which will throw some of you off, but you're going to be just fine. We cut to the girls all driving towards the camp campsite giving us some fun scenery and well we should probably cover this right now there is a quick flashback from a couple days ago explaining why Whisper is not a part of this particular crew. She attempts to sneak away from resistance on her own but is caught off guard by Tangle who is out for a jog. Again it's pretty clear that Whisper really didn't want to have to explain what she was doing to anybody especially Tangle but long and short of it Whisper sees herself as a target. Mimic is out in the world and the last time that was the case he tried to kill her. So 
understandably, she sees herself as a liability and needs to get away from the rest of the crew. And that is something that's going to be distracting Tangle for the entirety of this particular story. Jewel asks why she went so quiet, and Tangle just says that she zoned out thinking about restoration stuff. Jewel says she can relate, but as we can see, it's for entirely different reasons. Jewel just doesn't want to bring herself away from work. Now that she's the director of restoration, she has a lot of paperwork and a lot of delegation to get done, but clearly she needs to unwind and take a break from all of that craziness. As for Belle, she just needs to unwind from all the heartbreak she recently went through. Long and short of it, they're all thinking about something else outside of the trip. They're all going through something, and that's why Amy wanted to bring them all together. But unfortunately, as they arrive at the campsite, they quickly learn that it is packed to the brim with people. And I don't know if anybody else can relate to this, but I still remember the first time I was taken out to go camping and being completely disappointed by what I saw. I expected to be outdoors, in the middle of the woods somewhere, finding a clearing to set up a fire and our tents and all this fun stuff. But what I instead caught was a scenic parking lot, which is just a bunch of trees. And then you're surrounded by campers and angry drunks all night. It's far from peace and quiet. If anything, it's much louder and much more irritating than if you just spent the night at home by yourself. And that seems to be the case here. They are well overcrowded at this particular campsite. And the bear running the place doubles down on that. He actually says that they have some new fire regulations in place this year. The metal virus had infected the entire region through the winter, and since metal plants don't absorb water, well, you can figure out the rest. Everything has been dried up and makes everything a fire risk. And yeah, as someone who lives currently in the Pacific Northwest, I know exactly how dangerous fires can be. It is a yearly occurrence over here. It is not fun. But as this bear is pointing out the map, it is burned away by a fire wisp being held by his little cub son named Ash, who then scampers off and I just... <sighs> children and their stupid sandals. Oh, it's weird looking. After the girls find their space, they begin to set up camp. Tangle is still distracted accidentally. <laughs> smacks Jewel with a tent pole, which is fantastic. Amy's confused at all the weird doodads that Tails had packed in for them. Frustrated that he didn't seem to think of matches, but thankfully, Belle is there to save the day as she has a lighter in her pinky. Amy notices that she seems a bit nervous, and as Belle points out, yeah, you would be too if you were made of wood. <laughs> that is a neat feature, but that is questionable why you'd build something out of wood and put them right next to a fire source, but whatever. Later on in the evening, we see the girls roasting marshmallows around a fire. Tango's still clearly distracted as she has all of her marshmallows catch a blaze. Jewel asks if she's feeling all right as she's been distracted all day and quite haughtily, Tango responds that she can handle it. She just has things to think about. Whether it's intentional or not, there seems to be some tension between the two as Jewel seems to feel down and Tangle irritated and Amy tries to cut through the tension with tarot cards. God. <laughs> so, of course, this is a lovely callback to Amy's origins as she's always been mentioned to have some sort of, I don't know if I'd call them psychic abilities, but some inclination towards tarot reading. And you know what, as much as I like Amy, I'm not remotely surprised that she would be into tarot. I am not a big fan of it myself. I definitely fall in line with Jewel here. <laughs> Amy says that she can uncover the secrets of their destinies. Belle asks if they can really predict the future and Jewel says there's something more of a suggestion. Presenting someone with an open-ended prediction and they'll associate it with her own life experiences. It's cold reading is what she's describing right there. And I don't know where Evan personally falls on tarot cards, but I do appreciate that she does provide a lot of different sides to this because I personally find this stuff to be bogus and potentially problematic depending on who you're presenting this stuff to. But for the most part, it's harmless fun and a nice easy way to present different worldviews of different characters pertaining to one simple topic. And I have to admit, I love the designs of these tarot cards. I mean, look at the detail even on the backs of these things. It's wild. It's like they designed them to be marketable eventually. They went all out with that. Holy cow. Anyway, yeah, Jewel is skeptical and Amy says, you doubt my power? Maybe a demonstration can change your mind. And she pulls out the Master, a card that signifies strength and leadership, a unifier of chaos, showing, of course, a picture of the Master Emerald. Amy says that would be quite fitting for Jewel, who kind 
Amanda agrees. Amy then pulls one out for Tangle, and she gets the Chow's Fruit, a card all about balance of opposing sides, so it can mean many things. A showdown, a moral dilemma, a partnership. And when Amy asks if any of that sounds familiar, Tangle says she can't think of anything. Other than an odd Zeddy attack, they don't get a whole lot of excitement around Restoration HQ. And we see Jewel frowning and thinking to herself at the words of Tangle. Amy then turns over to Belle, who is nervous and not sure if those cards can work on robots. Amy says, of course, as long as you're open, the cards won't steer you. And then she pulls out something that makes her stop speaking mid-sentence. Belle, who moments ago was very nervous about having a card reading, is now suddenly very eager at the response of Amy and wants to know if it's something about her dad. Amy holds the card up out of reach, but unfortunately, Belle accidentally stumbles over, knocking the cards loose from Amy's hand, and Belle's card falls into the fire. Amy says not to worry about it, as she had drew the Statue Savior, as it's all about mercy and protection, which is a lovely reference to Sonic CD. But as she says this, Jewel picks up the Statue Savior. So obviously, that was not the card, because that had not been burned in the fire. And whatever Amy drew, we don't ever find out, at least not in this story arc. So I do appreciate they keep that mystery to themselves for now. And with that, Jewel decides to turn in for the evening. Tangle says she stays up a little bit later, but Jewel reminds her that she's not a night owl and it said with a little bit of coldness. Later on in the evening, we see all the girls fast asleep, except for the little robot who is still clearly feeling quite insecure and down in the dumps and everything else that Belle usually feels. She's had a rough go of it. She heads out of the tent and wanders on her own and stumbles upon a brush shaped like Sonic's head. Well, it turns out that had been designed by none other than a little Motopug, who jumps out of the bushes and scares the crap out of Belle, knocking her backward and hitting her head against the rock, which knocks her unconscious, or I guess in her case, short circuits her for a little bit. She falls to the ground with her lighter pinky still ablaze. The evening passes until about 5 a.m., where we find an annoyed Amy woken up by the smell of a bonfire, only to see smoke on the horizon. So clearly there's a forest fire and people are starting to panic. But our girls, being the heroes that they are, begin to coordinate. Tangle notices that Belle is missing, but before they can do anything about that, Amy goes over to the ranger to see if he has some sort of fire escape plan. But unfortunately, he has lost his son, Ash. Tangle immediately jumps onto the situation, offering her services to head on out to the woods to track down his son, saying that that's where she can do the most good. Since they have somebody covering that particular problem, they can have the ranger focus up on an escape plan for everybody else. Part two begins with Belle regaining consciousness right in the middle of the forest fire, and she spots the silhouette of two mysterious characters who, uh, uh, well, we know who they are if you've been keeping up with the book, but yeah, they're just teased here. Unfortunately, Belle can't linger on that mystery for too long as she realizes she is surrounded by fire, and she looks down at her hand to see that the wood has been burnt off, leaving a metal skeleton exposed. So is she not actually made out of wood? I mean, I figure she might have some circuitry under there, but is she like a metal skeleton with wood over it? I just, I don't know, man. Whatever the case is, that little motobug notices that she is on fire and revs his wheels to cover it in dirt, clearing the flame and congratulating itself. That is the cutest damn motobug I have ever seen. It's kind of cool to see a badnik get a little bit of love here. Belle notices that the motobug did this intentionally and also noticed that the little robot dragged her out of harm's way while she was unconscious. As she's piecing all that together, she also realizes that that her lighter was still lit when things went dark for her, meaning that she might potentially have caused the fire. She can't linger on that thought too long as she is found by Tangle. They immediately establish for Tangle that the motobug is on their side, and it again is looking adorable, and Tangle uses some of her sports wrap to help wrap up Belle's damaged hand. I mean, it's made out of metal. I don't know if that really is necessary or not, but eh, it's, it's fine. I'm overthinking it. So yeah, this is going to be our separate plot from what Amy and and Jewel are doing. Belle and Tangle are teaming up yet again, but this time they're off to save a little bear cub. But turning our attention back to Amy and Jewel, they're still trying to figure out the problem of organizing an escape for all the campers. The ranger points out that the campground is overcrowded, the roads aren't meant for this kind of heavy traffic, and the winds are pushing the fire their way. So they really don't have a lot of time to do much of anything, so they gotta come up with a plan quick. Jewel says they need to coordinate, but obviously everybody is super angry, and that's not gonna be an easy task. And that becomes apparent as we 
we see an outdoor rendition of Uncle Chuck. I know that's supposed to be like a hedgehog or something, but he definitely has an outdoorsy Chuck vibe. I love that design. I also love that different quill animals have different quill designs. I was worried that wouldn't carry over from their time on Archie, but I'm glad to see it's still Sonic fight here. Honestly, a lot of these campers have a lot of great designs. That's pretty true for a lot of the background characters anytime they work them into the narrative. I need a name for this guy, a uh, porcupine Chuck. Pork Chuck. Pork Chuck here is yelling at the ranger, saying that he's supposed to be in charge. So what is he doing keeping everybody here? There's families and kids in danger. Open the gates. Ranger says if they do that, there'll be a stampede on their hands. I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, it's an explanation, I suppose. The ranger tries to empathize with Pork Chuck, saying that he has a kid as well. And Pork Chuck responds, yeah, I've seen him. The one with the red wisp, right? So word begins to spread that Ash and his wisp might be responsible for the forest fire. It does make me wonder how dangerous wisps can be in this world. I still hate saying the plural of that word. Oh my god. But as that argument rages on, Jewel and Amy climb on top of a giant boulder. And Amy stops the argument cold by cracking said boulder down the middle with her pico hammer. Amy grabs everybody's attention and tries to calm them down, explaining why they can't open all the gates because it's just going to get clogged with traffic and everyone's going to get stuck anyway. And poor Chuck responds, well, okay, well then... Do you have another plan? And that's when Amy turns the stage over to Jewel. And while Jewel is good at coordinating, she is unfortunately very nervous. She's not the hero type. Saying that she stumbled through the metal virus and the Eggman attacks and Zeddy and everything. And through all of this, she can't even keep the people of the Restoration safe. She can't even help her best friend. Clearly referring to the out of character mood that Tangle has been in this entire trip. But Amy, being as supportive as ever, tells her that she's been doing her best and she's made it this far and with every new challenge, she's a little stronger, confident that she can handle this. Sometimes you just need to have a bit of faith and she pulls out a stupid tarot card. I mean, it's a good callback for the story beats. I just hate tarot cards. I'm sorry. But with that inspirational speech, Jewel finds her confidence and begins to delegate tasks to different groups to help everybody survive the situation. So yeah, it's a nice big team effort. They turned a panicked crowd into a resourceful group that's going to help each other out. Moving back to to Tangle and Bell and the little motobug, they come across Ash and the Wisp. Unfortunately, he is across a gorge. After some fun little action and some tail pulling, kicking, they make their way across. Ash is clearly scared. He doesn't understand who these people are. Two of them are robots. And Bell calms him down by saying, listen to me very carefully. This is very important. And she honks her nose. <laughs> it's a very cute little moment. It's nice to see Bell actually stepping up and helping out others. Also fun to see a little more old Tangle come through as she is enamored by the funny clown nose. Anyway, after a quick conversation with Ash, we learned that the fire was started by those two mysterious characters we saw at the beginning of part two. And yeah, not a big surprise if you've been following these comics for the last few months, but this was still a fun tease at the time. And this also confirms that the fire was not started by either the Wisp or Bell. From here, the group begin to make their way back to the campgrounds. But unfortunately, they are caught by falling trees from the fire and they begin to fall into the gorge and to a river below and that is where part two ends part three picks up with the group tumbling down white water rapids but tangle manages to assemble the rest of the crew onto a giant log the same one that knocked them into the water and while it was a terrifying experience for the little wooden puppet and the bear tangle just had a tale of a time <laughs> ash begins to cry as he's still scared and bell once again reads assures him, telling him to be brave with her. Nobody's going to be hurt. She's going to make sure. And Tangle just leads the charge with pure vigor and excitement. Bell is completely flabbergasted. She is not sure how Tangle could be enjoying this whatsoever. And Tangle doesn't understand how she couldn't. This is everything Tangle ever wanted. She's an adventurer, doing new things, helping people, just going for it, just like Whisper, who obviously is still on her mind. This is just what she loves to do. Bell says that believing in yourself like that doesn't come that easy for everybody. It says that she's lucky. Tangle says, huh, never thought about it that way. But thankfully, their river ride is at an end as they have returned to the campsite and meet back up with Jewel and Amy. Ash is reunited with his dad and everybody's made aware that the motobug is not there to cause any kind of harm. Jewel catches the other girls up with what's been going on. They've all been working together, but at this rate, it's only a matter of time before the fire breaks through to where they're at currently. At this point, it might just be best to call it 
off and finish the evacuation. I suppose they've been trying to save the forest this whole time as well, which is a noble effort, but you can only do so much. And Amy apologizes for dragging everybody into this mess. But if there's any way left to fight the fire, she thinks they have to try. And of course, they all agree to stick around. Nobody blames Amy for anything that happened. Nobody here is actually responsible for the fire. And Tangle's certainly not leaving. She's having too much fun. So yeah, they find their unity. They find their confidence. They find the best of themselves in a moment of crisis. Even Nervous Belle is starting to find herself in a burning forest. Of all places, she's made out of wood. Good for her. Jewel begins to delegate, telling Tangle and Amy to dam the river. Meanwhile, Jewel and Belle begin to help get the rest of the people out of the way of the river. And with the dam in place, water begins to pool up. And once enough of it has come together, Amy breaks the dam, letting loose a torrent that takes care of the rest of the fire. So yeah, the day is saved and sure, the camping trip didn't go quite as planned, but they all have grown as people and they've bonded closer as friends as they all begin to congratulate one another and Tangle comes to a realization. She is quitting the restoration, which might potentially be an awkward moment between Jewel and Tangle, the two lifelong friends, but Jewel, being a lifelong friend of Tangle, understands where she's coming from. She has been taking note of the lemur's emotions this entire entire time and is aware that Tangle needs to go do her own thing. She can't stick around restoration just for Jewel. As Tangle said earlier, she's much more useful out there. Later on, they find themselves at Tails' workshop. He repairs the busted hand of Belle. They talk about the adorable little moto pug, pointing out that other Eggman robots have learned to defy their programming, but they're usually more advanced models. Belle asks if they could do this for other badniks, and Tails says that's certainly worth finding out. I do have to wonder, they have shown us power cores before, but are we still operating under the assumption that there are animals inside the little badniks? Have they clearly established that one way or another? I I can't tell anymore. They change that every game. Sonic laments on all the fun he missed, and Amy points out that he would have probably been dunked in a river, and he says, fair point. Tangle says she's off to find Whisper, saying that a while back she asked if the two should travel together, and Tangle wasn't ready at the time, but she is now. Amy and Sonic wave their friend off, with Amy saying it all worked out in the end, and Sonic says sometimes a little change is just what the doctor ordered. And yeah, Amy says a break just wasn't in the cards, but she's glad they were there to help. Things could have gotten really bad and hopes that the fire was just a fluke. Sonic ponders on that as we turn our attention back to the recovering forest with our bear ranger coming across a still lit tree and a bunch of footprints surrounding it, confirming that this was no accident. And the final page of part three ends with a shot of Team Chaotix. Welcome back to Sonic Speed Reading. We're going to keep this one a little bit shorter. We're just going to be taking a look at a couple of issues leading up to 50. As they're both technically standalone stories, but it all does lead to everything going on in imposter syndrome. So I feel it's important we cover this before we cover the big 5-0. Starting with issue 48. And before we get into it, I just want to praise Jonathan Gray's cover work here. This is really, really cool. Going to be up front here. I was not a big fan of his work when he first started on in Archie, but I've come to appreciate his unique art style and especially after we get to see his intricate detail on display i'm always excited to see a new piece from him because it's so elaborate and as you can see this is going to be focusing on the chaotix versus rough and tumble and man there's just so much stuff on display here we see those weird square trees from sonic lost world there's a hexaco or something logo in the background there i know i've seen that before but i can't quite place it off the top of my head so if you know what it is let me know there's a chaos cola versus chaos soda and of course the word cope fantastic. That's just a few things. There's a lot going on here. Beautiful artwork. Anyway, let's get going. This particular story starts off with Vector and Espio driving up to the radio station KTBR of Sunset City, which you might recall from the second IDW annual. And it's good to see the rooster and owl again. Vector and Espio are here to pick up Charmy, who has been hanging out with Knight during his shift on the air, helping the owl pick songs and solve people's problems. But having stayed up all night, night, he immediately passes out in Vector's arms. Just adorable. I guess they had to leave him behind while they returned library books because Charmy has been banned for life. But they can't tell him because he'd be heartbroken. I'm telling you, there are a couple of great reptile daddies. But before they leave, Knight hands off a piece of paper telling Vector that he got quite a few calls from Central City and they might be interested in looking into it. We cut over to them in a traffic jam. And I haven't mentioned this yet, but I do love that they brought over Vector's personalized car from 
from Team Sonic Racing. That's just adorable. I want a Chow Mom bumper sticker. Oh, that's that would sell like hotcakes. Why hasn't that been a thing yet? I feels looking through the list that was handed off by Knight, which included power outages, traffic problems, and from everything he's reading, it sounds like a bad thunderstorm, not a crime. Vector says they're still going to look into it anyway. Knight's given them good intel before, no reason to not trust him now. And perhaps unsurprisingly, Vector gets a bit impatient with the traffic jam, pulls out the side of the road, and has Charmy fly him and Espio over all the other cars in their Sonic Heroes formation. As they enter Central City, they're noticing a lot of crashed cars, and the civilians surrounding them are complaining about a lot of flickering traffic lights and other sort of electrical issues. That's causing all kinds of chaos, and I'm not going to list everything here, but Twitter is still having fun with this, I'm noticing, but there are a lot of goofy little cameos and Easter eggs in the designs of all the denizens of Central City. The trio try to ask around for any sort of clues until a crazy old purple thing says he knows who done did it. So I'm coming out of the sewer. It was a Central City mutant monster crocodile. And I love that he is screaming that to a crocodile. It's not much to go off of, but hey, at least they have something. So they're going to inspect the sewer. And as they get down there, they're noticing some promising clues. A lot of slashes in the wires along the walls. And they notice a silhouette carrying a box. Did they just land into a Ninja Turtles training session? They chase the mysterious figure around a corner and into a dark hallway where they're greeted by a nasty smell. One so powerful they actually have to make a retreat and end up back out in the main sewer hallway. I don't actually know what you call that. While they didn't catch up to the mystery figure, they did notice that it dropped a box. They empty out the contents and it looks like it's full of scrap metal. Not entirely sure what that's all about, but they do find a clue on the box itself. A label for Central Shipping Yard. So that's where they head to next. And while the shipping yard is empty, they notice that same stink from the sewer, and they follow it over to an abandoned warehouse. Espio can hear voices on the other side of the wall, so he goes into stealth mode to go check it out. He overhears our mystery characters, who turn out to be, not a big shock, rough and tumble, as we saw on the cover, but what's more interesting is who they're talking to. Clutch the Opossum. Not too surprising that we're not seeing rough and tumble alongside Starline or Eggman after those partnerships went sour, and considering Clutch and his illegal bot trade, it's no wonder he's hired these two to help move cargo, but Clutch is not happy with them. He says that this is everything he could salvage from his home before his property was confiscated, so that lets us know what happened to him after everything that went down in the Chow Race storyline. And, as the Chaotix are going to find out as he's explaining this, he's also affected by all the electrical issues in Central City. He has no means to get his stuff out to his buyers, so he was relying on Rough and Tumble to get the job done. But they were spooked by a detective agency that wasn't even looking for them. While all that is being explained, Espio is leaning over the side of a railing, which makes a creak. Not very ninja-like Espio. And it doesn't go unnoticed by Clutch, who raises his gun cane and shoots not at Espio, but over the top of him, letting loose a dust cloud which covers him, revealing the chameleon's location. Espio lets off a whistle, letting him know that he's in trouble, and the doors are burst down by Vector. And now we're in a fight between Rough and Tumble and the detective agency, and it is so much fun. But while everyone's distracted, Clutch tries to make his escape, but is met in the shadows with a kunai to his neck by Espio. <laughs> Wanting to know if he didn't cause the trouble downtown, then who did? This brings the fight to an abrupt end as Espio shows Rough and Tumble that they have their boss hostage, revealing that these guys, while not doing anything good, are not their targets. They had nothing to do with the electrical power failure. And while this isn't super important to the plot of this particular issue, Clutch does go on to explain what had happened after his encounter with the heroes over at White Park. Saying he had a comfy little thing going on there until he was interrupted, and he saw that as a wake-up call. That encounter with Amy and Rouge and Cream has inspired him to come out of retirement. But with that, Vector raises his fist and brings him crashing down onto the floor, where it breaks apart and all of Clutch's stuff goes falling into the sea below, rendering all of his inventory useless. But Clutch is now out of tricks, as it turns out, he managed to steal a couple of smoke pellets off of Espio. Again, Espio, not doing a super great job at the ninja thing, are you? Clutch sets them off and disappears with Rough and Tumble in tow. So, overall, the Chaotix didn't really get anywhere with their initial mystery of trying to find out what happened in Central City. And more unfortunately, they didn't even manage to grab Clutch. But they did manage to stop his trade in Central City, at least temporarily. What is more interesting from this issue is the announcement of Clutch returning to his life of 
crime, planning to rebuild his underground empire of illegal trade. I was kind of worried going into this issue that we would be spending a lot of time trying to watch these characters solve a mystery we already knew the answer to because at the same time of this being released, we also had imposter syndrome happening. So we already knew the cause of everything going on here. Thankfully, the book took a different direction and instead focused on some characters that are long overdue for attention and spending some more time with the newer villains from the Sonic comic universe. This is only the second time we've seen Clutch and it's good to see him getting some more use here and I'm very intrigued to see what else he's going to do down the line. And of course, I'm glad to see that Rough and Tumble have some other use as well. Their entire purpose is being lackeys. So without a boss to, well, boss them around, there's not a lot they can do on their own. We have seen that happen before. Not saying it's not possible, but they're at their best when they're playing Rocksteady and Bebop. So yeah, this was a fun issue. If you've not read it for yourself and you're a big fan of the Chaotix Detective Agency, I would recommend you go track this one down. But let's carry on to issue 49. This one starts off outside of one of Tails' workshops with Belle and her new Motobug sidekick. But not only that, there are some other badniks surrounding her as well. What's basically happening here is they're trying to replicate the code found in the good guy Motobug. With Belle being a robot herself, she is trying to find some sort of freedom for all of these robots, seeing if there's something they could do outside of Just Serve Eggman. And they're going to test that by revealing Sonic to them. And it's a complete success. Sonic stands in front of a bunch of badniks and they could not care less and <laughs> man they couldn't pick more adorable robots these are fantastic they're just dinking around doing their own thing and more importantly yes this worked out exactly as planned tails is still a little concerned considering all the weird stuff that's been happening as of late namely the forest fire and well central city as we recently talked about and sonic says hey not to worry about it let's go bake some lunch all in all this has been a successful day but later on in the middle of the night, we see Sonic has passed out on the couch, but wakes up to a scraping sound. It looks like the little motobug is trying to tear through the front door. Sonic wakes up a little perplexed, asking if he wants to get out, but as the motobug is made aware of Sonic, he turns around and begins to attack. And I love how nonchalant Sonic is about this. I mean, it is just a motobug to him, so all he's doing is just standing on the couch and just looking on perplexed. All the commotion does wake up Tails, who walks in the room looking confused as well, and <laughs> As you can see in the background here, there are a lot of fun references to all kinds of pop culture on the walls here, which would make sense. Tails has to be a nerd. And as Badnik Mechanic has pointed out, there is even a reference to Fleetway Sonic, which I love. Maybe Sega is being less fearful about referencing other canons. Wouldn't that be a treat? But that is not the only concerning thing as another crash happens and we see that Belle has the same purple glow as the Motobug, saying that she has to get out. She too makes her way over to the door. Tails runs over to her and notices the glow in their eyes, saying that they're both under a control signal like what they were testing beforehand. He tries to tell her to fight it and she raises her hand to attack, which Sonic is quick to block. And this is fun because we see a fight actually break out between Belle and Sonic. Tails runs off to see if he can override the control signal while Sonic keeps her distracted. But with Sonic going easy on them, they are starting to get the upper hand as they start pulling out knives to try and pin him down. Thankfully, Tails just jumps back into the fray with one of his Zeddy Zappers. Glad to see that get some more use. If you don't remember, Tails had created these to override the control commands of the Zeddy so they couldn't overrun any sort of machinery they used. Thankfully, it has the same effect on Belle as she returns back to normal. She tells him that that was a beacon. Badniks, all of them, have been called in. Eggman is summoning an army, and she is quite pissed. Unfortunately, they're not sure where the signal is quite coming from as it's already fading from her memory, but they do still have the motobug, so they decide to let it loose and follow it. Along the way, they come across some farmers who are freaked out by all the badniks on the road. Sonic is quick to pull them out of the situation and tell them, just stay out of their way and they won't bug you. They continue to follow the rest of the badniks, and even with Sonic and Toad, they don't seem to care. They have one mission, and that is to get to Eggman's new city base. But they still want to save their little motobug, who I guess they call 
call Moto Bud, which is adorable. Unfortunately, Tails only had the one Zeddy Zapper, and he can't exactly take that off Bell because that would make her vulnerable again. But they have to do something before their little buddy ends up in the city, and who knows what could happen from there. Bell says that she's been studying the inner workings of Badnik, so she thinks she can be of some kind of help. So they pin down their little Moto Bug and begin to get to work rewiring him. Unfortunately, that seems to catch the attention of all the surrounding Badniks. Sonic and Tails fight them off while Bell gets to work, and while they don't reprogram him, they at least manage to shut him down for the time being. And with Moto Bud offline, the Badniks go back to their core mission of getting to the city. But Bell is still looking over the downed Moto Bud and pulls out a scrap of paper. Turns out this is a letter from Mr. Tinker, saying that to whoever finds this letter, it is for his daughter, Belle. He says that though I am captive, I do not ask for rescue. It's too late for that. This is a confession to ease an old man's conscience. He goes on to say that he lived a good life, bringing joy to those around me, watching Belle become the wonderful woman she is, and says that Starline told him that Tinker used to be Dr. Eggman, and says that he cannot deny the logic of that evidence. Tinker says he is not Dr. Eggman, but if he ever loses himself to that nightmare, he is truly sorry, ending by saying that he loves Belle, and always will. So yeah, even though I've heard Flynn say a few times now that Tinker was never meant to be this big deal, they do still keep bringing him back. But this does bring some sense of closure to Bell, and it does confirm for what a lot of people were saying, that this Moto Bud was indeed the one that Tinker was working on when he was captured by Starline. I had completely forgotten about that until somebody pointed that out on one of my earlier videos, because I thought it was super weird that this random Moto Bug was just nice for no reason. So yeah, it's cool to see all these little pieces connect together like this. But yeah, I do think that this issue kind of serves as a final goodbye to the Tinker idea, that yes, he he is truly gone. He is not coming back. But as Sonic says himself, those memories will always matter and they will live on through her and they must keep moving forward together. And with that, Belle gets back up, ready to face Eggman for everything he has done. And she and Tails grab onto Sonic and they launch off towards the command tower and Eggman's new city base. And that is where 49 ends. Welcome back to Sonic Speed Reading, and we're finally taking a look at Imposter Syndrome, the latest mini-series from the IDW run. And anytime they introduce a new character into this canon, fanbase is usually in an uproar, and it's especially interesting this time around because of the two new antagonists we're getting, who we will get to in just a moment, but first, let's start this story, which kicks off from the perspective of Dr. Starline. And all he's basically doing is recapping what Eggman and Sonic are all about, and his problem problems with both of them. He's telling his video diary of his plan, Operation Remaster. With this plan, he'll finally be able to break what he affectionately calls the Sonic Cycle. So basically, the rinse and repeat formula of Eggman versus Sonic going on forever and ever without any evolution or change is what he wants to bring an end to. And of course, there's some meta commentary there with Ian using famous phrases from the fandom like the Sonic Cycle and talking about remasters. And I personally think it's a very clever way to entail this into an actual story. And I have to wonder if this is some kind of a commentary on the fandom feeling like they know what's best for Sonic. I certainly couldn't be blamed for anything like that. But yeah, we'll analyze that a little bit further at the end of the video. For now, let's keep going. If you've been keeping up with the series or, well, with speed reading, then you already know what Starline's been up to. Taking a first sample from Tails, creating the Tricor, analyzing the complex design of Bell's brain. All of it was leading up to the creation of the two mystery creatures that have been hiding in those green vats that we've seen before. The first of these creatures is meant to replicate Sonic, as we see a green streak make its way around an obstacle course. Nothing too dissimilar from what you'd see in a level of one of the Sonic games, even taking out Egg Ponds and that Lumberjack mini-boss from Sonic & Knuckles. This is Surge the Tenric, a vicious, violent, and volatile creature with all the speed of Sonic, all of it powered and amplified by electric abilities, and I have to wonder if this is a nod to movie Sonic. But why while she is meant to replace Sonic flat out, Starline does admit there are a lot of other flaws 
to Sonic's core design, as he sees him as some sort of a project to analyze. One of Sonic's weaknesses is the need for an analytical balance, and that comes in the form of Kitsunami, the sad submissive clone of Tails the Fox. And as you can see, he has a lot of hydro manipulation powers. So yes, obviously these two are meant to be evil versions of Sonic and Tails. And you can see some similar dynamics, but they are different enough that they are their own characters. And golly, you have to wonder if that is also a meta commentary for something else that's rather notorious when it comes to Sonic comics. Anyway, Surge completes the course, quite proud of herself, but instead of being met with praise, Starline tells her that she left Kit behind. To which she argues, it doesn't matter, she made the record. Starline waves it off, saying that she's only proven her proficiency in a controlled environment. They're not ready to get onto the main missions that Surge so desperately wants to get started. But when Starline says that they're not ready and they need to test their skills in the field in another way first, she grows impatient, grabbing him by the collar and telling him that she's real tired of him talking down to her. But Starline is quick to pull out his hypno glove and puts her to sleep, doing the same to a startled Kit. So yeah, as we've seen before, after he lost the warp topaz, Starline fit himself with a new arsenal, one of them being these hypno gloves. And while they do have their limitations, he has built Kit and Surge specifically weak to these abilities, keeping them in control whenever they get out of line. And as they wake up, he gets them back on track. And as we see in the next couple pages, they're the ones responsible for all the calamities in the mainline series, including the forest fire of the National Park and all the chaos in Central City. While all this is happening, Starline pays a visit to Tails' workshop in Emerald Town. Yes, the same one from Sonic Battle, I know guys. And I love that he takes a moment to comment on the fact that it's Tails' face, saying that Tails takes after Dr. Eggman in some surprising ways, and I guess that is true, isn't it? He's here because he believes Tails is smart enough to figure out what Starline is up to if he ever analyzes Bell. So Starline is here to basically destroy any kind of research he might have. But unfortunately, even with the Tricor, he can't make his way into the workshop as it's very well reinforced. Kit and Surge show up to his location, sending Kit straight to work on the workshop, where he too is unsuccessful. So without wasting any more time and not wanting to bring attention to themselves, they rush back to the base, where they discover that Sonic's friends have already taken care of all the commotion caused by this troublesome trio. But it wasn't their goal to actually burn down the forest or destroy Central City. Those were just field tests to see if Surge and Kit were ready to take on something bigger. For Surge, she assumes that means that they're ready for the main mission, but Starline still has one more test to do. But Surge, once again, is at her limit, declaring that she was given the power to destroy Sonic, so let her destroy Sonic. Starline replies calmly that he gave her the power to change the world, but it will only work if they follow his plan. So before they take care of Sonic, they first must remove Dr. Eggman from play, and they can only do that once they strip him of his support. But before they do any of that, they must test out a bypass algorithm that Starline has created on a remote base. The next couple pages are really only here to show off the dynamic between the three. The impatient Surge wanting to jump in head first and just get to what they were meant to do, Kit quietly recommending that they play things safe only to get yelled at, and Starline quickly pointing out how Surge's headstrong attack could go wrong in so many different kinds of ways. Surge continues to yell at Kit, who just apologizes, which just makes Surge yell at him even more, telling him to stop cringing. They won't be able to take out Sonic if he's acting like a weakling, to which Kit once again apologizes. And the poor little blue boy is just at his limit. He just breaks down crying as Surge yells at him, asking, why do you even want to help me? To which Kit responds with tears in his eyes, I don't know. And that, surprisingly, distracts the temper of Surge, as she realizes she's not sure why she wants any of this either. She's never even met Sonic, at least she doesn't think she has, and it leads the two of them to begin questioning what they're even doing. Kid asks her, do you still want to destroy him? Surge tells him, yeah, but she's not sure why. And without an answer, she turns the question back onto Kit, and he just says that he wants whatever she wants. To which Surge asks, why? And after a pause, all Kit can say is, once again, he doesn't know. At this point, Starline Board just raises up his hand and reboots, shutting them both down. As per usual, he begins to talk to himself, a little frustrated. He thought keeping things simple would make things easier, then questions if he should build up a fake backstory for them, and while he's questioning all this, Surge gets back up, wanting to know what he did to her. At this point, Starline shoves the Hypno Glove directly in her face. 
until she collapses completely, with Starline looking a bit unnerved. This might be the first hint that maybe she's becoming resistant to these powers. He then makes his thoughts internal, not risking to speak out loud once again. And he says something rather interesting here. He had used Bell's base code to write personalities for Surge and Kit, and in turn he expected some more stability and control. There's something different about Surge and Kit when compared to the likes of Bell, and obviously we can tell that simply by the fact that they are organic creatures. Whatever the case is, Starline has invested too much to start all over. He's just gonna have to be a little more careful going forward. He believes once he puts them onto their primary objectives, things should even out. So, it's time to get the ball rolling. He wakes the two of them up with some BS story about them glitching and showing them a lot more fatherly love than he ever has before. And you might also notice that Surge has been messing with her ear this entire issue as well. I wonder if that's going to come back into play. Anyway, Surge asks Confused about what is going on with this glitching, to which Starline says that yeah, we got into a heated argument which overloaded their upgrades, and basically just gaslights Surge, saying that it was her idea to do one more test. And with Starline acting apologetic, he says that he was wrong and he agrees that that they should do one more test. Surge looks confused, but says that sounds about right. And with that, this brings a close to part one. Part 2 kicks off with yet again another video diary from Dr. Starline, this time explaining why it's so important they do one final test before they lay out the mission that he has planned. The base they operate from was once Eggman's, but they only managed to get a hold of that because Starline relied on a backdoor exploit of the Eggnet. If he's ever going to truly topple Eggman, he's going to have to relinquish control of everything in Eggman's power. So before they do that, he's going to use Surgeon Kit to take over Egg Base Alpha. Outside of the base, he uses Kit's ability to control water to form a map of the base, which is really cool. I like seeing all the different ways he can manipulate water. The plan is that they're going to enter on the south end. From there, Starline himself is going to enter a control tower and upload a command program. While that is happening, Kit and Surge are going to ensure that no broadcasts are sent out to alert the Eggnet. They also take this moment to confirm that Eggman is indeed a gamer and throw in a Pingus joke, which very clever, didn't catch that my first time through. Surge begins to question the plan, but Starline reminds her that this was her idea, even though it wasn't, and they set off to work. Surge is supposed to act as an escort for Kit, but she's not happy with that whatsoever, even if she believes that this is her idea for some reason. So she completely ignores what he wants to do and begins a full-on assault on some bad nicks. Kit nervously reminds her that they're not supposed to raise any alarms, to which she counteracts by saying that they can't make any kind of an alarm if they don't exist anymore. Anymore. Kit nervously reminds her that these were Starline's orders, to which she quickly dismisses it by saying that he's not the boss of her, he's just tech support. She plans to do things her own way, and it's Kit's job to follow her. That's simple, and it's how it works. But even after all that bravado, she still plans to make her way over to the tower. Might as well do the stupid plan while they're here. Meanwhile, Starline casually strolls in, as he always does, into his planned tower, but is distracted by the egg cave, which you might recall from the second annual of IDW Sonic, and he tells himself that he's ahead of schedule so he can afford a small detour. While all that's happening, Surgeon Kit make their way over to their planned tower, but they're greeted by a giant egg mech. She tells Kit to take care of the tower while she tackles the boss. We turn our attention back over to Starline, admiring all the junk in the egg cave, including old school badniks and some of the Sonic action figures we saw in that annual. And while he reminisces of a simpler time, he turns his attention over to the mechanical Starline action figure. A little reminder of how disposable Starline was to the good doctor. And once again, we see Starline's true goal here. Yes, he does plan to supplant the doctor, but he's still desperate for his his own admiration, even though he ironically can't give it to Surge and Kit himself. The comic turns his attention back to Surge and Kit, with the little water fox believing that Surge has been crushed, which causes him to freak out and show off the full potential of his water powers. As it turns out, she is just fine, and they finally take down the big bot, but unfortunately they find themselves surrounded by a bunch of badniks. But before they start their attack, the badniks applaud them. As it turns out, Starline had succeeded, and now he has full control over the base and all of its badniks. And when they finally all meet up again, Starline finally praises the two of them for all of their great work. The override was a success, no alarms were triggered, the plan went flawlessly. It's now time to begin the master plan, after a wardrobe change, as Starline realizes that Surge is a little bit messed up. And while Kit shakily tries to explain, Surge quickly jumps in, saying that she was a little careless, and that Kit 
was a big help. So yeah, as toxic as their relationship seemed to be at the start of the story, it looks like these two are finally, truly bonding. After Starline dismisses the two, Surge takes Kit over to a room without any cameras or any mics, and the two of them should be able to detect that with their abilities. As it turns out, while Surge seems to be doing all of Starline's bidding unquestioningly, she's actually been showing a little bit of restraint. Things aren't adding up to her, and she thinks that Starline's behind all of it. And now that she knows that she can truly truly trust Kit, she is counting on him to help sort out what's actually happening. So while Starline readies his master plan, Surge and Kit concoct their own secondary one behind Starline's back. And that is where part two ends. Part 3 begins with yet another video diary with a very flustered Starline, this recording clearly taking place soon after Eggman's betrayal during the Metal Virus Saga. And we see subtle little hints of that with the lack of a tricor or warp topaz in his glove, and Starline manically screaming that he was planning to show off this revolutionary prototype. And that does kind of look like Metal Sonic Kai, at least the chest area there. Maybe it's a reference to something else, maybe it's alluding to something else brand new, I don't know, but I'm sure we're going to see something with that down the road. And the recording ends with Starline screaming into the camera that he will build something that will run rings around Metal Sonic. No sloppily constructed badniks, no over-specialized vanity projects, a versatile, robust, superior creation. From here we cut to recording a little bit further down the line, one that clearly took place during the Bad Guys arc, or maybe a little bit afterwards. As Starline explains that his time with Zavok had opened his eyes, his initial plans were very short -sighted. All the power and obedience of a machine means nothing in the chaotic and unpredictable world that he is trying to control. He needs the will and ingenuity of a living being. So yeah, again, if you go back to bad guys and remember that conversation he had with Zavok, you can understand where he found this inspiration. And this page ends in quite the twisted way, as Eggman has said he spent all his time inserting animals into robots, when the true solution was the other way around, leading to the reveal of Kit and Surge in the green goo. Vats. I think this is actually the very first time we got confirmation that those two were in those glowing tubes. I mean, we kind of figured up to this point, but yeah, obviously these two are in a lot of pain. We cut over to the present and we realize that it's actually Kit and Surge that have been watching these video files. So once again, Starline is screwing himself over by recording all of his thoughts and leaving his allies to discover it for themselves. This is literally why his plans fell apart during Bad Guys and he has not learned anything. But so far, this isn't anything really damning for Surge and Kit. They understand that they are created creatures. They keep watching video files with Starline explaining the purpose of everything he's been tracking down in the comics. So the Fur of Tails, the Coat of Bell. As it turns out, Starline didn't want to just recreate the free will that Bell has. He wanted the ability to control them without them actually realizing it. And this is where Kit and Surge realize they are susceptible to his hypnotic abilities. And this is where things get truly twisted, as the next video files show hypnotherapy sessions with Surge and Kit, implanting their simple desires of destroying Sonic, and in Kit's case, devoting himself completely to Surge. On top of all that, we see a lot of footage of the two of them failing quite a bit. I think it is kind of alluding to them maybe not potentially dying, as they explain that they are quite resilient with their upgrades, but at the very least, there's a lot of psychological trauma from all the tests he's put them through. And since he can't erase their memories completely, completely, as it would kill the point of the trials if they never actually learn and memorize anything, he instead revives them and suppresses and edits their memories. So yeah, again, this is a kid's comic. They can't flat out say that these characters are getting murdered over and over again, but it is kind of treating them like lives, you know, like he's treating them like actual video game characters, and he's just playing a game of Sonic the Hedgehog, where Sonic never actually dies, but you can still lose a life. And when you think about it in those terms, it can be quite traumatic and terrible. Man, we have a lot to take apart with these characters. This is fascinating. But here's the real kicker. Here's the actual terrifying part for Surge and Kit. She realizes that they are cyborgs. Sure, he has implanted upgrades and other things inside of them, but he didn't make them from scratch. That means that they had their own lives and personalities prior to Starline. That's the craziest part here. We weren't sure what was going on with them. We just assumed because they were in vats and stuff that they were just 
just created in a lab, but no, there's more to their story than we or even they realize. Surge is desperate for more answers about their past and tells Kit to look through the archives even further, but Kit can't find anything, which Surge finds ridiculous. There are so many video files and they are so detailed, why wouldn't there be anything about who they were? And that's because it's irrelevant, at least according to Starline, as he enters the room with a bored expression saying it's past their bedtime. As it turns out, this isn't the first time this has happened. Starline reveals that this exact scenario with all these revelations have happened before, and it always ends the same way as he raises up the hypnotic glove. But this time things turn out differently as Surge covers her eyes and sends Kit after him, who looks like a straight up demon. I love that. Starline activates his tricor and a fight breaks out and he holds up his own against the two quite impressively. But ironically, as Starline said himself in the videos, they have been learning and these two have finally learned to work together as a duo. Starline himself forgets all about Kit, who grabs a hold of him and Surge takes a hold of his hypnotic glove and uses it on the platypus, knocking him out. But the platypus incapacitated Kit asks, what now? And Surge says that they're going to burn it all down. Sonic, Eggman, every idiot that follows either of them, no more heroes, no more villains, nothing. If they don't get a past, then nobody gets a future. But she's not quite sure how to make that happen. But the quiet kid might have an idea or two, and surprisingly, Surge doesn't scream at him, and instead opens the floor to the little fox. And he suggests Starline already has a plan in motion, one that will bring everybody together. They could keep following the plan he has set in motion, but add up particular point, take it in their own direction. One that does destroy Sonic and Eggman, but also Starline as well. Of course, if that's okay with Surge. And she absolutely loves the idea of taking Starline's own plan and using it as his downfall. So with a plan in mind, Starline wakes up in his chair, confused as to what's going on. Surge tells him that he had put himself to sleep during his own monologue, <laughs> saying that Starline had been filling them in on the details. Pre-mission prepper some other such nonsense. Starline's a little confused. He's not sure why Surge is fine with everything going on here. To which she says, well, if I wasn't before, I'm pretty sure you wiped that out of my brain. Convincing Starline that his hypnotic abilities had properly worked on them and they're fully compliant with whatever he's got planned. And he falls for it completely. So with all of that settled, it's time for the next plan of action. As the restoration is focused on rebuilding from all the antics they've been up to, now is the prime time to attack Eggman's new capital city where Starline will upload his override program. Surge agrees that it'd be great to scramble Eggman with his own bots, but Starline is quick to interject, saying that they only plan to pacify Eggman. Sonic and Tails are their only terminal targets, to which she casually agrees and apologizes. And that is where part three ends. Part 4 actually starts off in a flashback, showing us the early days of the metal virus, with Starline still at Eggman's side. And I guess we'll see how important this scene is for the overall story, but I love what it brings to Sonic lore, where Starline just asks, what's the point of all the theme parks? And Eggman just says, I like theme parks. But Starline pushes forward, still confused as they're not remotely practical. They could be using those resources for something else. And Eggman says, I don't settle for the world as it is. He's going to make it what he wants it to be. And if he wants his enemy's last moments to be carousel music and the smell of petroleum-based cotton candy, well, he's gonna make it happen. This is still early on before Starline found everything Eggman did impractical, so he's just gobbling all this stuff up. And we cut to the present. While Starline isn't the type to build theme parks, the overall message is still important to him. He plans to make the world in his own image. It is finally time for Starline to set his master plan into action. The beginning of a new era where he controls the narrative. He will guide the world and its people out of their complacency. And with that, they launch their attack on Eggman's capital city, smashing through a bunch of classic badniks, making short work of some larger mechs, and just, yeah, a lot of lovely callbacks to Sonic Heroes and other games of the past here. The plan isn't stealth, at least not for Kit and Surge. They need to draw all the attention to the two of them while Starline goes and uploads his override algorithm. And they do just that as we cut over to Eggman, as 
well as Orbot and Cubot, and they quickly address that, yeah, they have spent quite a long time away from them, if you recall back from issue 40. Not super important, just I like that they're keeping the canon in check here. Anyway, yeah, they quickly get reports from the city that Surge and Kit are attacking. This leaves Eggman utterly confused, as the reports sounded like Sonic and Tails were causing a mess. He has no idea who these two are. Doesn't really matter either way to Eggman. Point is, they're wrecking his stuff. So he sends Metal Sonic out to take care of them. And here we have a fun fight between Surge and Metal. And as powerful as Surge has proven herself so far in this narrative, it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that she can't take Metal as he dodges every one of her attacks and dishes out some pretty serious damage. But with a newfound teamwork between these two, Kit manages to trap the infamous robot in a sphere of water while Surge overloads him with electricity, bringing the fight to an end. With Metal out of the picture, Starline makes his move and finally reveals himself to Eggman, and at the same time sending out his command override to every single one of his badniks, as we see them respond to the signals from all around the world, including the little motobug which we did see happen in issue 49, as well as Orbot and Cubot, who are quickly overpowered by Eggman. But Eggman doesn't look impressed and opens an escape chute, while Starline makes his way over to Eggman's command chamber, taking his seat at the overthrown top of the Eggman Empire. Everything is now in place for Starline to take over the world. That is until he finds out that Eggman had somehow managed to escape into his memorial garage. But Starline's not worried about it. Even if he is in a garage full of outdated mechs, he'll take command of them whenever Eggman brings them online. But Eggman is no idiot, as he hops into a mech with an offline boot up, meaning he has full manual control of his robot, so it's gonna be fun to see how he responds to Starline. Starline's assault. And while Starline sends the badniks out into the world, Kit and Surge just wait for Sonic and Tails. And once they're taken care of, they will turn their attention over to Dr. Starline. And that is where the story ends. So there you go, guys. That is the Imposter Syndrome mini-series. And I'm going to get some of my negatives out of the way before I break down what I liked because I ended up liking quite a bit more than I expected here. One of my biggest issues would have to be that this is required reading for issue 50 coming up here, arguably even more so than the main series from what we've been reading from these last couple months. So it builds up to a conclusion that it never gets to, which is all well and fine. But considering that a lot of these books nowadays are built with trade paperback in mind, as in they're better read when it's all put together, I can imagine this can leave something of an unsatisfying taste in a reader's mouth if their first experience with the story is in the collected volume. But honestly, that's not a huge gripe, just a potential problem for a new reader, but I ain't a new reader, so I'm not going to pretend that's going to be much of a problem for me. The bigger issue for me, and this has been a problem every time this artist is on board, is the art itself. Not saying there isn't talent on display here, obviously there is, but I do draw, and and I know quick lines when I see them, and this art just feels a little too fast for me, if that makes any kind of sense. There's just not enough time dedicated to adding some detail where it could otherwise be used. The characters are very expressive, and the action is kinetic, which is always welcome, considering they only have static drawings to work with to display this stuff. But a lot of the time, when it comes to the backgrounds or anything else related to that, it just looks like scribbles. I mean, look at the entrance of the egg cave here. Like, just no effort in that sign whatsoever. Granted, this is still a a massive step up from the worst of the worst of the Archie books, but all the same, I do expect a little bit better when it comes to IDW Sonic. I suppose that is a good problem to have, but it's just something that did distract me. All that said though, once again, I am very impressed with the unique characters brought in from this particular series, because yet again, this is where you can get really complicated and interesting personalities, where you otherwise can't find in the more static game characters. And I have to admit, I ended up liking Surge and Kit far more than I expected. Part of me felt like Surge was just a big F you to Ken Penders because he spends all of his time on Twitter just talking about the Lara Sue Chronicles or how he owns Surge or any of these other Archie characters, which I guess is in contention now. We'll do more research on that. And if you're not aware of that, Scourge is a green anti-Sonic from the Archie series.
series. And the only reason that Ken would have any ownership over that is because he first penned the storyline of evil Sonic way back in the day. That was all there really was to the character, just an evil version of the hero, which is nothing new in fiction, but Ken was the first to craft that story and build up that background for said character, and in turn, could make the argument that evil Sonic was his own separate character from Sonic. But yeah, Ken left the book after like a 15 year run and Evil Sonic was still part of that canon. Of course, there wasn't a great need for him when we already had Metal Sonic and at that point, Shadow. So when Ian Flynn took over the book, one of the first things he did was do something unique with Evil Sonic. Powered him up with Master Emerald Energy, turning his fur green, tearing up that leather jacket a little bit and adding some <laughs> obnoxious flame decal on it as well. Putting a scar on his chest and evolving him to the character Scourge. And bluntly, that's where most of the intrigue of the character actually begins, at least in the fandom. While there are plenty of Sonic clones out there in all kinds of Sonic canons, Scourge was used to show what Sonic could be if he ever did turn evil, directly challenging Sonic's morality on more than a couple of occasions. And from there, he went and got his own storylines and he became interesting in his own right, and as such became a fan favorite in ways he never was when he was just plain old evil Sonic. But after that lawsuit situation with Ken Penders, he was dropped from the Archie canon, as well as a lot of other creations from Ken. Seemingly never to be heard from ever again. Well, an attempt was made, but the great big stinky argument surrounding Scourge is who has true ownership of the character. It is based off of Sonic, who is Sega's IP. Evil Sonic, while not an entirely creative offshoot of Sonic, still was seen as his own unique character, but didn't truly become interesting until Flynn took that idea and added some new elements to make him stand out from any other Sonic villain or clone out there. But according to Ken, since he was the first one to create Evil Sonic and work with that specific character in stories during his tenure, he owns that character regardless of what he evolved into. But since he doesn't own the IP of Sonic the Hedgehog, he can't actually do anything with Evil Sonic. So he's just kind of caught in a limbo. Fast forward to more modern days and the announcement of Surge the Tenric. There are some very obvious parallels between Scourge and Surge, but Flynn and the rest of the creative team can't flat out say that this is based off of Scourge as it might open them up to some legal ramifications, but at the same time, they are skirting the line as best they can and basically put up a giant middle finger to Ken Penders. What they've essentially done here is take all the unique elements that they brought onto Evil Sonic, removed it from that character, and created something brand new. So instead of whining about it for years on end on Twitter, Flynn took those ideas and with these new restrictions in mind, managed to creatively get out of that situation and give us something similar to what came before but also something brand new. This is not the first time he's done this, and quite frankly, I am incredibly impressed. Because not only do we see a lot of Scourge in Surge's design, but the overall narrative on display here, in this story anyway, has a lot to do with being a clone, being a copy. And we're exploring this idea in a very different way from anything we've seen with Scourge, and ironically, something we could potentially see with Metal Sonic that we probably can't because he needs to be the one static thing, or, you know, he doesn't have a mouth. Like I keep saying, there are plenty of Sonic clones and Dark Mirror copy characters to the point that it does get kind of redundant, so you have to have a unique spin every single time you pull off something like this, and they managed to do that yet again. They talk about Sonic a whole lot in this story, and yeah, Surge's initial central drive is to destroy Sonic, but interestingly enough, she has not yet met Sonic. We got four issues dedicated to her and Kit, and not once did they need Sonic to play off of. She starts off as a copy, but by the end of issue four, that's not the most interesting thing about her. What's interesting about her and Kit is all the mystery surrounding their origins. Who were they before Starline? And why did Starline specifically choose them? And speaking of Starline specifically, I love how they built up his character through this entire series. You could argue that he is the true antagonist of all of IDW Sonic. His entire drive now is this meta-narrative about the quite-on-the-nose named Sonic Cycle, something I and others have complained about, which is, well, Sonic is in this kind of static place and he's not really allowed to evolve in any kind of way. They went and turned that into an engaging narrative in the story, going so far as to display Surge and Kit as video game characters who go through obstacle courses and die in all these horrific ways that are actually fairly normal in the video games, falling down pits or getting hit by bats or getting stabbed with spikes, 
all while being constantly revived as if they had a bunch of extra lives. Flynn has always done a great job of integrating more game-like mechanics into a narrative, which I've always appreciated because Sonic is a video game character, and I love seeing that care brought into the actual storytelling, as opposed to being flat-out ignored, which a lot of other Sonic media has done. It's not always necessary, and in some cases it should probably be left separate, but we've had 30 years to brew over a lot of these ideas, and again, we have some creative ways to implement them into stories. And quite frankly, taking these classic mechanics and then reinterpreting them into this dark, twisted way is really genius. And again, I wonder if there is an extra commentary layer on top of that about fans dictating what Sonic should be without ever really taking care of the actual character. There's just a lot at play here, more than I really expected, and I probably should have known better at this point reading as much as I have of IDW, but I'm always impressed with how smart a lot of the stuff is. Yes, some of the Crush 40 lines get a little too on the nose for my liking. I did see people complain about that on Twitter, and I do kind of agree, but not to the point where it actively bothered me. I did also see a lot of people complaining about Metal Sonic losing the Surge and Kit on Twitter as well, and I thought this was fine. The entire point of them is to be a superior copy to Sonic, to the point where they're supposed to flat out replace Sonic. Starline sees Metal Sonic as a vanity project, and his purpose was to outclass not only Sonic, but Metal Sonic as well. So it only made sense to me to have Surge and Kit go up against the robotic copy of Sonic before they go over Sonic himself, showing just how much of a threat they can B. He did put up a very good fight. The only reason he lost is because he just didn't pay enough attention to Kit. This was a nice evolution through this story showing how they became a better duo, and they are far more dangerous together than they are apart. Neither of them could have soloed Metal Sonic. It was only until they combined their abilities did they have a chance of winning, and even still, it's not like Metal Sonic is down for the count forever. He just short-circuited. I could see him winning a fight. It's just a case of a coin flip. They were that close in abilities. And all that said, we do need to have some new challenges brought into play here. Otherwise, the stories get boring very quickly. I need a new threat to go up against Sonic. And yeah, even Metal Sonic on occasion. He shouldn't be the be-all, end-all of Sonic villains. And before I forget about it, ironically enough, is Kitsunami, whose very purpose is to be kind of overlooked. Very soft-spoken, very submissive. Not a lot of attention is given to Kit, and I think that is intentional. Surge is loud, she's out there, she is the center of attention. Kit is made to be her backup, and they only only won their two fights against Starline and Metal Sonic when their enemies disregarded the little blue fox. Hell, even that giant badnik, I completely forgot about that too. Every single one of those scenarios, Surge was on the ropes until Kit jumped in, showing off that he has a lot more power than he initially lets on, hinting at some truly terrifying abilities. I do think he's an interesting counterpoint to Tails. If you compare him to early Fleetweight Tails or some of the other extra media, he's just this dumb kid that gets in Sonic's way, and in turn, Sonic tends to treat him like crap. We see that idea in Kit and Surge and then elevated to the most unhealthy extreme. But even that evolves through this story. And yeah, we see their true potential when they work together, which was Starline's intent. And ironically, it's because they're reaching their full potential that will likely lead to his own downfall. And another little thing I just thought about too. I was kind of rolling my eyes for a little bit here because they were repeating a lot of the same story beats from bad guys. Basically, they go and invade a base, but it's not the actual base they care about. So they're going to go and invade a secondary base, but before that happens, Starline's allies discover his video diaries, therefore ruining the plan. But I love that they subverted that by showing that Starline has been through this particular process with the two of them before and is just kind of bored of it at this point. I do think it's a little bit silly that he has not upped his security measures or just flat out deleted the video files, but it could be argued that is Starline's arrogance once again on display. He just thinks so little of his creations that he doesn't really care if they discover what they're about because he's just going to reboot them anyway, and honestly, this twisted platypus probably enjoys watching this all play out and asserting his control over them. Like, he is a genuinely evil character, and he is so fascinating. I love the crap out of him. But yeah, that's enough rambling for now. It was nice to see Flynn's three glitch characters finally come into reality in some form or fashion, and I really liked how they all played off each other. It's a shame that that had to wrap up so early. Maybe they will become a proper trio in the future, or maybe not. Every time it seems like Starline is about to build a proper relationship that is fun to read through. He does something to screw it up. All the same, it did the trick. I'm properly excited for issue 50, and I can't wait to look into that. And of course, we're going to have to look at Scourge a little bit more thoroughly and Surge and Kit when we have a little bit more of their backstory in hand. But as drawn out as it could have been between the months here, this is a very solid start for these two characters, and I'm looking forward to see what's next. <laughs>
Welcome back to Sonic Speed Reading, and we have finally hit issue 50 of the IDW series. As you might recall, Sonic, Tails, and Bill have been following a bunch of badniks who have been converging on Eggman's new city. And while Eggman trying something big and crazy is nothing new, Tails points out that it is a little weird that there's no declaration. He's usually not so cloak and dagger with whatever he's up to. But as we already know, if you've been following along with the Imposter Syndrome miniseries, it was actually Dr. Starline who took over this new city leaving Eggman to escape. Orbot informs Starline that Surveillance has identified our heroes on the approach, and Starline with a smirk tells him to send out Surge and Kit. And then he gets on to monologuing to himself. All of his plotting and planning has finally come into fruition, but he's interrupted by Dr. Eggman in his Egg Emperor mech from Sonic Heroes, saying, excuse me, doctor, you're in my seat. And then he, oh, oh my, Emperor's really packing, isn't he? Yeah, Eggman begins to wreck his own throne room, but Starline doesn't miss a beat, activating his Tri-Core, jumping onto the Emperor and smashing into it with his Strength Core, all while giving backhanded compliments to the Doctor. From a distance, we see Sonic, Tails, and Bell have arrived in the city, looking on two explosions in the distance, not quite sure what the heck is happening here. From Sonic's perspective, it looks like Eggman is attacking his own city, but Tails corrects him, saying that it looks like he's actually fighting somebody, and Bell, looking downward, has taken notice to the felled Metal Sonic. She takes pity on him, and Sonic just looks on confused. What the heck is going on here? But Belle hops on down to fix him, feeling guilt for not saving her moto bud. She knows she can't save every badnik, but she can't abandon a robot in need. Sonic says he understands, but be careful. He's dangerous. And Tails is quick to remind him that Sonic had Tails repair the robot after that whole Neo Metal takeover thing. And Sonic argues that was back when they thought Eggman was done and they didn't know about Starline, plus they de-weaponized him, which Tails refutes while he still had metal claws and a turbine torso, but before they can continue their debate, they're interrupted by a crack of lightning, and Sonic has disappeared. And shortly thereafter, Tails is whisked away by water whips, leaving Bell and the busted metal Sonic alone with the overridden badniks. From here, the story is going to shift perspectives between four different sets of characters, starting first with Tails and Kitsunami, who politely introduces himself to the two-tailed fox, who in turn quickly is escapes his grasp with a whip of his tails. Tails, unsure of who this guy is, tries to reason with him, saying that there must be some kind of misunderstanding. But Kit is quick to say that there's no misunderstanding. This is all by design, and says that it takes approximately 118 milliliters of liquid and 40 seconds to drown. This shouldn't take long. And <laughs> this arc goes much harder than it needs to. Oh my god. And while their fight is about to begin, Surge, who has snatched up Sonic, runs them into a building with a large dome ceiling and wreckage all over the floor. And as she comes to a halt, she slams Sonic into the guardrails. And despite all of her aggressive gloating that we've seen in the Imposter Syndrome miniseries, when she finally confronts Sonic for the first time, instead of snarking and smirking or challenging him to a fight, she instead blames him for everything that's happened to her. Starline and Eggman, yeah, they're a part of everything that happened, but when it boils down to it, it's because of Sonic's inaction that everything is the way it is. If Sonic had just taken them out, she would never have been made. And if that had just gone against his precious moral code, he could have just stood out of the way and quit. But instead, he keeps on fighting and continues to let those idiots keep making the same mistakes over and over again. And the world loves him for it. And she's decided she's ending all of it. Sonic, getting up, says, sorry, maybe I spoke too fast. Let's try again. Hi, I'm Sonic, and you are? The powered up and furious Surge is momentarily taken off guard there. There. But with a chuckle, she says, yeah, I'm Surge the Tenric. And with that, she makes her opening attack against the Hedgehog, saying his speed of sound is no match for her speed of light. And I do love that they're using lightning to show off her speed as opposed to Sonic's wind. It's kind of like he's fighting the movie version of himself. That's just a nice little touch. And Sonic, with a smirk, fights back, with the two of them darting around the dome. We finally return our attention to Eggman and Starline. Eggie's not quite sure where the platypus ran off to, so he begins to yell at 
at him through the loudspeakers of his mech. They're recapping everything that's led up to this point, just in terms of what Starline has been up to in the past few miniseries. And it's Eggman finally piecing together that all the strange raids and everything happening with Zavok in prison, that was all Starline's doing. Meanwhile, Starline tries to figure out a way to counteract the Doctor's Egg Emperor. And he assumes that if Eggman was able to escape into a bunker to retrieve this mech, then that means that bunker must be nearby, and in turn, more mechs must be at the ready. And sure enough, there is indeed one. Starline goes on the attack with the Egg Robo from Sonic Lost World. I just want to give a quick shout out to my patrons who pointed out that's where this mech is from because it's been so long since I played that game, I literally forgot that's where it came from. We now have an Egg Mech versus Egg Mech battle, and it's awesome. And as the two grapple, Starline pleads with Eggman, saying that his plan will work, and when it does, the world will belong to the both of them. But Eggie responds saying that he does not share, and if Starline really understood him, he would know that Eggman settles for nothing less. The comic then again shifts its focus back to Belle and Metal Sonic. She's still trying to figure out how to bring him back online while avoiding Starline's signal, and she manages to do it by acting as a router and using Tail Zeddy Zapper to block the control signal. And that seems to do the trick, but Metal wakes up as the same deadly robot he's always been known for. But instead of attacking Bell, he instead attacks a motobug coming up from behind. Since the two robots are connected to the egg neck, she can access his files and sees that Metal Sonic perceives her as egg tech. She wants to know where Eggman is, and since she can't let Metal Sonic out of her router's range, she joins the killer robot on his return trek to Eggman. Shifting focus yet again, we go back to Tails and Kitsunami. And as you can see, they're not actually fighting. Tails is just flying away, dodging the attacks. But while he does, he compliments the control Kit has over his weaponry. And even while sneering, Kit responds well to the compliment, and Tails takes notice. So he doubles down, saying how cool his gear is. But Kit responds that it's not his. And Tails responds, well, even if he didn't make it, it's still impressive that he's operating it at all. It does take a lot of skill and finesse. And all this is just catching Kit off guard. He was not expecting Tails to be this kind to him. Tails continues to lead the conversation, asking if they could calm down and just talk things out. The kindness further confuses Kit, but he does eventually agree to have Tails sit next to him to at least talk for a bit. When Tails approaches the confused blue fox, he begins to ask a few questions and quickly learns about Starline and what's going on in the city, having to be very careful with the way he asks questions, as Kit is emotionally unstable and quick to flip a trigger, as we can see as he talks a little bit too much about Starline. But Tails continues to keep his cool, saying that he wants to help Kit stop Starline. And Kit seems to respond pretty well to this. That is right up until Tails says that they need to go find Sonic. This completely sets off Kit as it's his sole duty to back up Surge, and Surge has to destroy Sonic. And speaking of those two, they continue their battle in the rubble, and it looks like they're giving each other quite the workout. And Sonic says it's been a while since he tussled like this, and he hopes that she's having as much fun as he is. And this just pisses off Surge. She's not here to have fun. This is a duel to the death. But Sonic just waves it off. It's like, yeah, no, I've uh, heard all that before. He's used to this shtick. This just makes Surge all the more angry, saying that this is not a shtick. This is who she is. Certainly haven't heard anything like that before. And Sonic calmly responds that he appreciates that. He really does. And then stops her dead in her tracks in the middle of her attack. And then hopping up to a high piece of rubble. And here he says that he doesn't know her full story, so he can't judge, but he's not going to let her hurt anybody. And when Surge tells him to end it, he says no, he'd rather give her a chance to rebound. Surge then calls him naive, and Sonic says that he likes to keep it simple. And this is where he basically lays out his philosophy to Surge and in turn the audience. And we're going to just read it out verbatim because we're going to have to talk about this a little bit later. He says, I live for the moment. I want to see the world, find all its thrills and adventures and enjoy them. I want everyone to have that freedom too. And you wouldn't get that opportunity if I took that chance away from you. I've made peace with enough enemies to know that there's a better way. So I'm willing to chalk this up as a rocky start and let us have a do-over, if you will. Surge asks, just like that? Sonic says, yeah, just like that. The doctors too? Yeah, even them. She repeats little bits and pieces of what was just said to her. To reinvent herself, see the world, the same one that rejected her. See, if she had volunteered to work for Starline, obviously she didn't have anything good going on in her life previous to this. And if she had been kidnapped, well, nobody's been looking for her. She heard what Sonic's about, and she's not about it herself. And Sonic, with an exact 
exasperated Sai says, fine, we'll do it your way. The two continue to debate as they fight. If Sonic's allowing her to have her freedom, then she should have the freedom to do as she pleases. Sonic once again avoids her attack and knocks her on her ass. While he believes in freedom for everybody, he is not going to allow her to take away anybody else's freedom. If she decides to be a problem, then she decides to get her ass kicked by him. And the sad, angry Surge retaliates yet again, saying that she was built to end him. And his morals, his friends, his world. She's going to burn it all down. But before we see how that concludes, we turn our attention back to the two Egg Mechs, with Starline screaming that he is doing all of this for Eggman. But Eggman dismisses all of it, saying that all Starline is managing to do is waste his time, wreck his stuff, and piss him off. And with that, the Emperor strikes the killing blow on Starline's mech, who responds with another compliment, saying that he is thrilled to see that Eggman is the superior mecha pilot, but he had chosen the wrong machine to face Starline. See, this is a lovely reference to Sonic Heroes. This was one of the bosses from that game, and in turn, the very model that was defeated by the power cores. And now having been somewhat weakened in their mech battle, Starline lets loose the Tricore Blast, destroying the Egg Emperor in one fell swoop. Starline lands with his Tricore depleted, exhausted, but seemingly having won the battle, saying that this is what happens when you don't plan for contingencies. But out of the rubble comes that creepy, iconic smile, with Eggman saying, No, Doctor, you played yourself. As it turns out, Eggman specifically chose the Egg Emperor once he realized it was Starline invading his city, because he knew it was Starline who invaded his power core facility. And he knew that Starline's obsessions with Eggman's past exploits would give him logical tunnel vision. Basically, he knew exactly how Starline was going to attack him and use the exact exact tools that would require him to drain all of his energy. But Starline is not out of gimmicks, as he then turns the Hypno Glove on Eggman. But Eggy was prepared for that too. With his goggles over his face, they have no effect over him. Ironically enough, it turns out that Eggman had indeed been paying attention to everything Starline had been saying during their time together. Even if Eggy never acknowledged it, like I've told you in the past, he's a very smart man. And as silly as he might be, he takes everything into account, and Starline is now completely losing his cool. He was not prepared for any of this. He has never seen Eggman show this much foresight, and Eggman admits that he's made his mistakes, and one of them was tolerating Starline for as long as he did. But in one last desperate attempt to win, Starline kicks up one of his spurs towards Eggman, who dodges it, snatches his leg, and slams him into the ground! Oh man, that was a satisfying moment. Holy cow. Yeah, in one fell swoop, Starline is just taken out. But as their fight concludes, Eggy is greeted by Metal Sonic and Bell. As it turns out, Bell just came to say goodbye to whatever was left of Mr. Tinker. Basically, this is her way of gaining closure. Eggy just waves it off, not sure why everybody is so clingy, and says, well, if you're not with me, then you're against me, and asks if she wants to duel Metal Sonic. <laughs> and Bell politely says, no, sir, I just just fixed him, and declares that she's going to do that to all the robots that he has abandoned. And Eggman is actually pretty impressed with how she managed to bypass Starline's control signal, and offers her to stay on as his mechanic. But if she wants, she can take her leave and rejoin Sonic, as she did go to the trouble of repairing Metal Sonic. Bell crosses her arms and says, this is goodbye. She's going back to her friends. And Eggy, with his back turn, laughs and says, very well, be seeing you. And he, with Metal Sonic and Toe take their leave, as the structure around them is beginning to crumble and fall apart. Bell then calls out to the beaten Starline, saying that he needs to move as the street is caving in, but Starline is too swept up in his own defeat, mumbling to himself that he had planned out everything to the smallest detail, accounted for every contingency, and even then, Eggman, his hero, destroyed everything he built up in minutes. Starline sees himself as a complete 
and total failure. And as he's throwing his pity party, the wreckage comes crashing down on him, with Belle witnessing the end of Dr. Starline. And as she makes her escape, we turn our attention back to Kit and Tails. Kit sneers, saying that Tails can't evade forever. And Tails responds with his own smirk, maybe, but Kit is going to run out of water eventually. And according to Tails' calculations, that should be right about now. And sure enough, Kit is out of ammo, leaving him completely defenseless. Tails flies up to him to turn off his pack before he has a chance to refill it. And the once deadly Kitsunami can do nothing but beg for help from Sir. And as Tails turns off the pack, he seems to shut down Kit, which he wasn't expecting. Whatever the case may be, this fight too has now concluded, leaving only Sonic and Surge to wrap up their battle. And they match each other blow for blow, Surge getting ever the more frustrated as Sonic continues to smirk. But as they spin attack into one another, Surge gets launched off into a pit, grabbing hold to a bit of rebar before she falls into the darkness below. Sonic catches up to her apologizing, saying, hey, 10 second truce, and reaches out his hand to lift her out of the pit. Surge responds by lifting her finger and giving him one last jolt of electricity, chuckling to herself that she got the last hit. And before Sonic can do anything else, more wreckage comes falling from the ceiling above. And as he jumps out of the way, he sees that Surge is no longer there, having fallen into the pit below. And as he looks on, he says that that's the real problem with giving people a choice. You can't stop them from making making the wrong ones. And with that, he turns to go find Tails and Belle. But thankfully, it doesn't take long for our heroes to reconvene on each other. Tails with the unconscious Kit in tow, and Belle on top of a tamed Badnik. And they all quickly catch each other up on their random misadventures, putting the remaining pieces of this puzzle together. But as the story ends, we have Eggman over his loudspeaker, apologizing for the state they have found him in. But all the same, being a gracious host, now that he has his city back under his control, he now sends the gathered badniks after Sonic, Tails, and Bell. And that, my friends, is where issue 50 ends. It looks like we still have one more story to wrap all this up before Ian hands the reins back over to Evan. So I imagine we're gonna have a little bit more closure. So I would like to wait until then before we analyze the past set of stories on a deeper level, just in case there's anything else that needs to be touched upon in 51. But all the same, there has been a lot of discussion just around this one issue, and they do manage to wrap up a lot here. And I do think we need to talk about a great deal of it. So before we get into the big spiky blue elephant in the room, I do want to discuss some of the other pairings that we had in this story. First off, Kitsunami and Tails. And Ian, you hate Hydro City as a word, but you're fine with Kitsunami? I see how it is. Bring back Horse Guy! No, nah, but for real, I do love seeing the contrast between the character pairings throughout this entire issue. They were building all of this up to be this big drag out showdown for all of the characters on display play here. And in some cases, we did get that, but not quite in the way that I feel a lot of people were expecting. And I honestly think it works. Tails is a reliable fighter, but his greatest weapon has always been his brain. He has spent the entire confrontation with Kitsunami just trying to talk the kid down. And even when that failed, he didn't launch a single spin attack at the guy. He just waited for the blue fox to run out of water. And once that happened, Kit was completely defenseless. It became very very apparent very quickly for Tails that this was a very troubled little fox, one that didn't seem to want to be in the position he was in. And while talking is its own tactical maneuver and Tails is mostly playing a negotiator, he is still as compassionate as he is smart. And I thought this was a fantastic way to show that in this battle. And while it didn't get as much play as everybody else, I did love seeing Metal Sonic and Bell together, showing both the greatest creations of Dr. Eggman and Mr. Tinker side by side. Bell still is technically the enemy of Eggman, but I did love seeing how she interacted both with Metal and with Eggy himself once they finally were in the same room together, and I think this was the very first time these two have interacted outside of a screen. I thought this was a lovely bit of closure on this part of her character so she can move on to whatever comes next for her. Not in some big, horrible clash with Metal Sonic, but by helping out robots and just staunchly telling Eggman that she is going to carry on with her life. And Eggman, 
while he doesn't flat out say it, I do still think he respects at least the build of Bell. While he has no intention of ever returning to the Mr. Tinker persona, I still think a very little part of him reflects on that part of his life warmly, and I think that's represented in Bell's existence. But speaking of Eggman, man was it satisfying watching him and Starline duke it out through this entire issue. For me, this was the standout fight. The two egg mechs duking it out was a lot of fun, and man, it was really, really satisfying to see Starline finally stand up to Eggman and have him duke it out both verbally and physically. The fight was inventive, and it was a lot of fun, and the ending was so unbelievably satisfying. I've said it in previous videos, but yeah, it was very apparent that Eggman has always been paying attention to Starline, but it was never for Starline's benefit. It was always as a contingency in case Starline ever turned on him. And in brutal irony, it turns out that Eggman is every much the person that Starline idolized him being, but it turns out that only became apparent when Starline challenged him. And in a matter of minutes, he dismantled all of the plans that Starline has been cooking up. Everything that we've been seeing in the Bad Guys miniseries or the Imposter Syndrome miniseries, it all fell apart in this one battle. And as it turns out, even that fight had been planned down to the very last blow. And even when you strip away all the gadgets and robots and mechs, even in a physical one-on-one -on -one battle, Eggman takes Starline out in one fell swoop. We have seen in previous incarnations of these characters, I'm thinking of Archie specifically, of some of these brand new comic characters existing merely to show up these established iconic characters. But here, no matter how well established Starline has become in the series, it shows us why Eggman is top dog in terms of Sonic villains. And while I can kind of feel for the sad, disgruntled Starline in his defeat, he also kind of had it coming. When you look back at everything that's happened in the IDW series, and all because of Starline, yeah, there really was no other way to wrap up this story. And while down the road they could say that he managed to escape the rubble, or maybe he injected himself with the same modified metal virus cells that he gave to Kit and Surge, I think for now, and for a good long while, this is the last we will see of Dr. Starline. And I kind of figured that was going to be the case going into issue 50, but that does not make this any less satisfying. And, uh... <sighs> All right, for our last pairing, there's been a lot of discussion going around in the Sonic community about issue 50, and it's mostly been focused not even on Sonic and Surge, but mostly the characterization of Sonic himself. The major point of contention is this moment on top of the rubble pile, with Sonic monologuing his philosophy to Surge. When I first read it, I didn't really have any issue, but that's mostly because I've already expressed my problems and critiques with this particular characterization of Sonic much earlier on in this series. I've since then come to terms with not only how Sonic is written, but the overall themes on display here. And I'd also be lying if I said that the Bumblecast wasn't also helpful and better understanding on what Ian was attempting with this version of the character. But I've also spoken with friends and acquaintances who both thoroughly loved this issue and others who hated it. And honestly, I thought everybody had an interesting thing to say about it. But obviously, with so many contradicting opinions, I'm not going to be agreeing with everybody. And while perspective and insight certainly helps with my own conclusions, I don't expect everybody to agree with my opinions or interpretations. I shouldn't have to spend so much time explaining that opinions shouldn't lead to tantrums, but you know, it's the Sonic community, here we are. Alright, so if I'm to understand the critique correctly, it's largely around how lenient Sonic is, and I've said it before, I think Sonic nowadays is Gary Stewed pretty thoroughly, but frankly, I feel like Sega's had him this way for a very long time. A lot of his edge found in the 90s has slowly been whittled down over the years, leaving us with a very agreeable, very reasonable hero that everybody turns to. He makes all the plans, solves all the problems, and is always the voice of reason. And that's why I miss the Freedom Fighters, or the Fleetway cast, and yes, even the roles once played by a lot of the main game cast. Having these other characters allows Sonic to be a little more unique in his interpretation, and quite frankly, I like my Sonic a little impatient, a little sassy. And I know this Sonic has said he hates bullies, but the Sonic I grew up with was famous for 
bullying the likes of Antoine. Not a full on jerk, but still kind of a jerk. And while I feel a lot of fans like him being a bit more friendly, I do feel a lot of other people feel that we're dealing with a localized Goku situation. And if you're not sure what that means, basically they're turning Sonic into a superhero, trading out the sass for a Sonic says, but like all the time. More of a role model than an actual character in his own right. One that the world relies far too much on. But the thing is, I don't actually blame the comic for this interpretation. I think this is just how the games have portrayed him for a long time. Yeah, you get cool moments here and there in some cutscenes, but by and large, this is a much friendlier, safer character than he has ever been in the past. And I've seen examples from both sides thrown back and forth just to find this or that about his personality, but this character has had many different interpretations. And as far as I'm concerned, IDW Sonic is yet another one. And even if this version kind of leaks into Frontiers or future games if Ian continues to work on the character in mainline games, I'm kind of okay with it. Because frankly, Sonic is going to be around and he's going to be reinterpreted again and again and again because, well, I've lived through being a fan of this franchise and that's just how it goes with any long running series. And while he might be a little inconsistent with your favorite version of Sonic, he has been consistent in this story. And yes, that is largely in part thanks to Ian having the reins on a lot of the writing of IDW Sonic. But even that aside, I kind of see where he's going with this character and I don't mind it. See, even though we consider Sonic a teenager, he has been through a lot, not just in IDW, but the entire game series. And while IDW might be considered its own canon, it still takes the game history into consideration. This comic takes place after the events of Sonic Forces, meaning that this Sonic is technically the oldest and most experienced he's ever been. And while he's fluctuated through the years in terms of personality, I feel like this Sonic justifies all of those changes. He has experience under his belt and has shown him time and again that compassion and empathy wins more often than it doesn't. Maybe he has taken now a big bad here or there, but the ones he has spared have gone on to become allies. And Surge is far from the first Sonic clone he has come across. And honestly, I feel like their fight, their confrontation, it justifies his speech. Surge clearly has a lot more going on than just wanting to burn down the world. She wears her emotions on her sleeve, or a tattered shirt at any rate. When she was first announced, I was expecting her to be more of a Scourge clone, but through her miniseries, it was clear that she was her own person, and her first interaction with Sonic just cements that notion. Scourge represented what Sonic could be if he ever went bad. He enjoyed being a nasty dude. Surge, on the other hand, challenges Sonic's morality in an entirely different fashion, and she's trying to justify her very existence, dealing with a lot of troubles and throwing them all onto Sonic. And honestly, she's not entirely wrong. I don't think she's just here to be a straw man for all the critique thrown this book's way. I do think the overall point is that being a hero is complicated and things aren't always black and white. And if Sonic's going to be treated like a superhero like Sega wants him to be, then I appreciate them tackling these hard questions. Because if you read any other comic, you know that this moral quandary has been tackled and explored and every time it's never an easy answer. The fights in issue 50 do have some real cool moments, but I feel like they aren't meant to be pure fun spectacles. You see the futility of all three of the comic created characters as they go up against the seasoned pros that are Sonic, Tails, and Eggman. Starline, Kit, and Surge. All of these fights just feel gross. They're kind of sad. Surge finally gets her chance to confront Sonic, this person who her entire life has been built around, and he never once takes her seriously. For a little while, there it might seem like they're evenly matched but becomes very apparent very quickly that she never stood a chance and as the fight carries on she's becoming more and more aware of that sonic is intentionally matching her blows but when he wants to get serious he stops her in a single move what she sees as a fight to the death he just sees as a workout and her rants about burning the world just bore him surge is not a threat to sonic she is clearly somebody who needs help and for a comic that wants to treat the hog as a role model yeah, I do think it's important to occasionally say that violence and fights are ugly and we need to always strive for a better solution in a tough situation. And yeah, it is kind of a cop out to say that, well, these books are here to sell issues so they just can't get rid of the popular enemies or in Sonic's case, since it's a kid's book, clearly they need to teach better lessons than murder your problems. Those are important points, but yeah, they are obvious ones. If anyone is expecting this book to gore it up, then you're kind of an idiot. I don't know what to tell you. Regardless, even if this franchise is ultimately aimed at 7 to 10 year olds, you can still 
still ride that delicate line, and I think that IDW Sonic has more wins than misses when it comes to finding the tonal balance and tackling the ever lingering issue of why heroes don't kill their villains. And yeah, again, I understand that Sonic murdering his enemies is obviously not a solution people are going for either. The critiques against his characterization are far more nuanced than that, and like I said, I kind of agree with a lot of them. But hey, if I can't have a sassier Sonic, I at least understand that this take on Sonic is trying to subtly mature the character ever so slightly. Be it the classic games, adventure games, storybook, Sonic X, Sad AM, Archie, hell, maybe even Fleetway, I can see any of those renditions of Sonic growing into this character that we see in this series. One that, yeah, despite my critiques, might give Metal Sonic another chance at life. Will the Eggman go to concoct some new scheme once Sonic has wrecked his toys? Or send the Zeddy back to Lost Hex just to get them out of his quills? We have seen authors of Sonic comic books just use these characters to further their own narrative. And despite the critiques I've heard, I do feel like Ian Flynn is ultimately trying to do his best for this character, not for himself. And I do enjoy that while the story of this comic will occasionally prove Sonic right, I feel like the ultimate point is that his solutions are not perfect. There will always be times when our morality is called into question or challenged. And no matter how hard we try to do the right thing, sometimes it's going to come at the detriment of others. Time and again through this book, Sonic's leniency on his enemies has been challenged and tested, and the point is that Sonic is not always right, but he's still always trying to do the right thing without betraying his own moral code. This does show us that he makes the wrong call on occasion, and there are consequences, big consequences, and he has friends and enemies alike that call him out on it. Shadow, Espio, Zavok, Eggman, all of them are here to show that no matter how good of a person he is, not finishing his enemies can lead to problems for everybody else. But even when that's the case, Sonic will do everything he can to set things right. That was the entire point of his conversation with Tangle during the Metal Virus. He feels guilt for everything that happened during that run, but he can't waste time throwing himself a pity party. He can't shoulder the blame of the intentional evil of the likes of Starline and Eggman. Moping doesn't get things done. He has to clean up his messes. I do understand that people feel like it's out of character that he'd have Tails bring Metal Sonic back online, and they do call back to that in issue 50, but despite my own critiques, I feel like I can even justify this. Metal is a threat, sure, but Sonic has always taken him down, time and again. He's been fighting Metal Sonic almost as long as he's been fighting Eggman himself, and I feel like at this point, it's kind of a hobby for him. As we see with his fight against Surge, all of this is just fun for him. Yeah, he wants to do the right thing, but he's also kind of using that as an excuse to have a dumb fun adventure and wreck some robots. And I feel like he likes the challenge that Metal Sonic provides. Metal is a robot and he is the only thing out there that's just as eager as Sonic himself for a race at any given moment. I have no idea if that was the intent of Ian or not. That's just kind of how I see things. But that assumption aside, I think it's pretty evident that Sonic sees Metal Sonic as his own person, not a tool, not a machine, but a sentient being just like Emerald or Omega, one that deserves a chance at his own life outside of Eggman. And that's only proven when he scolds Metal much later while they have a moment alone during the third act of the Metal Virus. And hell, Sonic's lenience on Metal ends up helping him in the end as his robotic double helps him in the final leg of the fight against Zav. And the greatest example of Sonic being right to forgive and let his enemies go is in Eggman himself. The very first time we meet him in ID W Cannon, he is Mr. Tinker, an entirely different personality. Sonic has seen the potential good in his greatest foe, and as long as he's known Robotnik, Sonic might actually know him better than anyone. And yeah, Tinker is now gone, and he was replaced with an Eggman who came back with a much darker scheme than he ever has had before. But thanks to Sonic's forgiveness, thanks to that brief time with Mr. Tinker, we now have Belle, the living personification of the potential good in a bad man. And wherever her story takes her, she will always serve as that reminder. Again, Sonic's not always going to make the right call, but no matter how much he's matured, no matter how much he's grown, I do still think there's a little arrogance and stubbornness in the Hedgehog, and he is going to apply that to his own moral code. He's not going to be swayed into the more brutal tactics of his enemies. That's what we have Shadow for. Hell, that was the entire point of that dark supersonic scene back in Sonic X. Different canon, sure, but I feel like that anime showed us how deep the relationship between these old enemies actually
actually are. It was Eggman who pulled Sonic back from that dark place, and I have no doubt in my mind that Sonic would never stop trying to do the same for Robotnik. And yet, speaking just in terms of shonen anime, standing on top of a rock and declaring your philosophy is about as shonen as it gets. And really, it's just five lines. It's really not as much talking as people let it on to be. It just looks like a lot because it's five different word bubbles. And hell, we have seen Sonic strike a pose and try to sound cool before. And while it worked just fine on Amy, Surge is not picking up what he's putting down. I feel like that's another important point that we're not really talking about. Surge ain't buying any of this BS either. She may not win this fight, but she doesn't allow Sonic to either. Not in the way he wants. She will not give that to him. And where Bell might serve as a reminder for the good that can be found in the bad, Surge will now exist as a reminder of his mistakes. Sega might treat him like the perfect hero, and that's been a massive problem for me for a while. Sonic Forces showed us how useless that extended cast of super-powered animal buddies are once he's out of the picture, but I feel like this story shows us that even if you could justify Sonic maturing into this character, he's still not perfect. The world, the narrative, it's not going to prove him 100% correct every time, but it will always show him trying his very best. But with all of that said, I once again must stress, this is just how I justify the story. IDW has been consistent within itself this entire time. I've grown up with so many different versions of Sonic, so this is just another one for me, and I'm enjoying the story. And I like seeing a Sonic narrative tackle these unsolvable questions and showing that even Sonic the Hedgehog can screw up when trying to do the right thing. I like that there isn't a perfect solution to all of this, that these other worldviews from these other characters are relevant. Just like the Sonic fans who both agree and disagree with his characterization have things worth talking about. I've spent a great deal of time trying to explain why I'm okay with this comic book, but I also understand the critics that feel like Ian is using Sonic as a soapbox to yet again justify his take on the character, and I kind of see that. This is like the third time we have done this particular thing in this book, and I'm fine with it here because it does feel like they're wrapping up a lot of the storylines and themes laid out through IDW, but yeah, it is starting to feel a bit reactionary. I hope they just finish up the story in issue 51, hand things over to Evan. I'm sure we're going to see Surge and Kid again, and I would not be surprised if Surge continues to tackle Sonic's morality or some other such nonsense, but I really hope they let this topic die down. They said just about everything they can say here. You just kind of have to accept that you can't please everybody, and unless there's an overall point you're trying to make, it is just going to come off a bit defensive. That said, yeah, some of these endings happened almost exactly the way I expected them to, but it was still satisfying to see all the same. Starline was such a thoroughly interesting villain. It's been a long time since I've cared about Sonic characters that didn't come from the games. But all that said, yeah, I was expecting his story to be wrapped up in 50, and I really hope it stays wrapped up, at least for a good long while. Okay, and that's gonna do it for another compilation. I was having a hard time trying to decide what I would be naming this particular video. For the first arc, it was all about the Battle of Angel Island, and then the book became all about the Metal Virus, so that was easy enough to do. But afterwards, they did a lot of shorter stories, and while I was in the thick of it, I wasn't seeing a cohesive theme, but now that I look back on it, there were some obvious standout characters, and I'm thinking of two specifically, Belle and Dr. Starline. This past set of stories was all about puppets and puppet masters, and these two characters I'd say were the centralized focus of the two writers of the book, with Belle being the central focus of Evan, as we not only were introduced to the character, but we ran through an entire character arc with her, and Ian's focus on Dr. Starline. He's been here for a while, but it wasn't until these two miniseries that he was truly allowed to shine and evolve and ultimately had his story come to a grisly end. And that doesn't mean we are done exploring Belle's character or they're not going to play with Starline's ghost on some occasion, I don't know. But 50 really did put a nice pin in everything in terms of these two central characters. And I think with both, we also see the writing strengths with both Ian and Evan. Once again, I am very impressed with how well they hand off characters to one another. But again, as I've stated before, you can tell the subtle differences between their writing styles. Ian really loves to play up the more bombastic personalities. You can tell he adores writing Starline and Eggman. It looked like he was having all kinds of fun with bad guys. His strengths lie in these amazing action set pieces. He really makes you feel like you want to play whatever story you're reading in a video game. Evan, on the other hand, seems to downplay some of these larger personalities. I actually think that's a good thing. 
She was tasked with some of these smaller, slower stories to really let the reader breathe after all the craziness of the metal virus, and I think she was the perfect person for the job. It was nice to explore the personalities and relationships of these secondary Sonic characters, especially the girls. I've given some other examples, but the one I keep thinking of is Rouge. As soon as Evan got a hold of that character, it became very evident just how often she was written by dudes up to this point. She just added a different dimension to these characters that we haven't had a chance to really explore in IDW. And it was incredibly refreshing. I keep thinking about the slice of life stories that came out of Archie, and for the most part, it was fairly torturous. But here, I'm just enjoying the vibe. I like hanging out with these characters. And while it's not a lot of fun to get some slower stories when you're waiting for the next chapter every month, having all collected like this, yeah, this was a nice breather after all of the drama we endured with the zombie bots. Yeah, as disjointed as I thought this would be, especially mixing in a brand new writer, this actually flowed together quite nicely. Leading into issue 50, I thought they were rushing into things, but looking back on all of it, no, it was always leading to this point, and it flowed quite naturally. I really, really like Belle's story. As downplayed as her personality is compared to all of these other characters, she still had an engaging arc without it ever really consuming too much time away from Sonic's story or any of the other characters. Characters. Especially impressive considering that Tinker clearly was never meant to be a bigger deal than a temporary amnesia story for Eggman. But from it, we have an engaging ongoing narrative about the autonomy of automatons, and that's pretty cool. And unlike other writers with their own creations, they knew when to put a pin in Starline. I always thought he was fun, but I never expected him to be as engaging or as sinister as he became. But just as we lost Tinker, it's still having a continuous continuing story with Belle, even though Starline's now gone, we now have Surge and Kit to carry on with a new narrative that will rise from his ashes. I do ultimately still feel that the book did kind of feel directionless after kicking things off with the metal virus and doing it so soon in the series too. It's a great story, but like I said back then, I still feel it happened way too soon. Because yeah, while you're in the thick of it, it was hard to tell where they were going to be taking these characters next. But even in these smaller stories, Stories, they were in good hands all the same. This was a comfy year, but I think we've rested long enough. I'd like to see Evan tackle one of these bigger events, but I guess we'll see what happens. As of this compilation, there's a new annual out. There's a couple more issues after 50 that have come out as well. Spoilers, they are still dealing with the city escape business, and that is still a great deal of fun. We will cover all of that in due time, but if you want to show your support, go check out that stuff for yourself. Time to wrap things up. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today and thank you so much for the patrons for keeping me alive. I know it's been a quiet month but I greatly appreciate you letting me have some time to breathe. We're going to be ramping stuff up on the channel really soon. And an extra special thank you to these fine people who throw extra money just so I can say their name in a video. It's the wildest thing. Those fine folks include Kyle Winter, Cirrus the Skeptic, Joseph Duncan Sonic 2 Blue, John, Josh Strider, Puppet Monroe, Faison Razul, Trey Nobles, Hatsworth, Ginger Bob, Jack of All Spades, Tristan Trap, Meekers, Dun Dun, Miles the Prower, Jeremy Singer, Mr. Boo J, World's Greatest Bard, Rain, Sam Webster, Dwight Graham, Fish Flop, Lucas Lipker, The Bad Pal, Jonathan Ink Pants is missing his actual pants, <laughs> Shodan, Mr. SP, Cecil the Glade, The Dark Neon, Missing No, Stefan Plakonica, Three Monic, Ty Cyan, Graham J. Hall, Mr. Boo J, wait, didn't I say this one already? Wayne is Bob. Lederick, David 20 Co, Ryan Rolfs, The Lumberjack, Hello, my name is Widow, Nikki, Uwu, did you wanna, who am I, scary dinosaur impression, wow, hi, Mr. Boo, Uwu, J, Otis is really making the most out of that $5 tier, NBTV, Mute, Trash Baphomet, Autumn from Twitter.com, That Pyro Main, Mui Saxi, Jin Sayotome, Tripless Born, The Throne Awaits, Loka Brenna, Nezen, Enerjack 5, Grayson Conagher, Spades the Nocturne, and yes, Spades, I did see the Scrapnik covers, and I am super excited. Ken K, Then 101, Paxton Bisbee, Sindarin 7, Stevie Cole, 3 Rule 4, A Seer Warns of a Deadly Fate, Paisley, Eric Delgado, Cody Gracious, Tristan Team the Great, Kodinsky, Jamo Art, PK Durbar, I hope I'm saying that right, Crimson Rose, Sonic Page, or PAJ, and Zagard Lagan. I'm seeing new names up here. I am 
so unbelievably honored. And once again, if I am saying your name incorrectly, then tell me. Get your money's worth, you beautiful, beautiful lunatics. Thank you all once again for hanging out, and I will see you next time. Toot toot, Sonic Warriors. Mm -hmm.